Hello everyone, it's been a little while, but I'm back with a new audiobook for you. Today we have the fifth and final Rogue Star science fiction novel, Children of the End. For those of you listening early to the ad-free version, thanks so much for joining my Ream subscription and supporting the channel. It's much appreciated. For those of you new to the channel, my name is James E. Wisher, and I'm the author of 43 novels spanning epic fantasy, urban fantasy, and science fiction. Thank you so much for stopping by. I'll be adding more audiobooks as time goes by, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. And if you'd like early ad-free access, you can join my Ream subscription. Link in the description. One other item of note. If you see any of my audiobooks on a channel other than this one, please let me know, since whoever posted it doesn't have permission to do so. Okay, now that the introductions are out of the way, let's get started. Chapter 1 Marcus Drake stomped along through the jungle of Alpha 114. His work for the Council had been reasonably calm since their encounter with the giant void ship a few months ago, and that was fine with Marcus. Even he needed an occasional break from the action, not that he expected it to last. Today he wore his power armor, and thank goodness for that. The internal temperature controls kept the heat and humidity at bay. Having experienced Alpha's weather in the flesh several times, he had no great desire to do so again. Beside him, Ayaka Kazumi, the most beautiful woman in the sector, and by good fortune his girlfriend, walked along at a brisk pace. Sweat plastered her tank top to her skin in a most fetching way. She wore her long, dark hair tied back in a neat ponytail. She'd briefly cut it shorter to make moving around underground easier, but recently decided to grow it back out. Marcus found her stunning either way, and told her so frequently. Today they were exploring a completely new continent. Ayaka and her team had finished cataloging all the native tribes on the first one a couple days ago, thus prompting her call for him to visit and join her as she approached the first tribe of this continent. The natives considered Marcus a god given that his armor's power and appearance resembled their god of the dark depths. He found being worshipped by overly evolved bats a bit odd, but couldn't deny a certain fondness for the ugly little guys. Are you sure the natives in this part of the world worship the same gods as our little boys? Ayaka flicked a stray hair off her forehead. I'm not sure of anything, but if they don't and turn out to be unfriendly, I'll be equally glad to have you along. I do appreciate you taking the time to come and help me out. Marcus grinned, though she couldn't see it behind his helmet. You made that wonderfully clear last night. Did the tribes on this continent evolve from radiation exposure as well? Looks that way. The levels in their village are lower than the first ones we discovered. Their society appears a bit more advanced, though still Stone Age level. They have developed a crude form of farming as well as a more advanced caste system. She went on to explain various details of the locals' society, and Marcus nodded along. He didn't care in the least about any of it, but loved how excited she got when she talked about her work. It was one of the many things he loved about her. They stopped at the edge of a clearing where a dozen crude huts had been set up. A section of dirt had been torn up, and some plants were growing out of it. Marcus's sensors indicated low-level radiation, but nothing dangerous. I assumed they lived underground, he said. They may have once, but this group, at least, migrated to the surface. We think about a century ago, not sure why. How do you want to handle this, he asked. Let's keep going, nice and slow. Don't do anything that might scare them. That's fine for me, but a stone-tipped spear could do you some serious harm. Nothing in our observations indicates that they're aggressive. Just follow my lead. I'm sure it'll be fine. Okay, he said, hoping for all he was worth that she was right. Ayaka went first, and Marcus followed a step behind, fully alert and ready to stop anyone that might think about hurting her. Of course, she'd be pissed if he blasted the locals, but at least she'd be alive to yell at him. They were about ten strides from the nearest hut when two ugly, wrinkle-faced humanoids dressed in loincloths and carrying spears emerged to face them. Two on two. Maybe they had a sense of fairness. Ayaka held her hands out to the sides and babbled something at them in the natives' screeching language. Solomon had downloaded a translation program into the suit, but Marcus didn't bother to activate it. He was here to look impressive and keep quiet, and he meant to do just that. The natives looked at each other before the one on the left retreated into the village, going directly to the largest hut. 
It seemed that the universe over the boss always lived in the biggest hut. What did you tell him? That I was a shaman and servant of the god of the dark depths. I said I'd come with my master to make peaceful contact with them. The other one went to get the chief and their shaman. So far, everything is going as I expected. Glad to hear it. How long do you think negotiations would take? No idea. Their society is different from the tribes I've been dealing with. I'm sure there will be more detailed discussions given how advanced they are. Are you getting bored? Marcus shrugged. This isn't exactly the most exciting thing I've ever done, but I've also had worse jobs. Here come your boys. Two of the ugly aliens emerged from the large hut. One carried a stone club carved with crude diagrams, and the other wore a cape made of some animal's skin, as well as a headdress decorated with feathers. Which one do you think is in charge? I'm guessing the one with the club. I don't want to make any guesses, she said in her serious scientist voice. When the head alien stopped a few feet away, Ayaka offered a polite bow. She said something in the native's language, and the one with the headdress replied, they exchanged squawks while Marcus kept his sensors focused on the village. No one would be sneaking up on them while he was on guard duty. Marcus, are you there? The voice of his partner and navigator, Solomon Keyes, came through with only a little distortion from the local radiation field. Yeah, go ahead. I've got an incoming transmission from Mars. Pretty sure it's Vlad, but something got garbled in one of the relays. I'm trying to clean it up. Do you want me to send it to your suit when I'm done? If it sounds serious, yes, otherwise I'll look at it when we get back. The local with the club was waving it at Aieka, and half a dozen more armed locals had emerged from the huts. I have to go. She must have said something that riled them up. He strode closer, glaring down at the shorter aliens. Is there a problem? I fear I miscalculated, Aieka said. Turns out this tribe fled the worshippers of the god of the dark depths, and now they think I've come to enslave them. I explained that I haven't, but they don't believe me. A spear came flying in, and Marcus batted it aside. The locals were shrieking and jumping around as they waved their spears. I either need to show them who's boss or we need to leave. It's your call. Before she could answer, one of the warriors ran at them, spear lowered. Marcus stepped in front of Ayaka and took the thrust right to his armored stomach. The spear shattered without doing any damage. The little alien stared at him for a moment before running back behind the line of warriors. Let's go, Ayaka said. I'd hate to hurt one of them by accident. Marcus crouched. Climb onto my back. I don't want to expose you to a spear. When she had a firm grip, Marcus flew straight up until they were well out of spear range, then leveled out and started for Ayaka's camp. The flight wouldn't take long since the team of scientists had relocated to the new continent. I can't believe I made such a stupid mistake. I just assumed they all worshipped the same god despite the fact that this group had moved to the surface. Talk about a rookie move. Everyone makes mistakes. I'm sure you'll get it figured out. Though I admit the idea of you approaching another tribe on your own after I leave makes me a bit anxious. We have defensive equipment. I'll be sure to take all the necessary precautions. I'll also be sure to take a couple of the security guys with me just to be safe. That's a relief. Marcus spotted the campsite, really just a clearing with half a dozen prefab buildings in it. The star sat on her landing gear at the edge of the camp. Hopefully Solomon had that message sorted out. He landed, and Ayaka climbed off his back. Thanks for coming with me. I need to check my notes again. See you for dinner tonight? You bet. And don't be too hard on yourself. Everyone messes up from time to time. The universe knows I do often enough. Thanks. She waved and trotted off to the prefabricated pop-up shelter that served as her home away from home. Speaking of which, Marcus turned toward the star, his home away from home. He set off across the clearing. One of the techs, Marcus couldn't remember the kid's name, offered a friendly wave. From the way he'd seen the youthful scientist looking at Aieka, Marcus suspected he had a serious crush. Not that he was surprised. Any guy with a pulse would have a crush on Aieka. Marcus clanked up the loading ramp and dangled over to the charging cylinder. If the natives of this continent hated the god of the dark depths, he wasn't going to be of much use when it came to making contact. He'd barely begun the recharge cycle when Solomon entered the hold. Despite staying in the climate-controlled ship, his tan tunic was sweat-plastered to his body. Solomon's 300 pounds no doubt did little to help. 
Vlad's message is too messed up to fix, Solomon said, but I've established a connection using the council's network if you want to call him back. If he went to all the trouble of contacting me out here, I'd better. He might be in some kind of trouble. Vlad's a gangster. Isn't he always in trouble? Marcus smiled at that. Technically, but there's trouble, and then there's trouble. Know what I mean? Not really. All you need to do is input Vlad's contact information and the comm unit will do the rest. I need to take another shower. Marcus clapped his friend on the shoulder in passing and made his way to the cockpit. He settled into the chair and sighed. There was nowhere in the universe that felt more right than this spot. He didn't take long to revel in it. If his adopted father needed something, Marcus wanted to know about it sooner rather than later. It only took a few seconds for the computer to do its thing, and then Vlad's familiar face appeared on the screen. His white hair was combed back from his forehead, and a cigarette hung from his mouth. As far as Marcus could tell, he looked the same as always. Of course, you lost a lot of details on a connection like this. Hey, old man, what's on your mind? Vlad's brow wrinkled. Did you not get my message? It got here, but ended up so garbled I couldn't play it. That's why I called you back so soon. Everything okay? That remains to be seen. I've been having trouble with the Jade Dragons. More trouble than usual, I mean. It's bad for business, and the Black Dragons have offered to host a meeting between me and their clan head. They want the conflict over with as much as I do. That the Jade Dragon clan leader agreed to the meeting makes me somewhat optimistic. It makes me think trap. The Jade Dragons hate your guts. No offense. None taken, and you are right. That's why we are having it on neutral territory, controlled by all the clans. Even the Jade Dragons wouldn't dare violate the peace. Anyway, the reason I called is because the terms of the meeting state that I can bring two people with me. I trust no one more than you and Tommy. Plus, we can take your ship, with its many upgrades. Marcus thought for a moment before nodding. No sweat? When's the meeting? One week from today on Pleasure Planet 4. Okay, Solomon and I will be on Mars in two days. See you then. Many thanks, my boy. I knew you wouldn't let me down. If you can't count on family, who can you count on? Marcus disconnected and sighed. Now he had to tell Aika he was leaving again, and not on council business, but to help Vlad. She didn't really approve of him, but then he was a gangster, so Marcus couldn't really criticize. Oh well, she'd understand. Family was family, after all. Chapter 2 When the rogue star reverted to real space, Mars looked like a plum in the viewscreen. Marcus flew them closer, his hands on autopilot as he thought over the current situation with Vlad. Any opportunity to make peace was a good thing since it reduced the odds of any of Marcus's old friends getting blasted. What he couldn't figure out was why the Jade Dragons decided to step up to the table now. They'd been fighting with Vlad's crew for years and were dead set against the Black Dragons making peace. Maybe the old man knew more than he was comfortable saying over the comm. A private connection was pretty secure, but it wasn't perfect. Vlad was old school enough that he'd never say anything sensitive where it might be overheard or, the universe forbid, recorded. Face to face was definitely better for that sort of thing. Marcus, Solomon said, snapping him out of his thoughts. What's on your mind? Do you think Dracor is okay? It's rare that we go three weeks without hearing from him. I know he's supposed to have like five more years. But you don't suppose the disease... Nah, the boss is tough. He'll last longer than that. Though while we're on the subject, did you find anything useful on the data crystal we took from the void ship? Nothing pertinent to the disease, unfortunately. But all Soren's nanomachine research was there. I already transmitted it to the council. And kept a copy for yourself, right? Was Aika mad when you said you were going to help Vlad? Solomon's redirection of the conversation was the same as admitting that he did, in fact, keep a copy of the research. Marcus didn't care and couldn't imagine why Solomon would think he might. No, she was fine with it. She got pretty mad at herself for screwing up with that new tribe. I suspect she'll be too busy reviewing her research and performing more long-term studies to even think about what I'm up to. Besides, 
we've kind of settled on a don't-ask-don't-tell policy when it comes to our work. Solomon looked up from his computer console. I thought keeping secrets was bad for a relationship. We're not keeping secrets. If she asks me, I'll tell her everything. But she said she worries less if she doesn't know the details of my work. As for me, I don't care about the biology of radiation-mutated aliens. The detailed science stuff bores me to tears. If we avoid talking about the things neither of us wants to know about, we can focus on the good stuff when we're together. Marcus grinned when he remembered the good stuff from his most recent visit. Solomon turned back to the computer. We're in range of Earth Force's sensors. Are you sure this is okay? Will you relax? The Vinsar rigged up our new transponder. No way will Earth Force be able to figure out it's fake. Besides, you can be sure whoever's on duty at the Space Control Center is on Vlad's payroll as well. Attention, Voyager, a computerized voice said, calling out their fake ID. Input your name and destination. Solomon typed the information and sent it. A few seconds passed before the voice said, Confirmed. Your landing number is 116. Estimated wait is 37 minutes. Enjoy your stay on Mars. That's not bad. Marcus said. The embargo must be slowing down trade a fair bit. Earth Force is lucky there isn't a blockade around the system after what they pulled. A light flashed on the console and Solomon pressed it. A time and address flashed across the screen. Marcus recognized the address as Vlad's antique shop and he had six hours to get there. Plenty of time, assuming nothing went wrong with their arrival. Really paranoid, isn't he? Solomon said. Yeah, but that's a good sign means he's not taking the meeting lightly. Not that I imagined he would. Vlad didn't make it this long in the business by being stupid. Best thing we can do is follow his lead. Solomon snorted at that. Since when are we not paranoid? His friend had a point, but Marcus felt certain that however careful they planned on being, they'd better double it. Mars Control must have been having an especially good day since they had Marcus processed and in his assigned landing berth five minutes ahead of schedule. That was a record as far as he could remember. On the other hand, it meant they had a three-hour wait before the meeting with Vlad. Marcus didn't want to be seen wandering the dome, so he and Solomon ended up playing cards in the galley. Despite all the many excellent upgrades the Vinsar had supplied Marcus, they never installed anything for entertainment. Given their generally serious nature, he wondered what sort of games they played in their spare time. Solomon tossed his hand on the steel table. Jin. Muttering unkind things about his overly lucky navigator, Marcus started shuffling. Poker was his game anyway, and they weren't even playing for money. This was just to kill time. Speaking of which, Marcus checked the clock and smiled to himself. Time to get going. He set the deck on the table. Let's hit the road. Just when I was on a winning streak, Solomon said with supreme indifference. His best friend seldom got excited about anything that didn't involve computers. Should I wait here? Your call. You won't be allowed in the meeting on Pleasure Planet 4 anyway, so if you prefer to avoid seeing the old man, that's cool. Of course, I'm going to be bringing him and Tommy back, so you're only delaying the inevitable. You say that like it's a bad thing. I'll stay and tidy up the guest cabin. Make sure Ayako didn't leave any of her unmentionables behind when she traveled with us last time. Anything she left is in my cabin, but I appreciate you cleaning. The universe knows we don't do it often enough. See you in a bit. Marcus left the galley, pausing on his way to the exit to strap on his control gauntlet. When he reached the hold, a faint shiver ran through him as gruesome. His void warbot turned cargo handler scanned him and confirmed his identity. It was a nice upgrade since it saved him from having to do a verbal confirmation every time he passed through the hold. As soon as he stepped onto the tarmac, Marcus turned and activated the ship's defenses. Every vessel was responsible for its own security here, and Marcus took that seriously, especially considering his business this visit. The walk to the hover train platform took ten minutes and brought him past twenty freighters of various sizes, most bigger than the Star, though a pair were smaller. People were busy working, unloading cargo, and generally going about their lives as if nothing of import were happening in the greater galaxy. That was exactly how the Council liked things. All Marcus wanted was to avoid attention, and in that regard, he succeeded very well. No one shot him so much as a passing glance. The train ride went equally smoothly. 
and after a tense but uneventful walk he found himself standing at the front door of Vlad's antique shop. The place was full of junk and memories. He pushed through and stepped into the past. He took a deep breath and sighed. It smelled of dust and dry paper, leather and rust. Pity he didn't have time to linger today. When he had the chance, Marcus loved to wander the aisles. Though he usually came up dry, it would be nice to add a new leather-bound book to his collection. At the checkout desk, he found Phil, part-time clerk and part-time messenger, sitting up and looking as alert as Marcus had ever seen him. His eyes were wide behind his thick glasses as he stared at Marcus. After a long sigh of relief, Phil said, Glad you're here, Marcus. Sooner this meeting is done, the better. Things have been crazy tense. I figured, seeing as how you're awake. Go on, you punk. I'll let him know you're here. Thanks. See you, Phil. Marcus turned right and took the stairs up to Vlad's office. He arrived to find Tommy standing in the doorway. A little taller than Marcus and built like a brick wall, Tommy served as Vlad's head leg breaker. Back in the day, the two of them had gotten into plenty of trouble. Hopefully, they could avoid that this time. Tommy wore a pair of blaster pistols at his belt and a lightweight blaster-proof vest that would stop anything short of a direct hit. Heavy gear for just waiting around. I thought Phil was jumpy. Marcus and Tommy bumped fists. You look ready for a fight. Boss's orders. We're on full alert until the meeting is done. Glad to have you along on this one, Marcus. You know the deal. When family calls, you answer. Tommy nodded and stepped aside. Inside the familiar wood-paneled office, Vlad sat behind his desk, wreathed in smoke. Judging by the ashtray, he was going to have to go for his annual lung rejuvenation early this year. He wore a crisp charcoal suit, the same color as the dark circles under his eyes. For the first time Marcus could remember, he looked every bit of his seventy years. The cold blue eyes, however, were as hard as ever when he looked at Marcus. How are you holding up, old man? From the looks of it, you might want to plan on staying a few extra days on Pleasure Planet 4 after the meeting. Maybe call Anna in to join you. Vlad snorted. Cause if I could relax on a planet controlled by the dragons. Still, a vacation might not be the worst idea. I appreciate you taking time away from your real job to lend me a hand. If everything goes to hell, having someone that knows the area and has a stealth-capable ship will be a great help. I might not be in the business anymore, but you'll always be a second father to me. If you need something, not too illegal, I'll always be there. Now, walk me through the meeting. Vlad offered a thin smile at his hedge, but forbore comment. He's nothing complicated. We land at the spaceport and take civilian transport to the hungry kitty. No weapons, and only you and Tommy as guards. The Jade Dragon's representatives will arrive with the same restrictions. Their reps on planet will sit out the meeting since they're obviously biased. We'll talk. Hopefully an arrangement can be reached. If not, we leave and the war continues. Are any of the other clans on their side? Marcus asked. Not overtly, though I'm sure some are quietly rooting for them. Most just want it taken care of so we can get back to regular business and the Black Dragons are actively on my side, sending little bits of useful intel through back channels. Marcus nodded, surprised that any of the clans would take the side of an outsider over one of their own. Sounds straightforward enough, though I'm sure it won't be. We can leave whenever you're ready. Solomon's cleaning up the guest room. You and Tommy will have to share, so it'll be tight. Vlad waved a hand. I've slept in far worse places over the years, and we're ready now. The sooner we're off Mars and in space, the safer I'll feel. The bastards haven't dared to try anything here yet, but they fear it's only a matter of time. If Vlad didn't feel safe on Mars, things must have gotten way worse. Okay, let's get out of here. I have no more interest in being a target than you do. Chapter 3 Marcus, or more precisely Solomon, plotted them a leisurely route to Pleasure Planet 4, one that ensured they arrived right on time. And so they had. Following the automated control system's instructions, Marcus guided the ship around a weather control satellite and down to the surface of the beautiful green and blue planet. 
They ended up landing at the same spaceport as their last visit, but in a nicer hangar closer to the exit. When he had everything save the defense systems powered down, Marcus stood and stretched. The easy part of the mission was done. Matters only got trickier from here. You arranged us a cab, right? Marcus asked. Yes, it should be waiting out front. Solomon looked up at him. Are you sure you don't want to sneak a knife or something in? No way. There's bound to be scanners and physical searches. The dragons wouldn't be sloppy enough to let something like that through, and trying is likely to get me killed. What about the satellites? I could hack them easily enough, but I'm not optimistic about the sort of resolution I'll get from a weather satellite. Marcus grinned. I don't need to read anybody's watch. I just need you to keep an eye out for an ambush. Surely, poor resolution or not, you'll be able to spot a bunch of guys with blasters headed our way. What about comms? As far as I know, there's no rule against them. Solomon reached into the little drawer beside his console and pulled out a tiny earbud. Pop it in and we'll do a quick test. Much as he hated these things, they were good for subtle work. He fitted the earpiece and grimaced. They were never comfortable. But this one felt better than most. Testing. Solomon spoke softly, but Marcus heard him with no issue. Sounds good. Marcus's voice came through the ship's speaker, confirming the second half of the link. I'll confirm again before we go inside. Understood. I'll be on full alert until you get back. Marcus nodded and left the cockpit. He found Vlad and Tommy waiting in the cargo hold. The old man's toe was tapping and he had his arms crossed. What's the hold up? Just taking a few minor precautions. Very minor given the restrictions on this meeting. But every little bit helps. There's a cab waiting for us out front. Just to confirm, comms are allowed, right? No one told me otherwise, Vlad said. Great, come on. Marcus led the way toward the front of the spaceport while Tommy brought up the rear. His old friend was in full business mode, not a word or move wasted. If it came to a fight, and Marcus dearly hoped it didn't, there were few people he'd rather have on his team. The trip across town passed in tense silence, silence from them. The cabbie, Marcus didn't immediately recognize his species beyond something near human, chattered the whole way. The fact that no one ever responded to his prattle didn't seem to faze him in the least. Lucky for him they were unarmed, since Tommy looked like he wanted to murder the chatterbox. The meeting was set for noon local time, which was 15 minutes away and many hours earlier than the club actually opened. The cab pulled up in front of the three-story building, and the cabbie said, Here we are, the hungry kitty, best whorehouse house on the planet. Enjoy your visit. They piled out, ignoring the cabbie, who pulled away as soon as they were clear, no doubt in search of more agreeable fares. Do we go in the front or the back? Marcus asked. The front, Vlad said. They'll have seen us pull up. Marcus had barely taken a step toward the shiny brass front doors when they opened revealing the flawless figure of Madame Margaret. Her rosy skin held a warm glow and was unflawed by a single blemish. Her curves hadn't gotten any less impressive since the last time he saw her, and he was forced to remind himself just how much he loved Aika. At least she had on a few more clothes this time. Not a lot more, but a short skirt covered her backside and a halter top did a reasonable job of corralling her breasts. As they approached, she smiled a smile that would put many men on their knees, so nice to see you again, Marcus. He had no time to reply before she had her arms around him, her bits pressed against his chest and kissed his cheek. Silently, Marcus repeated how much he loved Ayaka and gave her a brief squeeze. When she finally stepped back, he was both relieved and a little sad. Margaret, good to see you too. Have you met my adopted father, Vlad Valkor? I've never had the honor of meeting the silver fox in person. She held out her hand, and Vlad gave it a gentle shake. Welcome to Pleasure Planet 4. Hopefully negotiations can be concluded quickly, and to everyone's satisfaction. That would please me very well, young lady, Vlad said. Has the Jade Dragon's representative arrived yet? He's on planet, but hasn't arrived here. We wanted to get you inside and settled first. You're a guest, after all and courtesy must be maintained. If there was one thing the dragons were good at, it was courtesy. Most of them would politely cut your throat, then apologize to your corpse. 
While Vlad and Margaret talked, Marcus did a quick calm check, whispering so softly that he could barely hear himself. How are things going on your end, Solomon? All good. I hacked the weather satellite without issue and can see your group on the sidewalk. The resolution is indeed sufficient for our needs. Thanks. Out. Marcus glanced at Tommy and found his back turned as he watched the street for any approaching danger. Always the pro, no doubt about that. Most men wouldn't be able to take their eyes off Margaret. Follow me, please, Margaret said. The meeting room is on the top floor. The door scanners will check you for weapons, as will our guards upstairs. If you've got anything on you, give them to me and I'll be sure to return them when you leave. I have a comm unit, but we left the rest of our weapons on my ship, Marcus said. That's perfectly fine. She opened the door and motioned them through. Marcus went first, then Vlad, and Tommy brought up the rear. Marcus had never been this way before. A modest foyer paneled with exotic hardwood that had been polished until it seemed to glow with an inner light ended with a lectern where he assumed the host would greet guests. Instead of taking them through the public area of the club, she led them across the foyer to a door made to blend in with the wall. It slid silently open at her approach, and a far plainer hall led to a flight of stairs. As they climbed side by side, Marcus asked, What's with the secret door? For security, when the clubs open, we have teams on alert here and there. Sometimes our guests get a bit rowdy. The hidden doors and passages allow security to get where they need to while keeping the disturbance to a minimum. That made sense, though we'd never heard of such a setup. Of course, Marcus knew nothing about running a club. This could well be the standard design. Speaking of security, I haven't seen anyone. You will. Plus, the entire area is being monitored on CCTV. Our people will spot anyone looking to cause trouble and deal with them before you even know they're there. That's the ideal way for a host to handle trouble. Ideally, there won't be any trouble for you to handle. She flashed her thousand-watt smile, revealing adorable, elongated eye teeth. That would indeed be ideal. Pity the galaxy never seems to give us the ideal outcome. Marcus smiled back. On the one hand, I agree. But on the other, I'd be out of a job in such a galaxy. They reached the third floor landing and Margaret opened the door. A hall decorated with erotic paintings led to a fancy hardwood door carved with dragons. Four men of Asian descent stood outside, their faces as blank as masks. You'll need to be frisked, Margaret said. Marcus, Vlad, and Tommy all raised their arms and took a wide stance. This wasn't the first time they'd been frisked, and given what they did for a living, he doubted it would be the last. Of course, most people these days relied on scanner tech, but Marcus found it oddly comforting to know an actual person would be checking everyone for weapons. The pat-down was thorough and professional. Five minutes later, the door was opened, and Margaret waved them through. Will you not be joining us? Marcus asked. I will be, but our other guests have just arrived and I need to go greet them. We'll be along shortly. Until then, make yourselves comfortable. She hurried back the way they'd come and Marcus joined Vlad and Tommy in the meeting room. It was nothing remarkable. There was a table with three chairs, one on each end and the third in the middle. Looked like Marcus and Tommy would be standing. You and the Aetherian seem friendly, Tommy said. Thought you had a girlfriend. I do. It is possible to be friends with a beautiful woman and nothing more. Not in my experience, Tommy said. You have experience with beautiful women? Since when? Tommy shot him a middle finger, and for a moment Marcus felt like a teenager again. The feeling intensified when Vlad glared at them. He looked at Tommy, and Tommy looked at him, and they started laughing. It was completely inappropriate given the gravity of the situation, yet Marcus couldn't stop himself. The tension of the past few days had left him completely on edge, and the release felt wonderful. Even Vlad offered a faint smile. When they got themselves under control, Vlad said, Get it out of your systems. I want no mistakes when the Jade Dragon's representative arrives. Marcus nodded and got himself refocused. There shouldn't be any danger during the meeting. The multiple levels of security would see to that. He worried more about their exit strategy. If the dragons wanted to try something, setting up a trap after the meeting would be the perfect time, assuming they didn't come to an understanding. 
If they did, everything should be fine. All the dragon clans prided themselves on their honor. That's what he told himself anyway. The way the jade dragons had been acting lately made him wonder if the rules had changed and only the enemy realized it. A few minutes later, Margaret returned with a trio of Asian men dressed in matching dark suits. The jade dragon's representative looked very much like all the other members of the group Marcus had encountered over the years. Slim build, dark hair combed straight back from his face, cold, dead shark eyes, and a nice suit. His two guards could have been his brothers for all the difference in their appearances. The main thing that distinguished the boss from his henchmen was a green dragon tattoo on his right cheek. Not exactly subtle, but when you ran one of the most powerful criminal organizations in the galaxy, you didn't need to be. Margaret sat in the middle chair, then pointed at the ends of the table. Gentlemen, if you'd be so kind as to take your seats, we'll begin. Vlad settled in while Marcus and Tommy stood against the wall behind him, mirroring the opposing group of bodyguards. The room wasn't huge, and only a couple steps separated them from the table. The arrangement also made it easy for Marcus to listen in on the negotiations. We're here to discuss terms for ending the conflict between Vlad's organization and the Jade Dragons, Margaret began. To clarify the dispute, is it territorial or product-related? Territorial, Vlad said. At the same instant, the Jade Dragons rep said, Product. And the discussions were off to a brilliant start. The two men couldn't even agree on the problem. Marcus swallowed a sigh. This was going to be a long day. Chapter 4 Some days Solomon hated his job. Today, sitting in the nice, air-conditioned cockpit many miles from a potential firefight, wasn't one of them. He had the whole ship to himself and plenty of computing power. One screen showed the empty street outside the hungry kitty. Cars and an occasional pedestrian came and went, but nothing that remotely resembled a threat. Marcus usually liked action, but even he agreed that today would be a good day for things to stay quiet. Solomon looked away from the display and typed in a command at his console. He was running some extrapolation algorithms on the data they took from the huge void ship. There was no practical purpose to the research beyond his personal curiosity. As far as Solomon was concerned, satisfying his curiosity was reason enough to run the program. The primary subject concerned the amount of time the nanomachines would have needed to overwhelm an entire planet's population had they reached one. He suspected the answer would be depressingly short. He glanced back and scowled. The monitor watching the strip club had gone blank. No way had the technicians running the weather satellites noticed his intrusion. He'd been extra careful to avoid exactly that. Muttering to himself, Solomon ran a simple diagnostic program. Everything looked fine on his end, but the link with the satellite had gone dead. What were the odds that the only satellite capable of observing the target location would suddenly go down? Vanishingly small would be the answer. And much like Marcus, Solomon didn't believe in coincidences. Just to be sure, he switched the connection to the next nearest satellite. That one came instantly online. A quick command shifted the view, drawing a gasp. A huge, black, void warship, like the ones that attacked Earth, had appeared in orbit directly above the city. This was so not good. Pleasure Planet 4 had no fleet, no planetary defenses, and little in the way of a military. That ship could wipe them out from orbit without even getting a scratch. Solomon activated the comm. Marcus, we've got trouble. Can you hear me? No response. He wouldn't just ignore Solomon's message. Not now. A few taps on the keyboard confirmed his fears. Local communications were being jammed. He switched to the hypernet and tried to reach the council. No luck. Long-range comms were down as well. Okay, think. Marcus could take care of himself, but he couldn't deal with the void ship. Even if they got off planet, that ship would squash the star like a bug. The only chance they had was to get word to Dracor. At least a Vensar warship would be able to fight that thing on even terms. Of course, knowing that did no good if he couldn't get past the jamming. Think, Solomon. He ran a hand through his hair. There had to be a way. He just had to figure it out before that void ship blew them all to bits. 
Marcus didn't know how long Vlad and Fang, the Jade Dragon's negotiator, had been arguing about the minutia of the drug trade near some planet Marcus had never heard of, but he was about to fall asleep on his feet. The only thing of real interest he'd heard was that Fang wasn't actually the clan head, only his appointed representative. Vlad had been annoyed by that, but Fang assured him that he had full authority to discuss the situation. Margaret also assured them that the other clans would see that any deal was honored. Solomon's voice in his earbud came as a relief. At least it was until he said, Marcus, we've got... Shrill static forced Marcus to dig the earpiece out before it deafened him. He knew the sound of jamming well enough to recognize the problem. The source of it was another matter. Whatever the cause, he doubted it could be good for them. He eased over next to Tommy, who looked fully alert, bless his professional heart. We might have trouble. Someone's jamming our comms, Marcus whispered. Tommy's frown deepened, but he never looked away from the table. What do you think? Do we evacuate? Do you imagine he'd leave after all this? Marcus asked. I think the best we can do is stay extra alert. Tommy's frown turned into a grimace of annoyance, but he nodded. They both knew how stubborn Vlad could be. Unless they had something more definite, he'd never walk away from the table. It would be a sign of weakness. Mercifully, only a few minutes after Solomon's cut-off message, Vlad stood and held out his hand. I think we have a deal. Fang stood as well and extended his own hand. Something glinted at the tip of his index finger. Marcus didn't think. He took one stride and dove. His right hand reached Fang's and shoved it aside just as a crimson beam shot out, cutting a groove in the wall behind Vlad. Tommy charged an instant later, tackling Fang and slamming him into his bodyguards who had their own hands raised. The four of them ended up in a heap with Tommy swinging rights and lefts as he tried to take them out barehanded. Marcus turned to Vlad. Stay down. He shifted his gaze to Margaret, who was staring at the melee with a dumbfounded expression. Get some help in here. With that, Marcus ran to back up Tommy. A beam shot out, missing him by a foot. Marcus grabbed the wrist of the man that shot at him and wrenched it around so the barrel was pointing back at his own head. It took both hands just to maintain control of his opponent's bent wrist. Clearly more had been done to enhance the men than adding an internal weapon. The meeting room door burst open as the four guards from outside raced in, blasters raised. A backhanded blow from one of Feng's bodyguards sent Tommy flying across the room. Get clear, one of the club guards shouted. Marcus didn't need to be told twice. A final shove bought him some space, and he sprinted toward Tommy. The moment he did, all four guards opened up. Crimson blaster bolts streaked in and lances of energy countered. Marcus kept half an eye on the proceedings as he knelt beside his groaning friend. Tommy bled from a busted lip, but there were no other visible wounds. Look at me, Tommy. After a moment of bleary confusion, Tommy turned Marcus's way. His eyes looked clear and his pupils weren't dilated. Good, probably no concussion then. Christ on a bike, Tommy muttered. I haven't been hit that hard in a long time. Shake it off, we're not done yet. Marcus hardly needed to point that out given the constant scream of blaster fire. He helped Tommy to his feet and together they hurried over to join Vlad and Margaret behind the now tipped over table. Why crouching behind a wooden table made him feel better? Marcus wasn't sure. The thin wood made only a slightly better barrier than a silk sheet. What happened to your security? Vlad demanded. We checked them all the same as you, Margaret said. Nothing showed up. I don't know how they got those internal weapons past our scanners. It must be some new sort of tech. Marcus had no evidence, but physical enhancements combined with integrated weaponry screamed void tech to him. If the Jade Dragons had made a deal with the Children of the Void, they might be in worse danger than he first thought. Risking a quick peek over the top of the table, Marcus found two of the club guards down, along with one of Feng's bodyguards. Not looking great for their side. Is there another way out of here? Marcus asked. Margaret shook her head. This room is supposed to be the safest in the building. One way in, one way out, and easy to guard. I never figured on having to escape somebody already in the room with us. What about hidden weapons? Tommy asked. None, for the same reasons. If someone stumbled on them, we'd be in bad shape. Tommy cursed loudly and creatively. Marcus knew just how he felt, but kept his comments to himself. 
They needed to figure a way out of this, not waste their time swearing. I hate this plan, Marcus said, but I think we have to ram them with the table. While Tommy and I do that, Vlad and Margaret can grab the dead guard's weapons. Those blasters will cut you two into Swiss cheese, Vlad said. Like I said, I hate the plan, but at least the assassins are focused on the surviving guards now. The longer we wait, the worse our chances. Hell, I say we go for it. Tommy grabbed the left side of the table. Ready? Marcus grabbed the right and nodded. Go. They lifted and charged at a dead sprint. Half-inch holes opened in the wood as blaster bolts tore through the table. One streaked so close to Marcus's arm that it burned his sleeve. They hit the surviving assassins and drove them into the far wall. Both men grunted and pushed, trying to keep the enemy from getting off a shot. They failed at that but did keep the blasts pointed at the ceiling, which was a good second option. Vlad and Margaret grabbed a pair of fallen blasters. Unfortunately for the guards, Marcus and Tommy had been too late to save any of them. We're ready, Vlad said, aiming his blaster at the trapped assassins. Let them have it, Tommy said, not relaxing in the least. Marcus didn't even try to speak. It was taking everything he had to keep the assassin on his side from pushing the table away. If that happened they would all be in serious trouble. Vlad and Margaret opened fire, sending blast after blast into the trapped men until their power packs went dead. The assassins had stopped moving, so Marcus and Tommy tossed what little remained of the table aside, revealing their blaster-riddled bodies. There wasn't enough left of Feng and his minion to bother burying. I'm not aware of technology that would allow someone to bypass our scanners, Margaret said. Who could have done this to them? Beats me, Tommy said as he collected the two remaining blasters and tossed one to Marcus. But I'm pretty sure the Jade Dragons aren't really interested in peace. Nor will they have it, Margaret said, her voice hard. After this dishonorable act, all the clans will turn against them. In a few months, the Jade Dragons will no longer exist. I hope you're right. Marcus checked his blaster and found it held less than half a charge. Not exactly ideal, but hopefully he wouldn't even need to shoot it. But unless I'm badly mistaken, this is Void Tech. And if they made a deal with the Children of the Void, you can be sure that any fight will be a difficult one. You mean those people who paid the most on the welcome visit to Mars a few months ago? Vlad asked. Yep, lately they seem to be the bane of my existence. He took a step toward the door. Let's get back to the star. I need to let my boss know what's going on. A muffled explosion shook the building. What now? Vlad asked. Marcus didn't know, but he didn't have a good feeling. Are there any other people in the building? No, we cleared it for the meeting. No one is due to return for a couple hours. Margaret shook her head. Some of the clan heads thought I was being overly cautious, but I'm glad I insisted. They left the meeting room and started down the hall toward the staircase. Another, even louder explosion shook the building. It took everything Marcus had to keep his feet. Tommy caught Vlad's arm and held the old man steady. They barely had time to catch their breath when a deafening blast struck the building. The ceiling collapsed, steel girders and other rubble cutting Marcus and Margaret off from Vlad and Tommy. He could just see them through gaps in the debris. You guys okay? Marcus asked. Yeah, you? Tommy asked. We're fine. Marcus turned to look up through the hole in the roof, only to see a massive void warship overhead. On second thought, none of us are fine. Get Vlad to the star. We'll meet you there. Tell Solomon to contact Dracor. We're going to need serious backup. What about you? Tommy asked. We'll find another way. Marcus glanced at Margaret. There is another way, right? Depending on the damage, we should be able to take the lift. Her little worried frown did nothing for his confidence. We won't know for sure until we look. More blasts shook the building, though it didn't sound like the ship was targeting them directly. Not at the moment, at least. Let's look quickly. I'd just as soon be somewhere else when this place comes down. Chapter 5 Vlad looked back at the heap of rubble separating him from Marcus. The Ethereans' fate didn't concern him in the least, but if anything happened to Marcus, he'll be fine. Vlad's gaze snapped back to Tommy. 
Marcus might be the closest thing Vlad had to a son, but Tommy was certainly close to being a favorite nephew. After Anna, he loved no one more in the universe. No doubt some would say that if he loved them so much, he shouldn't have brought them into such a dangerous situation, and they wouldn't have been wrong. But this was the business Vlad and Tommy had chosen. As for Marcus, he might have left the criminal life behind, but he was generally in even more danger than they were. Vlad would just have to trust that his considerable experience would see Marcus through. Focusing on his own escape was the priority now. Not exactly how you expected the meeting to go, Tommy asked. It was a sign of how anxious he was that Tommy felt the need to chatter. Usually, he was stone cold and silent. They ran a few yards down the hall toward the staircase before Vlad replied, Not exactly, though the betrayal surprised me less than the means they chose. Marcus hasn't shared a great deal of information with me about the void, but the little I do know makes me think that the Jade Dragons were more desperate than I first believed if they'd go to the lunatics for help. They reached the door to the stairwell, and Tommy pushed. The door didn't budge. Shit, the frame's warped. I'll have to blast the hinges. Three shots and a hard kick sent the door crashing into the landing. At least the steps looked solid. Tommy set a slow but steady pace. Given the damage they'd already seen, Vlad had no desire to stumble into something else and so didn't encourage him to hurry. A blast from the void ship sent dust raining down over them. Then again, maybe hurrying a little wouldn't be such a poor idea. Tommy. I know, sir. But if you look at the edge of the stairs, you'll see them starting to pull away from the wall. I'm afraid if we go pounding down full speed, that might finish the job and send us on a nasty ride. Vlad glanced right and grimaced at the four inches of steel that had pulled out of the concrete. He shook his head. How did the saying go? Trapped between the devil and the deep blue sea? That pretty well described their current situation. What he couldn't figure out was why that ship didn't just level the club with them in it. Three or four direct hits with their main cannons would do the trick and then some. It didn't make sense. Not that he intended to complain, he just wished he understood what his enemies were up to. At the bottom of the steps, they emerged into the foyer. The damage was minimal on this level, just some overturned decorations and a lot of dust. Tommy went straight for the door. It's going to be a long walk back to the ship since I can't imagine a cab showing up in all this. Maybe we can find a vehicle to steal. You still remember how to hotwire a hover car, right? Of course I do, but I don't have my kit, which will make it harder. Vlad followed Tommy out the front door and nearly ran into his broad back. The reason he stopped became clear a moment later when Vlad stepped around him. The main street had been turned into a cratered moonscape. People from multiple races were running around screaming as they fled buildings even more damaged than the club. Above them, the void ship hadn't fired for half a minute. With so many targets on the ground, he couldn't imagine what they were waiting for. I don't see a car worth stealing, Tommy said. We'd best get walking. We're not going anywhere until Marcus catches up. He said to meet him at the ship. I don't care what he said. We're not leaving. Tommy chose not to argue, which was wise since the results would have been the same regardless. There was no way Vlad could abandon Marcus and live with himself. He might be a cold-blooded gangster, but family was still family. He glanced up at the void ship in time to see a door in the hull slide open. A moment later, a small black ship about half the size of the star flew out and dove toward the ground. It didn't fire. Instead, a belly door opened. Back inside, Tommy grabbed his arm and hustled him through the front door. Strange black spheres fell from the ship, twenty in all. When they hit, nothing happened. If they weren't bombs, then what the hell were they? The answer came a moment later when the spheres melted away, revealing five-foot-tall, broad-shouldered reptilian monsters. They stood up straight and flexed arms that ended in oversized hands tipped with long, rending claws. They were a nightmare come to life. Suggestions, Tommy. Keep quiet, stay out of sight, and hope they don't notice us. A perfectly reasonable plan given their lack of resources. They backed away from the door, but not so far that they couldn't keep an eye on the monsters. The creatures took a moment to shake off the effects of the rough landing. As soon as they did, they charged at the nearest pedestrians. The oversized claws made quick work of the unarmed people. 
They were torn to shreds, and soon blood stained the pavement. Tommy was right. Vlad certainly hoped those things didn't notice them. As soon as he thought it, one of the reptilian monsters looked their way. Its eyes were the strangest thing. Flat, black, and seeming to absorb the light, they were unlike anything he'd ever seen or heard about. The monster sprinted right at them while its fellows continued to strike down the people trying in vain to flee. Tommy raised his blaster and fired. The crimson beam burned a hole through the monster's head, and it collapsed. A moment later, it sat up, the two-inch diameter hole in its forehead filled with the same black stuff that covered its eyes. As the creature climbed to its feet, Tommy said, I don't like the look of this, sir. Vlad didn't like it either. Even worse, he had no idea what to do about it. Marcus shot a final, pointless glare at the pile of rubble blocking him from reaching Vlad and Tommy and turned back to Margaret. Looks like it's you and me. Which way? Back and down the left-hand corridor. She turned and took the lead, her stride steady. The only hint of nerves was a slight tremor in her hands. Hopefully the emergency controls haven't shut down the lift. Marcus offered a silent prayer of thanks that he didn't end up having to deal with a civilian in a situation like this. While he doubted she had served the dragons in a combat role, clearly Margaret had experience with dangerous situations. Under different circumstances, he would have loved to hear how she ended up where she did, but right now, he had to focus on the problem at hand. They turned down the hall. All the pictures had fallen to the floor, but at least there were no more holes in the ceiling. Thank the universe for small favors. He held the earpiece up, but heard only static. Seemed the jamming was still in full effect. Why do you suppose the Jade Dragons would make a deal with the Void? Marcus asked. I don't know. My first thought was desperation, but they weren't losing that badly to Vlad. It's possible the Void offered them something more than the integrated weapons, but I can't imagine what. They also had to know that ship would be coming here. The other clans won't stand for getting sold out. The Jade Dragons are done. They cut their own throats, and they don't even know it. Marcus hoped she was right, but when it came to the Void, you didn't want to take anything for granted. They had to have something bigger in mind than just helping a bunch of gangsters. Figuring out what that might be would no doubt be his next mission, assuming he made it off-planet in one piece. Here we go. Margaret stopped in front of a pair of closed lift doors. She pressed the call button, but only got the screech of metal on metal as a response. That didn't bode well for them getting a ride down. Margaret slammed her fist into the button as if that would make it more likely to respond. Come on! Looks like it's out of commission. Marcus stepped up beside her. Let me see if I can get the doors open and we'll take a look. He worked his fingers into the tiny crack where the doors came together and pulled with all his might. The doors budged about an inch, just enough for him to get a better grip. Margaret took hold as well, and between them, they finally jerked the doors all the way open and looked into the lift shaft. The light wasn't great, but he could see enough bent metal to know that the lift had fallen and damaged the side of the shaft. Getting down this way wasn't going to be easy. Luckily, he had a little bit of experience with this sort of thing, so hopefully they could pick their way down to the ground floor. I don't think I've ever said this to a beautiful woman before, but I wish you had a few more clothes on. All that bare metal is likely to scrape you up. She grinned at that. If I get out of this with nothing more than a few scrapes, I'll consider myself lucky. Talking to the clan heads after this disaster will be far more dangerous. They can't blame you for what happened. Marcus eased over the lip and lowered himself until his foot hit a twisted piece of metal. It held his weight without moving. So far, so good. Just as he was thinking a headlamp would have been nice, a dull, ruddy light filled the space, revealing a tangle of bent metal and jagged, broken pieces of concrete. At the bottom, the roof of the lift car was visible. That was a relief as he'd feared it might be above them, barely hanging on. Margaret looked down at him. I got the emergency lights working. How's it look? Not great, but at least the blasts have stopped. Lower yourself down and I'll guide you to my foothold. She sat at the edge of the lip, then lowered herself down with greater ease than he thought possible, given her slender arms. Unfortunately, while she was stronger than he expected, she was still about six inches too short. When I tell you to let go, 
let go. Are you crazy? Yes, but that's a whole other discussion. You have to trust me. Your legs, nice as they are, come up a little short. Inch a bit to your right. She scooted over until her feet were as close as possible. Okay. Let go. She sucked in a deep breath and fell. Marcus caught her, his arm sliding up her butt to the small of her back before he hugged her tight to his chest. It took a moment for them both to catch their breath, or try to catch his breath in Marcus's case. Pressed this tight to Margaret, breathing easy wasn't in his future. Thanks. This is a bit snug, but not unpleasant. She smiled in a way that almost made him wish he was single. Right. Best move things along. It doesn't get any more pleasant from here. The gap's narrow, and we'll need to avoid all sorts of sharp metal bits. On the plus side, there are plenty of hand and footholds to choose from. I'll go first, watch where I put my hands and feet, and try to use the same spots. If they hold my weight, they'll hold yours. Marcus separated himself from Margaret, reluctantly, he had to admit, and started picking his way down the ruined shaft. The jutting metal did make it easy to climb, but so many pieces were sharp and pointed that he needed to be very careful where he put his hands. Yard by painful yard, he worked his way down. By some miracle, he reached the top of the lift car with only minor scratches and a nasty bruise to his right knee. He looked up and found Margaret making good time. She was about two-thirds of the way down and didn't appear to be bleeding. That was about the best result he could hope for. As if the thought was a curse, her left foot missed a hold, her hand slipped, and she fell. Marcus reached out and caught her directly above a shattered girder that would have pierced her chest and pulled her back. He lost his balance in the process and tumbled over, wrenching his bruised knee and getting the wind knocked out of him. Margaret, seated on his chest, looked down at him, her face twisted with worry. Are you okay? Marcus gasped in a breath. I'll live. Could you stand up, please? She scrambled to get off him. Sorry, you saved my life. You sound surprised. Marcus forced himself to his feet and grimaced at the pain in his knee. I suppose I am. The sorts of people I'm used to dealing with wouldn't go out of their way to help anyone. Not even a high-ranking member of the clan? You misunderstand my purpose. The clans chose me to be in charge here because I'm not actually a member of any of them. This is neutral territory, and they wanted someone they could trust, but who wasn't actually a member to run things. I'm entirely disposable as far as the clan heads are concerned. That's awful. Marcus checked the hatch and found it twisted and popped out of its frame. Bracing himself, he yanked until it screeched open. You deserve better. You only say that because you don't know me that well. I was nothing but a high-end whore that showed a little more brains than average. I parlayed my talents for teasing secrets out of my clients into this job. I've entertained all the clan heads, and they enjoy bragging in bed. If they try anything, they'll regret it. Sounds harsh. Marcus lowered himself toward the floor of the lift car and dropped the final three feet. His knees screamed at him when he hit, but he ignored the pain. Soon enough, they'd be back at the star and a med kit would set things right in short order. You've lived this life, Margaret joined him easily. Everything about it is harsh. People tend to fall into two groups, those that want to kill you and those that want to use you. I've just learned to play by the rules others set. I'm not blaming you or anything. Marcus stepped through the ruined doors into the club's main hall. I just can't help imagining how you would have done in different circumstances. You're smart, beautiful, talented. You could be anything. Maybe I could have been. She stepped out beside him and kissed his cheek. But now this is the only life I'm suited for. I'm ruined, as decent people say. Marcus turned to look her in the eye and put a hand on her shoulder. Only close-minded, stupid people think that way. Those same people would say that given my past, I have no place in honest society. And look at me now. I say to hell with those people. If you want to change, then change. I'll help you if I can. The screaming of a blaster pistol ended the conversation before it could get awkward. That came from the front door, Margaret said. Sounds like Tommy and Vlad already arrived and found trouble. 
Let's see if we can help. The pair set out at the pace of Marcus's hobble. He had a third of a charge left in his blaster. If they needed more than that, he didn't know what they'd do. Chapter 6 Happily for Marcus's knee, it wasn't far from the lift to the front door. He and Margaret arrived to see Vlad and Tommy hiding on either side of the double doors as some sort of two-legged reptile scraped its claws against the glass trying to force its way in. That it hadn't smashed through already shocked Marcus. The glass must have been made of something sturdier than usual. The lizard thing focused on them with its dead black eyes and went berserk, scratching and clawing even harder against the unyielding glass. Tommy waved them over, and as soon as they moved out of sight, it seemed to calm down. Who's your friend? Marcus asked. I don't know, but he isn't alone. There are a bunch more of them out there hunting the people that fled their buildings when the void ship attacked. Speaking of that thing, it's up there just hanging around. What the hell's going on? Marcus wished he had a good answer for his friend, but nothing that had happened made sense given what he knew, though he felt confident that from the Void's perspective it made perfect sense. I wish I knew. Are you okay? All things considered, yeah. What are we going to do? Eventually that lizard guy is going to break through. I'm working on it. How about you, old man? Vlad snorted. Don't worry about me. I'm not so old that I can't keep up with you brats. Marcus grinned. He figured it would take a lot more than this to get to Vlad. Is there some reason you didn't shoot it? Margaret asked. I did shoot it. Tommy held up his blasters so they could see the depleted power gauge. See all those black spots covering it? That's where I shot it. The blast went right through. Then it healed up in a blink. Didn't even seem to phase the damn thing. I hope you have a plan because I sure as hell don't. Unkillable lizard monsters were a little bit outside of Marcus's area of expertise. Escaping from crazy situations, on the other hand, he had a bit more experience with. He turned to Margaret. Do you have a garage or maybe a secret escape tunnel? We have a garage and a car, but no secret tunnel, I'm afraid. A car will do. Marcus offered his blaster to Tommy. Here, you're a better shot than I am anyway. Fat lot of good it'd do me against these things. Despite his complaint, Tommy took the weapon. The three of them fell in behind Margaret, who led them back past the ruined lift. Marcus limped along as fast as he could, but every step made the pain in his knee worse. If they actually had to run for it, he was screwed. Tommy moved up beside him. Lean on me. Marcus wasn't so proud that he'd refuse a hand. He put his arm around Tommy's shoulder and felt immediately better with some of the pressure off his knee. They passed concession stands and dressing rooms before finally reaching a door marked staff only. The damage didn't seem as bad in this part of the club. Margaret pushed the door open, and he immediately regretted the thought. A shiny, black, four-door hover car sat in the middle of the garage looking just as perfect as you please. The garage door, on the other hand, had been blasted to bits and the roof above it collapsed. It had to be a coincidence but it almost looked like the void ship had targeted the spot to seal them in. Well, shit, Marcus said. We're not getting out this way. Tommy looked from the car to the debris pile and back. I think we can push the rubble aside. It's going to ugly up your car a bit, though. Margaret shrugged. I didn't pay for it. From outside, screams reached them. Whatever was going on, it wasn't far away. If we're going to do this, Vlad said, then let's do it. No one argued as they piled into the car with Tommy behind the wheel. He powered it up and the engine thrummed with power. Looked like the clans hadn't skimped when they bought Margaret's ride, at least. Everyone hang on tight. Tommy shifted into reverse and eased onto the accelerator. The car shook when the back bumper hit the pile of rubble. Metal groaned and bent. Marcus couldn't tell if the car or the rubble was breaking up. The engine roared louder, and with a horrific crash, they smashed through and shot into the sunlight. Outside of the club, it looked like a scene from a horror movie. The reptilian monsters were running down and slaughtering unarmed civilians. Marcus had seen his share of death and destruction, but somehow watching people get torn apart with tooth and claw seemed far worse than watching them get blasted. Margaret seemed to agree, as she buried her face in Marcus's chest. Tommy shifted into drive and floored it. The car lurched, sputtered, spat smoke, 
and eventually took off, though at a far slower speed than Marcus would have liked. I think I damaged the acceleration system, Tommy said as he wrestled with the wheel, and the steering isn't great either. Still better than walking, Marcus said. Watch out, Vlad shouted. Tommy swerved around a monster. Its claws sliced a groove in the driver's side door, and then they were passed. At this rate, even Willie wouldn't buy what's left of the car, Tommy muttered. Marcus chuckled but didn't comment. The truth was, Willie would buy anything if the price was cheap enough. When they finally left the city behind and pulled onto the highway, Marcus let out a sigh of relief. Margaret pulled away from him. Sorry, I've seen some things, but that slaughter... She shuddered, and Marcus knew just how she felt. Hoping to take her mind off what they saw, he asked, will the dragons be able to retake control of the city? Depends. With that warship overhead, probably not. If it's just the monsters, most likely, assuming I can get word to the clan heads about what happened. Marcus snapped his fingers and pulled the earpiece out of his pocket. He checked and found the shrill squeal of signal jamming still going strong. Were they jamming comms planet-wide? That seemed like a lot for one void ship, though Marcus certainly knew better than to underestimate their capabilities. By some miracle, their beat-up hover car made it to the spaceport. Unfortunately, when they arrived, they found another batch of the lizard things running around, tearing people up. From a distance, Marcus couldn't make them out well, but it looked like dozens, if not hundreds, of bodies littered the ground outside the main terminal. Doesn't this planet have a military? Tommy asked. No, Margaret said. We have security forces, but they're mainly here to break up drunken brawls and take jealous husbands into custody. As far as I know, nothing like this has ever happened before. Most people are too afraid of the dragon's reputation, Vlad said. But as far as I know, these void lunatics fear nothing. That certainly meshed with what Marcus knew about them. They were the sort of people that wouldn't think twice about slaughtering an entire planet's worth of people if it advanced some bizarre bit of research they were conducting. Marcus finally understood. The Void was testing these creatures, trying to figure out how effective they were as weapons. Nothing else made sense. Of course, knowing that didn't help them in the least, but it did help him make some sort of sense of the situation. Can we get to the hangar? Marcus asked. Shouldn't be a problem. Tommy turned off the highway and down the ramp that led to the spaceport. The car sputtered and coughed as they reached the tarmac. Maybe a little problem. Come on, baby, just a little further. Marcus added a silent prayer of his own. His knee had begun to swell and he had his doubts about just how far he could walk if he had to. One of the lizard things came running at them from the side. Tommy swerved to try and avoid it, but it leapt and landed on the roof. A moment later, claws smashed through the roof and missed impaling Margaret by six inches. Vlad grabbed Tommy's blaster and emptied the power cell into the roof. There was a thud, and Marcus looked out the shattered back window just in time to see the monster climbing to its feet. The void might be a bunch of homicidal lunatics, but they knew how to make monsters. There's our hangar, Tommy said. Marcus peered around his head through the cracked windshield. There were a number of black stains around the ship. Slow down, Tommy. The external defenses are on. They'll blast us just as surely as one of those things. I'm not sure slowing down is a good idea. Margaret was looking out the back window. There are three of them coming up behind us in a hurry. Shit. Marcus rolled his window down and grimaced as he forced his head and arm outside. He waved and shouted, Solomon, lower the ramp. Please, for the love of all that's good in the universe, let him be watching the external monitors. Do I slow down or keep going? Tommy asked. Keep going, Margaret said. The lizards are only 20 yards behind us. Whatever power watched over crazy ex-smugglers must have been on duty today. The ramp started to lower. Drive right into the hold, Marcus said. You sure, bro? I'm not so confident in the brakes. I'm willing to risk it. Go. As soon as the ramp hit the ground, Tommy floored it. The engine responded with a groan, but damn little extra speed. The front end dipped as the anti-gravity generator started to fail. The front bumper caught the lip of the ramp and rattled them hard. Metal screamed, but they kept going. Marcus caught a glimpse of Gruesome stepping into the opening behind them. 
A moment later, the sounds of the Warbot's plasma cannons opening up filled the hold. Marcus couldn't remember ever hearing a more beautiful sound. Tommy needn't have worried about damaging the hold. The car died ten yards short of the back wall and they hit the deck with a dull thud. Marcus forced his door open and dragged himself out of the car. He'd barely turned toward the rear of the ship when Gruesome's cannons fell silent and the ramp started rising. Marcus tried to take a step toward the cockpit, but his knee buckled and he barely caught himself on the car. Tommy, help me to the cockpit. You'll need a med kit, Vlad said. I need to get us off this planet, and the sooner the better. The knee will keep until then. Tommy slung Marcus's arm around his shoulder, and they started toward the door that led into the main part of the ship. It reminded Marcus of the slowest three-legged race in history. The door opened before they reached it, and Solomon's sweaty, disheveled figure appeared. What happened to you? Nothing serious. I just busted my knee. What's our status? The ship is fine. Those, whatever they are, attacked twice, not counting the ones you brought along. The ship's cannons made short work of them, but they were tough. One blast hit off center and blew away the monster's right arm and a fair chunk of its chest. It got back up, and this weird black stuff oozed out and repaired the damage, even growing it a new arm. You have to completely blow away the entire body to kill them. Yeah, we noticed they were sturdy. What about the void ship? It's just floating there over the city. It hasn't fired a shot since it deployed the monsters. Comms? Scrambled on and off planet. We're not contacting anyone until we put some distance between us and that ship. And I mean at least a full system's worth of distance. I'm pretty sure they uploaded some kind of virus to the orbital satellites. That's their M.O., isn't it? Okay, let's see if we can get off planet without that ship blasting us to smithereens. Vlad, Margaret, you two might want to get to the guest cabin and hold on tight. They set out for the cockpit at a slow limp. Much to his relief, Vlad didn't argue when they reached the door to his room. In the cockpit, Tommy lowered Marcus into the pilot's chair. He let out a sigh of relief when all the weight was off his leg. Thanks for the hand, Tommy. You can strap in at comms and weapons control or head back and join Vlad. Tommy hesitated for a moment, then said, I'd better get back. Try not to get us blown out of the air. Marcus snorted a laugh. If we survived your driving, there's no way my piloting will get us killed. When the door closed behind Tommy, Solomon asked, How bad is it out there? Bad. Like, the kind of bad that will give you nightmares for the rest of your life be glad you stayed on the ship. Oh, I am. Considering the shape you came back in, I doubt I would have survived. I plotted an escape vector that should let us avoid the enemy ship, depending, of course, on how badly they want to keep us here. Understood. Fire up the engines and put your route on my display. The familiar task of prepping for takeoff did wonders to help Marcus ignore the pain in his knee, as well as distracting him from the memories of what he saw on the way here. Since they never fully shut the star down, the process didn't take long, and soon they were racing, low to the ground, at an angle away from the void ship. When they reached the opposite side of the planet, Marcus pulled back on the yoke, sending them up into orbit. Nothing shot at them, and there wasn't a second ship waiting to smoke them at the last second. As soon as they were far enough away from the planet, Solomon activated the hyperdrive, and they shot into the swirling vortex. By some miracle, they'd survived. Chapter 7 The hyperspace jump Solomon had plotted would take 15 minutes and bring them to an uninhabited system well away from basically anything resembling civilization. With the ship on autopilot, Marcus limped back to the galley to see to his knee while Solomon kept an eye on things in the cockpit. Not that anything could really bother them while they were in hyperspace but after everything that had happened, he wasn't going to take any chances. He grabbed the med kit from storage and settled in at the steel table. First things first. He took the portable scanner out and ran it from mid-thigh to mid-calf. A couple of partially torn ligaments and considerable swelling. Nowhere near as bad as it might have been. The recommended course of treatment popped up on the scanner's tiny screen. An injection of bio-enhancers would repair the damage and bring down the swelling while reducing the pain. That last part interested him the most. As he sorted through the vials, the door opened and Vlad, Tommy, and Margaret strode through. They all looked calm enough considering what they just went through. It spoke volumes about how tough the three of them were. He found the right vial, 
fitted it into the injector, and shot the serum directly into his knee. The painkiller kicked in immediately, and he let out a long sigh. In an hour or so, he should be fully recovered. Is anyone hurt? He waved a hand at the med kit. I'm all set up to take a look. We're all fine, my boy, Vlad said. This seemed like a good time to discuss our next moves. Good idea. Take a seat. We'll be at our destination in about ten minutes. Comms should be working again, and we can contact whoever we need to. At a minimum, I'll need to let the Council know about the Void attack. If there's anything you'd prefer I not mention about our actual reason for visiting Pleasure Planet 4, let me know. Your discretion is much appreciated, Vlad said. May I suggest calling it a family outing? Unless they ask for details, that should be enough. Sure, Marcus said. And I don't know enough about either your or Margaret's business to talk about it anyway. However, no matter what I say or don't say, there's going to be an investigation. When the void is involved, it's inevitable. Understood, Margaret said. I'll let the clan heads know what to expect. Most of our activities on planet are above board anyway, so it shouldn't be an issue. If it's not too much of a bother, could I get you to drop me off at our corporate headquarters, for lack of a better word? An in-person debriefing will be necessary. Shouldn't be a problem. Marcus turned to Vlad. I imagine you'll be heading back to Mars. Indeed. Getting involved with this sort of thing is bad for business. I appreciate your help, Marcus. And if there's any information I can provide, I'll be happy to do so. But other than that, my organization will be staying out of it. Marcus nodded, neither surprised nor disappointed. Vlad's business was what it was, and it had hardly been set up to investigate threats like the Void. That was the Council's job. Okay, I'll contact the Council, then Margaret can call whoever she needs to. Then we take Vlad and Tommy back to Mars, and finally we drop Margaret off at her corporate headquarters. By then my boss should have orders for me, and I can do what I do. Sound like a plan? No one argued, and a few minutes later Solomon's voice came over the intercom. Thirty seconds to real space. Marcus stood, pleased to find his knee almost pain-free, and headed for the cockpit. He settled in his chair just as the countdown reached zero and they emerged from hyperspace. He powered the engines down until the scanners registered all stop. Did you get things sorted out? Solomon asked. More or less. Any issues here? The ship is running perfectly. Unlike the car in our cargo hold, the star took no damage. Marcus chuckled. We'll have to find a place to dump it. Maybe we can return it to the dragons when we drop Margaret off. Get me the council. Solomon pressed a single button. A section of the view screen went dark as the computer connected to the hypernet. It took a few seconds, but eventually the silver masked face of a Vensar appeared. Not the boss, unfortunately. Unless there was an active emergency, Marcus seldom got Dracor on the first try. Captain Drake, the Vensar said. Council records show that you requested a few days of personal time off. I did and my vacation was going brilliantly until a void warship showed up over Pleasure Planet 4. It blasted a bunch of buildings, then released some weird new monsters on the populace. We got out by the skin of our teeth, but there are a lot of dead people, and given the state of their security apparatus, there will be a lot more if the Council doesn't act in a hurry. We have a force of Vinsar war cruisers on constant alert for void activity. One will be dispatched at once. Please provide us with detailed location data and whatever information you have on the... monsters. He said the word monsters with the general disdain of someone that hated imprecise definitions. That pretty much summarized every Vensar Marcus had met outside of Dracor, and even the boss had only lightened up after getting to know them. Transmitting location data now. Marcus glanced at Solomon, who nodded and got to work. As for the monsters, we don't have much information to share. The damn things are tough. Like, shoot them between the eyes and they get back up tough. One of them got nearly blown in half by the ship's cannon and healed from it. Speaking of, I might be able to isolate an image from our gun cameras. You mean I might be able to, Solomon muttered as he worked. Marcus grinned at that. He actually could run all the systems on the star, but Solomon was much faster. Data and image sent. Solomon said. Packet received, the Vinsar confirmed. 
The chief counselor will be informed as well. As always, Captain, the council thanks you for your service. Roger. Anything else you need me to do? Not at this time. Council headquarters out. The screen went dead, and a moment later, the exterior view reappeared. Such abrupt endings used to annoy Marcus, but he'd come to understand that was just the Vinsar's way, especially with people outside their species. Getting pissy about it was pointless. You saved us a copy of that monster pick, right? Marcus asked. Solomon nodded. I save a copy of everything. Great. Run an image search and see if you can figure out what it is. You're not planning to do anything dangerous, are you? The council said they don't need us to do anything else right now. Yeah, I heard, but you know the boss is eventually going to have us running down leads. It won't hurt to get a bit of a head start. Besides, I'm curious. Solomon typed in a string of commands and said, It's running, but given the size of our database, it might take some time. Marcus shrugged. Like you said, we're not even on the job yet, so no rush. I hate to ask, but could you split for 20 minutes? Margaret wants to call her bosses, and I doubt she'll want us listening in. I don't want to listen in, Solomon stood. In fact, I'd like to forget a great deal of what I already know about this underworld business. Marcus could understand that. He'd been mixed up in this stuff since he was a teenager, so it didn't really bother him all that much. Solomon ducked into his cabin, and Marcus kept going to the galley where he found Vlad and the others still seated at the table in wary silence. Despite their shared near-death experience, it seemed they hadn't gotten completely comfortable with each other. Calm's yours, Margaret. As soon as you're done, we'll head for Mars. What did the council have to say? Vlad asked. They're dispatching a Vensar warship to deal with the void. For now, I'm supposed to keep my nose out of it. But that will never last. I'm sure as soon as I finish dropping you guys off, I'll have a job waiting for me. You don't seem too upset about it, Tommy said. Judging by how today went, I think you'd want to keep your distance. Marcus snorted a laugh. That's not how the job works. The more dangerous it is, the more likely I am to be involved. Margaret stood. Thank you for taking the time to let me call my people. Of course. Besides, if I'm going to be dropping you off, I'd just as soon they know we're coming. Arriving at Dragon HQ unannounced strikes me as a poor idea. She followed Marcus up the hall to the cockpit and sat in Solomon's chair. The comm unit was pretty standard, but he pointed out where everything was anyway. I'll leave you to it. Wait, he froze. Is something wrong? Would you mind staying? I know we're light years away from any danger. But I'd appreciate it. If you don't mind me hearing what you have to say, sure. He dropped into his own seat and pressed a button that deactivated the camera on his side of the cockpit. Have you always been this scared of your bosses? You gave the impression of not fearing anything. Her lips twisted in a bitter smile. In this line of work, showing fear is a sign of weakness. It doesn't matter if you're terrified every second of every day. You smile, flirt, flatter, threaten, or kill with complete confidence. Anything less will get you torn apart, possibly literally. Marcus winced at her description, despite knowing it to be the truth. He'd lived the life long enough to recognize that what she said was the reality for many people. As Vlad's adopted son, he was insulated from a lot of it, and he'd always be grateful to the old man for that. Maybe after this you can get a better post. After this debacle, I'll be lucky not to end up getting shoved out an airlock. Still, no sense delaying the inevitable. She punched in a code, and they waited in uncomfortable silence. Marcus wanted to say something to reassure her, tell her everything would work out, but the lies stuck in his throat. Maybe the council could give her shelter, but only if she betrayed the dragons and Margaret didn't strike him as the sort of woman that would do something like that. No, she'd face it head on, fake sexy smile firmly in place, and take what came. Half a minute passed with no response. Is this normal? Marcus asked. It doesn't happen often, but if the volume of incoming traffic overwhelms the operators, the wait can last for a couple minutes. That usually only happens if the clans are working together on a big project spanning several territories. 
I think that's only happened twice since I've been in a position to know about it. Do you think word about the attack has reached them already? She shrugged. Impossible to say. Doubtful given the planet-wide jamming. But the dragons have so many ways of getting information I can't fully dismiss the idea. After three minutes, the screen finally wavered, and an error symbol appeared all the way across it. Marcus reached across her and typed in a basic diagnostic command. The computer quickly confirmed that the problem wasn't on their end. Not a surprise since he'd just contacted the council with no issue. I don't know what to tell you, Marcus said. If you want, we can try again when we reach Mars. She nodded, but the look of fear on her face had grown even worse. Again, words of reassurance stuck in his throat. Whatever was going on, Marcus had a bad feeling no one was going to like it. Soma Tojo tapped the artificial eye embedded in his left eye socket. Watching his finger touching his own eye used to make him uncomfortable. As soon as he realized it, he made himself keep doing it until he was no longer troubled by the sensation. That was the same way he overcame all forms of weakness face it head-on, and overwhelm it. Somehow, in the process of habituating himself, the tapping had become a nervous tick. That came with its own annoyances, but he didn't have time to dwell on his deficiencies now. He expected word from his new allies any time with good news about the death of his most hated rival, Vlad Valkor. With the rest of the clans out of the way, Vlad was the only real obstacle to the Jade Dragons controlling all criminal activity in civilized space. They'd be the most powerful clan in history, and all his sacrifices would be worth it. Unable to sit still any longer, he pushed himself out of his chair and started pacing around his cabin. His personal ship, the Katana, was designed for comfort while still having plenty of space for cargo. Multi-use, the designer said, and it was that. He glanced at the small bar, or more specifically the collection of crystal decanters filled with amber liquid behind it. A drink might help him relax, but Soma had no intention of being at anything less than his best when the call finally came in. After five passes, the chime sounded. He strode over to the door, took a moment to compose himself, and opened it. His second, Tio, stood outside. The burly warrior had a build more suited to a Viking than one of their lineage. His suit barely fit, and his hair was shorn so tight to his head that he was nearly bald, you would have had an easier time reading the emotions of a boulder than Tio's blank face. You have news? Valkor escaped, but our allies were pleased with the results of the test. Voidwalker says we're to go and get more specimens and bring them back to base. Soma clenched his remaining fist. Is that what he says? We've lived up to our end of the bargain, and he failed to kill one old man, yet we're still getting new orders? How is he planning to make this right? He said nothing beyond what I reported, sir, and I didn't think it wise to question him myself. Tio's expression never cracked, but Soma knew him well enough to hear the trepidation in his voice. He understood it perfectly. Anyone that had spoken to Voidwalker would understand it. The leader of the Children of the Void had an uncanny way about him. But no matter what, Soma couldn't be seen acting intimidated. Should I lay in a course? Tio asked. No, not until I speak with Voidwalker. Promises were made, and no one goes back on their word with the Jade Dragons and gets away with it. Tio let slip a strangled noise, but made no other comment. Return to the bridge. I'll contact you when I'm finished. Yes, sir. Tio bowed and stepped back. As soon as the door slid shut, Soma returned to his desk. Despite all his big talk, he would have to handle this with the utmost care. He punched in the private code Void Walker had given him when they struck the final bargain. Barely a second passed before the black, oval mask filled the screen. Soma, were the orders I gave to your subordinate unclear? They were perfectly clear, sir. However, Tio said that Valcor escaped. Our deal was that he would die. And? And I wish to know what you plan to do to rectify this error. Do you wish to know that? How very bold. Bring me the specimens, and we'll talk in person once you arrive. 
Soma felt the blood drain out of his face. Speaking to Void Walker face to face was so much worse than doing it over the calm, but he refused to show weakness. Very well. I look forward to hearing the details. Goodbye, Soma. Void Walker's face vanished. Soma swallowed hard and leaned back in his chair. The way Void Walker said goodbye made it sound like he'd never see anything ever again. That was all in Soma's head, of course. Void Walker needed the Jade Dragons to act openly in place of his far too noticeable ships. Yes, he wouldn't dare do anything permanent. Best to collect the specimens quickly and get it over with. If they were prompt in carrying out Void Walker's request, he'd be in a better mood and more inclined to share information. Soma nodded to himself as he hit the intercom to connect to the bridge. It wasn't that he was frightened of Void Walker. He was just trying to make things as easy as possible for both of them. Yes, that's exactly what he was doing. Chapter 8 Dracor stood on the bridge of his ship, as still and calm as a mountain lake, at least on the outside. The many Vensar manning stations and tending to the ship's needs had no idea about the turmoil in his heart. He'd been on Vensar Prime when word of the void attack reached him, a rare visit home for the most depressing of reasons. His beloved cousin, Lysen, had begun to show signs of the disease's final stages. She was at the finest medical facility on the planet and would receive the best care, just like all those at the end did. But everyone knew what the ultimate result would be. Death. When word came of the attack, she had insisted that he go. They had said all there was to be said. He'd lingered to keep her company, but feared that his sad gaze had proven more troubling than comforting for her. He swallowed perhaps his hundredth sigh of the day. People thought the Vensar were perfect, rational beings that never let their emotions get the better of them. That was a total lie. Vensar felt the full range of emotions that any other sentient being did. In fact, he'd felt most of them every day since Lysen's diagnosis. Rage, sadness, and depression being the most prominent. One minute to real space, First Counselor, Helm said. Right. No more wallowing in his emotions. It was time to focus. Shields at maximum and all weapons primed to fire. The countdown timer appeared on the bridge's main screen. When it reached zero, a faint shudder ran through the ship, and the blue-green sphere of Pleasure Planet 4 took its place. From this distance, you'd never know there was a problem. No sign of the void ship, scanners reported. Planetary control attempting to make contact, Combs said. Maintain full alert and put them on screen. A disheveled-looking human in a blue uniform popped up on screen. His dark hair was soaked with sweat and his gaze held a haunted edge. Are you the relief team? We have over a thousand dead and millions of terrified guests. Any assistance would be much appreciated. I am First Counselor Drakhor of the Galactic Council. Who am I addressing? Alan Mack, head of emergency services. I'm not actually that high up in the planetary government, but the rest of the directors are off planet and unavailable, so I'm in charge. Understood, Mr. Mack. What of the void ship that attacked you? Left about 20 minutes ago and took all its monsters with it. All the ones that survived, at least. Still can't figure out what they wanted. We're a vacation resort, for heaven's sake. Even with the information Marcus had provided, Dracor wasn't certain why the Void would attack this place either. I don't know how much help we can be. This is a warship, and we came to destroy the Void's vessel. Some of my crew can assist with rescue and first aid. We would also be most grateful if you would allow us to investigate the site of the attack. You are perfectly welcome to look around. There are plenty of damaged buildings we haven't even had a chance to search yet. If you could check for survivors while you're investigating, that would be a great help. Very well. Our shuttles will be descending shortly. Dracor made a motion with his hand and the transmission ended. Prepare medical personnel and supplies. I want a diagnostic team as well as a security team. 
I'll be descending myself to survey the situation. Now that he was in the thick of it, Dracor found he could, if not forget, at least push his fears for Lysen to the back of his mind and concentrate on the matter at hand. Trusting his crew to see to the ship, he turned in a swirl of white robes and strode off the bridge. Passing quickly through steel corridors, nodding as he passed by members of the crew, Dracor soon reached the shuttle bay. Four sleek, polished silver-armored transports sat on their landing gear along one wall. Facing them was a row of ten fighters. Happily, it appeared that the fighters would not be needed on this mission. He had ordered soldiers into battle many times, but remained uncomfortable with the responsibility. He still remembered his father's words when he assumed his first command. Never forget, son, when losing one of your people no longer causes you pain. It's time to step aside. No one's death should be easy, especially one of our precious people whose lives are already cut so mercilessly short. Those words were engraved on Drekor's heart. His one regret was that he had no son of his own to pass them on to. The security team arrived first, running up and bowing, their silver masks blank and their armor perfectly polished, the scanner team, four of the finest technicians Drekor had ever met, arrived soon after and they boarded the first shuttle. The medical team was busy loading the second shuttle and would launch as soon as they were ready. Eager to get started, Drekor ordered his shuttle to launch at once. The flight down didn't take long and, based on Marcus's report, he figured their best bet for information would be the spaceport where a number of the monsters Dracor hated that primitive term, but until they had a more precise designation for the creatures it would have to do, had been destroyed. They landed at the very same hangar Marcus had used and quickly disembarked. The security team took a defensive formation around the site while the scanner team went over to a blackened, slightly melted spot on the tarmac. All their scans ran through their masks, so there was no obvious sign of what they were doing. Dracor left them to their work, and went over to a second spot. According to the report, these things had survived a glancing hit from a ship's cannons and healed. Everything he understood about biology said that was impossible. But he also had great faith in Marcus. If he said it happened that way, then it did. The scanners in Dracor's mask took multiple rapid measurements, and the built-in computer did calculations in an instant. There was nothing to indicate nanomachines were ever present, there were tiny specks of biological residue, as well as something else he couldn't identify. Hopefully the scanner team would have better luck. First counselor, a voice said through the comm unit in his mask. The med team has landed and begun their work. Preliminary scans show no signs of infection in the corpses. It doesn't appear that nanomachines are involved. We've seen no indication of them either but remind them to stay alert and make sure to overlook nothing. Remember who we're dealing with. Understood, sir. We'll keep you informed should the situation change. A faint click signaled the end of the conversation. Drekor went to another blackened spot, not because he thought he'd find anything, but just for something to do. His scans came back with essentially identical results. What are you up to now, Sarkin? Only silence answered him. Chapter 9 Having dropped Vlad and Tommy off on Mars, Marcus now drifted halfway between Saturn and Jupiter, while Margaret tried to make contact with Dragon HQ. Judging from the blank screen, she wasn't having any better luck this time. Three days had passed since her first attempt, and now he, and judging by her frown, Margaret, were getting concerned. Not that Marcus actually cared what happened to a criminal organization. Well, not this criminal organization, anyway. But what did worry him was Margaret's fate. He'd gotten to like her over their brief time together, especially the vulnerability she showed once she was out of her comfort zone. It was sweet and worrying all at the same time. Not that he was stupid enough to take her change of personality at face value, for someone in her line of work, manipulating men to get what she wanted was second nature. It was equally possible that her act was just a way to convince him to help her in her time of need. And that was fine. 
He would have helped her anyway, since the dragon seemed knee-deep in this mess, and he needed to investigate them anyway. Having her as a guide to the organization made his job that much easier. So he decided to trust that her emotions were honest until he had proof to the contrary. I've run a full diagnostic on our systems as well as the hypernet connection, Solomon said. Margaret had agreed to let him stay in the cockpit during her potential conversation as well. Based on my readings, it seems like there's no receiver on the other end of the link. That's not possible, Margaret said. The Dragons are a massive organization with hundreds of people working at headquarters. Someone has to be there minding the comms. Solomon shrugged. I'm only telling you what the system says. I know, I know. It's just that I'm frustrated. I hate not knowing what's going on. Then why don't we find out, Marcus said. What are the coordinates for the Dragon's base? She blew out a sigh. I guess it really is our only choice. Solomon typed in the location and frowned. Is this correct? What is it? Marcus asked. The Sopra system is the home of the largest intergalactic banking conglomerate in the galaxy. Why would the dragons choose somewhere so prominent for their base? I probably shouldn't tell you this, Margaret said. But the Sky Dragon Clan controls intergalactic trust. Not openly, but behind the scenes. They make all the major decisions. That explains it, Solomon said. I've plotted an arrival point well away from Sopra Prime. Okay, time to take a look. Marcus activated the hyperdrive, and they were on their way. As soon as they emerged from hyperspace, Marcus activated the ship's cloaking device. Sopra Prime was the only inhabited planet in the system, but given the wealth and power concentrated there, only an idiot wouldn't have some sort of planetary defense system. Or at least an early warning system. On the screen, Sopra Prime appeared, a planet with a reddish tinge to the land masses and a greenish tinge to the water. Of greater interest were the handful of huge satellites in orbit around the planet and connected to the surface via orbital lifts. Marcus tried to imagine how much they cost and failed. It didn't seem possible they were cheaper than shuttles, and if an enemy attacked, they'd be an obvious target. But whatever, sorting out the weaknesses of a banker's planet wasn't his job, and thank the universe for that. Where is the Dragon's base? Station 5, Margaret said. I think it's on the opposite side of the planet. Confirmed, Solomon said. They all have transponders broadcasting their designation. Five is on the opposite side. Marcus shrugged and powered up the engines. Hardly unusual that the thing they wanted wasn't conveniently located. Try the comms again. Maybe we'll get lucky. Keeping his distance, Marcus plotted a roundabout course to the opposite side of the planet. As far as he knew, there was no rush, and he didn't want to make a careless mistake that might end with them getting blasted. No dice on the comms, Solomon said. It's like the designated frequency doesn't exist. I could call the moon and get more of a response. I wasn't optimistic anyway. Coming up on the target now. They rounded the planet, and Solomon focused their scanners on Satellite 5. As far as Marcus could tell, it looked exactly the same as all the other satellites. There was a central column with cylinder-shaped protrusions that he assumed were different rooms. The whole thing was about half the size of the Council asteroid and could probably house a couple hundred people comfortably. Solomon? Scanners indicate no life forms on board. External defense systems are deactivated and shields are down. As far as I can tell, the whole thing is abandoned. Margaret was muttering to herself from the auxiliary chair behind Solomon. Anything you'd like to share? Marcus asked. No, this is just so strange. The clans would never abandon this place. They've spent too much time and money securing it. Can we access the airlock? Marcus asked. Yes. Solomon tapped something and a ring appeared around one of the protrusions. But why do you want to explore an empty satellite? Marcus maneuvered the star over to the airlock. Because if they left in a hurry, there might be something useful on the station's computer. This whole situation's giving me a creepy crawly feeling. I hate not knowing what's going on. We never know what's going on, Solomon said. And I always hate it. A faint thud indicated that the airlocks had synced up. I'll take a data slate, and you can do your thing from here. Excellent plan. 
It'll also be a good chance to test the upgraded remote access system I installed. I'm coming with you, Margaret said. I need to see it with my own eyes. Marcus nodded and got to his feet. He was glad she offered. Margaret might see something he'd miss. He led the way out of the cockpit, grabbing a data slate from storage on his way, along with his command gauntlet. His next stop was the weapons locker. Empty or not, he'd feel better having a couple Vensar blasters at his waist. When the cylinder had spun open, Marcus offered, If you have a preferred weapon, help yourself. This is an impressive collection. I didn't realize your work required such an arsenal. It doesn't, usually. This is more of a better safe than sorry collection. Marcus settled his favorite two-gun rig on his waist. He debated armoring up, but decided against it. His power armor was too clumsy for this sort of thing. Margaret ended up taking only a small blaster pistol, and she hesitated about even that. For someone so high up in a criminal organization, she seemed overly reluctant when it came to weapons and violence. Then again, not everyone could be like him and Tommy. With the weapons locker sealed back up, Marcus led the way to the airlock. He opened their side, and they crossed to the stations. Before he opened the door, he plugged the data slate into an external jack. Internal air quality assessment. The slate beeped, and a few seconds later, a green light lit up. Looks like we're good. We're heading in, Solomon. Roger. Good luck. Marcus would take all he could get. He turned the heavy wheel and pushed the door open. The airlock entered into a foyer that wouldn't be out of place in the finest mansion. A thick, red carpet covered the floor, and the walls had been paneled in exotic hardwoods. Only the dead guy lying face down just inside the door surrounded by a dried blood stain spoiled the effect. Not the most promising start? Marcus towed the body over and grimaced. Something had gutted him from his belly to his throat. His face, however, had been untouched. He was an Asian man a little younger than Marcus. Margaret let out a groan and pressed her hand to her mouth. He knew just how she felt, but had to ask. Do you recognize him? No, I've only been here once. He looks like domestic help, probably a butler. I'll know the clan heads when I see them, but that's about it. He nodded but said nothing as he stepped over the body and made his way to the door that led deeper into the station. The silence was uncanny, and the high-pitched squeal of the door seemed especially loud when Marcus pulled it open. The room beyond was a horror show. Mutilated bodies lay everywhere. Many were missing limbs or heads, and all of them had been torn open like the butler out front. Marcus didn't even begin to know how to figure out how many people had been killed. He ended up settling on counting heads. Oh my God, Margaret whispered behind him. Stay back there. I'll try and make some order out of this chaos, then you can quickly check and see if you recognize anyone. No. Her voice wavered, then grew stronger. No, I can't ask you to do that. I'll look as we go. That'll be faster, and you won't have to touch the bodies as much. I can do this. I promise. Marcus had his doubts, but wouldn't insult her by voicing them. Instead, he held out his free hand, and Margaret took it in a death grip. Marcus, have you found anything? Solomon asked. Just a lot of bodies. Anything happening outside? No, as far as I can tell, either no one is aware of our presence, an impossibility once we docked and deactivated our cloaking device, or they just don't care, which is more likely given who owns this satellite. In any case, no one is on their way to investigate, so you could take your time. Great. Let me know if that changes. Marcus and Margaret set about their gruesome work, which ended with her confirming that none of the bodies belonged to the clan heads. If he was being honest, Marcus wasn't sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing. With the dragons destroyed or leaderless, Vlad's life would be much easier. On the other hand, an even worse group might easily slip into the vacuum created by the dragon's destruction. That used to be the Grand Ballroom, Margaret said as they got ready to leave the slaughterhouse behind. I remember visiting once when they were having a party. I forget why, and thinking it looked like a scene from a fairy tale. I may well have nightmares about this for the rest of my life. I hope not. But even if you do, even the worst memories fade in time. 
You're a tough woman, and I have no doubt you'll come out of this okay. Her laugh was short and bitter. You're far more confident than I am. Come on, let's get this over with. They fell silent and quickly went from room to room, finding more bodies in the kitchen and servants' quarters. The second floor ended up being much like the first. Blaster burns on the wall made it clear that security had tried to fight back. The mangled corpse next to a burned-out blaster made it equally clear that they failed. Do you think it was more of those things that attacked us? Margaret asked. She still looked a little green around the gills, but her breathing and voice had steadied. Considering what was done to them, that seems a reasonable theory. The wounds certainly look like they were made with claws rather than some other sort of blade. There's one level left. I assume that's where we'll find the command center. If we're going to find more information, it'll be there. They took the stairs to the next floor. There was a lift, but Marcus didn't trust it under these circumstances. The top floor was a single huge room filled with computer stations. Keeping with the theme, more bodies littered the floor. Some were dressed in one-piece uniforms and others, oddly, in tuxedos. A quick count confirmed that there were eight dressed for a party. There are nine clans, right? Marcus asked. She nodded. He went over to the first tuxedo wearer and poked him over on his back. That's Donjo, the clan head of the Crimson Dragons, Margaret said. It didn't take long to confirm that all the clan heads were here save the leader of the Jade Dragons. Didn't take a genius to figure out what happened. The Jade Dragons sold their brethren out to the Void. What Marcus couldn't figure out was why the Void would want to help a bunch of gangsters. What did they get out of it? You can head back to the ship if you want, Marcus said. I'm just going to find somewhere to plug the slate in and download whatever data is left. No, please, if you don't mind, I'd like to stay with you. Marcus nodded and went to the nearest station. It had an appropriate jack, so he plugged in. It's all yours, Solomon. Roger, accessing main computer now. Did you find what you were looking for? More or less, the clan heads are all dead. Torn apart, we assume, by the same monsters that attacked the club. That's not exactly a huge loss for the galaxy, is it? It certainly isn't, though I'm sure the servants didn't deserve what they got. Let me know when you have everything. Will do, Solomon disconnected. Marcus turned to Margaret. Are you okay? Not really, though I am better than I thought I'd be. My life just completely changed, didn't it? Yep. For the better if you wanted to. You're free of any obligation to the dragons. You can go wherever you want and do whatever you want. She smiled a sad little smile and leaned against one of the consoles. I find that exciting and terrifying in roughly equal measure. Freedom is like that. Will you be all right if I ask you a few questions? About what? The Jade Dragons. They must have something the Void wants. I need to figure out what that might be. I know they were into drugs and prostitutes. That's what they were fighting Vlad over. Was there anything else? I really don't know. I was only involved in the business that happened on Pleasure Planet 4. No one gave me briefings about the larger business. Marcus nodded, disappointed but not surprised. Sorry, I can't be more help. Don't be. We can only do what we can do. I'm done, Marcus, Solomon said. There's quite a bit of data. Is there anything you want me to prioritize? Anything to do with the Jade Dragons? Marcus unplugged the slate. What do you say we get out of here? Margaret pushed away from the console. That might be the best idea I've ever heard. Chapter 10 Dracor's warship remained in orbit around Pleasure Planet 4. He had returned, but his teams were busy helping with rescue and recovery on the surface, though by now the odds of finding more survivors didn't bear consideration. Much as he wanted to advance the mission and move on the void, they had no leads yet. The technicians were studying various samples collected at the spaceport, but no final results were in. At least the most recent report from Holm confirmed that Lysen's condition hadn't deteriorated any further. The doctors were surprised by the course of her disease. The deaths of millions of Vensar had been studied over the centuries, and they could generally predict within a week when someone would die based on various physiological changes. 
Lysen was missing every milestone, hitting some early and others late. The working theory was that the nanomachine infestation that had weakened her enough to let the disease advance had also changed her body enough to alter its course. The doctors were optimistic that even should the disease reach its inevitable conclusion, which it certainly would, they would glean enough information to potentially extend the lives of others, possibly by years. It was a momentous breakthrough, the greatest in nearly two hundred years. Dracor should be happy. He would be happy, if only the breakthrough wasn't coming at the expense of Lysen's life, that his beloved cousin would be the first to say that should her death be in some way able to help her people, it was worth it. Well, that did nothing to make him feel better. First counselor, the voice came through his personal calm. Go ahead. If you have a moment, sir, we've completed our analysis of the various residues collected at the spaceport. Can you come to the lab? There's something interesting you should see. Since he had absolutely nothing else to do at the moment but brood, he said, I'll be there momentarily. Dracor switched from his personal calm to the speaker in his mask and got up out of his command chair. I'll be in the lab should you need me. Yes, sir, Combs acknowledged for the bridge crew. He made the short walk to the lift at the rear of the bridge and pressed the button for the lab. The trip was silent and so smooth you'd barely know you were moving. A few seconds after he entered, the door opened again, revealing the shiny steel and glass lab. Computers and technical devices, some of which even Dracor didn't know how to use, covered every surface. Eight masked Vensar were busy at various stations. Four of them were gathered around a single table as they stared intently at something hidden from his view. What did you want to show me? he asked. The four at the table turned his way when he spoke. Come and see, one of them said. We've discovered what we believe is an entirely new substance. It matches nothing in any of our records. Dracor frowned as he strode across the white-tiled room. The Vensar's records were the most extensive in the galaxy. It boggled the mind to think that anything existed that they had yet to encounter. The scientists made a gap for him so he could see the many times magnified image in the screen. There wasn't actually much to see, only a smooth black dot that looked like tar. This was what got them so excited? Someone pressed a button, and a tiny arc of electricity shot into the dot. It lashed out with a pseudopod and seemed to absorb the energy. It reacts the same way to any energy applied to it. We also can't seem to damage it no matter what we try. Is it alive? Sentient? Dracor asked, a bit excited now. Not in any way we understand the terms. It reacts to stimuli but otherwise appears inert. If it has a purpose, we have yet to figure out what. Another mystery, fascinating as it might be, wasn't what they needed just now. What about the monsters? One of the scientists waved over a colleague from a different station. The woman joined them and offered a polite bow. Make your report, please. We managed to extract a fragment of DNA from the impact site. Aside from its reptilian nature, we gained no other details. The fragment also matches nothing in the specimen database. While we have not explored the entire galaxy, it seems impossible that our enemies have found something we missed. Don't underestimate the void. That's a good way to end up dead. If your analysis turns up anything else, contact me at once. Our work here is nearly concluded, and I would like to have some idea about our next move when the medical teams return. The scientists offered polite bows, and Dracor took his leave. What was Sarkin up to now? The brilliant maniac was capable of anything, but the creation of a substance beyond the understanding of Vensar technology seemed like a stretch even for him. But as he told the female scientist, you underestimated the void at your peril. Marcus hated waiting. After disconnecting from the dragon's headquarters, he piloted the ship out of the Sopra system without so much as a peep from the planet. The whole situation was beyond strange. Now they were stuck in the middle of nowhere while Solomon finished his analysis of the data Marcus brought back. That was a task Marcus wanted no part of, 
so he and Margaret were killing time by playing cards in the galley. She was every bit as good a card player as he'd feared. On the plus side, the mundane activity seemed to calm her after the madness they'd just dealt with. At least, they weren't playing for money, mostly because Margaret didn't have any. Any thoughts on what she might do next? Marcus asked as she dealt out the next hand. Margaret shook her head. No, serving the dragons has been my life since I was a girl. The idea of doing something else is foreign to me. I'm sure you'll figure it out after a while. Maybe Vlad would give you a job. He has a number of establishments where your talents would fit right in. I doubt he'd want an ex-dragon working for him, and it would be weird for me as well. Marcus frowned, distracted by a sudden thought. Maybe Vlad would have an idea what the Jade Dragons were up to. With the recent fighting, he would have ordered all his spies to be keeping watch on them. Is something wrong? Margaret was looking at him, her forehead crinkled with worry. No, sorry. My mind wandered for a moment. I... The intercom beeped and Solomon said, I finished analyzing the data you brought back. There's nothing on the Jade Dragons. Nothing useful? Marcus asked. No, nothing at all. Looks like someone wiped everything about the clan from the hard drive. It's weird. Why delete only that data instead of everything? I can't figure it out. Trying to figure out crazy people will only stress you out. I'm going to call Vlad and see if he knows anything. Thanks for trying, pal. If you want to come back and play cards with Margaret, I'm sure she'd be happy to beat you. I'll take you up on that, Solomon said. My eyes are starting to sting. Marcus stood. Solomon will be right back. I'm not some delicate flower that needs watching over. She made a shooing motion toward the door. Go do what you have to. Marcus took his leave. He didn't mean to hover, but after all she'd been through, he felt like Margaret needed a bit of looking after. Having your entire world turned upside down couldn't be good for your psyche. He met Solomon halfway to the cockpit. His friend's eyes were even more bloodshot than usual. That was never a good sign. Do you think Vlad will have learned something in the short time we've been gone? Solomon asked. Unless that, then now I might be able to ask him the right questions. He also needs to know about the clan's leadership getting wiped out. This is going to change everything in the underworld, and change can be dangerous. And profitable. Marcus nodded. Potentially. He squeezed past Solomon and entered the cockpit. Vlad's private number was already in the system. A quick check to make sure it wasn't the middle of the night on Mars, and he pressed connect. It took a few seconds to connect, then most of a minute for Vlad to answer. When he did, Marcus couldn't help smiling. His eyes were clear, and it looked like he'd gotten a solid night's sleep. The deep worry lines had also smoothed a bit. I didn't expect to hear from you again so soon, my boy. Did the meeting with the dragons go smoothly for the young lady? They didn't give her a hard time, but that was because they were all dead. Well, all of them save the leader of the jade dragons. Are you certain it was them? Vlad asked. Margaret identified them, and unless she was lying to me, a possibility, though one whose purpose I can't begin to imagine, we're pretty sure it was them. Our working theory is that the jade dragons sold their brothers out to the void. The main problem, well, one of them, is a lack of motive. The clans have stuck together no matter what for centuries. I also can't imagine what a bunch of gangsters might have to offer a group of techno-terrorists. Well, I appreciate the update. I'm not sure how I can help you. I'm not either, but we've hit a dead end. Literally. Anything you can tell me about where the fighting was the worst or what the dragons seemed most interested in might be the thing that breaks this wide open. There was nothing particularly unusual other than their surprising disinterest in negotiations. It would have been much less expensive in terms of money and lives. Yeah, but then they wouldn't have had an excuse for a meeting with you personally on an unsecured planet. And the other clan heads wouldn't have been nearly as worked up. My money is on this thing being a setup from the get-go. Vlad's worry lines had all returned. Marcus regretted that. I hadn't given it that much thought. Figured they were just being bloody-minded. The old man scrubbed a hand across his face. There was nothing remarkable about our fight. It was mostly over whores and drugs, the same as always. 
Marcus wanted to pull his hair out. He was missing something. He knew it. Okay, let's come at this from a different direction. Was there any territory you didn't fight about? We didn't fight over Mars. There was no point. They had no hope of getting a foothold here. There were a couple of minor planets they controlled that didn't interest us, so we made no move against them. Marcus snapped his fingers. It might be something, or it might be nothing. Either way, we'll check them out. Can you send me the coordinates? Of course. Do be careful, my boy. There was a time when I thought your new job was safer than working for me. After our most recent adventure, I'm now less certain. You thought that even after the Void invaded Earth space? Perhaps I just believed what I wanted to believe. Best of luck, Marcus. I'll take all I can get. Later, old man. The screen went blank, and a few seconds later, coordinates for two planets appeared. Marcus logged them both in. They had another move to make. Time to see if it led anywhere. Chapter 11 Kulinov Prime had little to recommend it. The star's long-range scanner showed almost nothing in the way of technology and a great deal in the way of vegetation. It was another jungle world, and the less said about Marcus's luck with them, the better. At least there were no void warships in orbit around the planet. Cloaking device or not, he would have been hesitant to get any closer had one of them been present. Of course, a void ship would have confirmed his suspicions, and he could have just called in the boss. Best to let the Vensar handle that sort of problem. They were better equipped for it. I didn't even know the Jade Dragons controlled a planet like this, Margaret said from the auxiliary station behind him. What would be the point? There are no customers. My evidence-free guess, Marcus said. Someone probably found a plant or something that yielded a drug they could sell elsewhere. I just hope we find a clue here. The first planet Vlad mentioned was a bust. I kind of hope we don't, Margaret said. I'm ready for the craziness to end. Marcus looked back at her. If there's somewhere you'd like us to drop you off, it's no problem. I appreciate that. But the truth is, crazy as things have been, I think I feel safer with you than I would anywhere else. If that's true, then you have my most sincere condolences. She smiled at that, just as he hoped she would. I found something, Solomon said. Not sure what it is, but there's definitely a large man-made structure on the main continent. I detect no weapons or shields, and the energy output is currently low. Sounds like someone idled the place. Send the location to my heads-up display. We'll go take a look. Solomon sighed. I knew you were going to say that. I hate jungle planets. Marcus throttled up and followed a line that appeared on his display. The ship rattled a bit when they passed through the atmosphere, but nothing reacted to their presence. The ground was hidden beneath the dense canopy, and he felt like he was having a flashback from their arrival on Alpha 114 all those months ago. Hopefully nothing here decided to start worshipping him. As they got closer to the target, he eased the throttle back to just under the speed of sound. Directly ahead, a huge steel and stone structure loomed. Smokestacks thrust into the sky. Heavy glass windows allowed natural light to enter, and an oddly medieval-looking stone wall surrounded the entire compound. No people or machines were visible. A concrete square in the center of the courtyard was marked with an X with a capital L in the center. Is it me, or does anyone else think this all looks a bit weird? Margaret asked. It's not you, Marcus said. This place looks like someone took an old-fashioned castle and crossed it with a factory from four centuries ago, then jammed the whole thing in the middle of the Jurassic Age. Are you picking up any traps? How about a power source? Negative on traps. As for a power source, sensors indicate a fusion reactor deep underground. Current output suggests you were right about the facility being idle. Marcus blew out a breath. No sense putting it off any longer. He landed on the pad and waited. A minute passed and nothing shot at them. So far, so good. I'm going to armor up and take a look, Marcus stood. You two stay here. Keep everything buttoned up tight and the scanner's on full. Anything happens, let me know. To his great relief, no one argued. Not that he expected Solomon to, but Margaret seemed oddly attached to him. 
That might be a problem once things settled down. Marcus couldn't imagine Aika would be thrilled with the idea of the beautiful Aetherian joining his crew, and Margaret seemed uninterested in going anywhere else. But that was a problem for later. He left the bridge and made his way to the hold. He hadn't worn his armor in combat since he rescued Willie and Lysen from the giant void ship. That was by no means a bad thing, since it meant that he hadn't walked into a situation that he knew would put his life in danger. He suspected that was about to change. Something about the creepy factory put his instincts on edge. Marcus punched in his code and the stored cylinder rotated, revealing his shiny black power armor. Taking a deep breath, he said, Black Dragon, armor up. The suit's defense systems deactivated and Marcus stepped forward to let it wrap around his body. Seals engaged and servo motors whirred to life. With a final beep, the heads-up display shimmered into view and he stepped back out of the cylinder. Solomon, do you read? Loud and clear, comms are working perfectly, as is the computer interface. If you need any hacking done, I can do it directly through your suit. Perfect, wish me luck. Marcus lowered the boarding ramp and stomped down to the concrete. His suit's environmental controls kept the interior comfortable, but his sensors indicated that the temperature was 120 degrees and 90% humidity. That was actually worse than Alpha, which was saying something. Putting the weather out of his mind, Marcus turned toward the building. It had a single ground-level door visible, one of those big ones that a freight hauler would fit through. It wasn't far enough to bother flying, so he just walked over, grabbed the handle, and lifted. The door resisted for a moment, then the lock snapped and it flew up out of his way. That lock was the first sign of security Marcus had seen. Even if the planet was in the ass end of the sector, he'd expected more. With a shrug, he strode into a huge warehouse space. A huge, empty warehouse space. Whatever they made here, the dragons took it with them when they left. Computer, scan all surfaces for residue. The computer beeped in acknowledgement and got to work as he walked slowly deeper into the building. Three doors led to other areas of the complex. The right-hand door appeared to lead to the largest part, so he made his way toward it. Scan complete, the computer said. Off to one side of his vision, a list of chemicals ran down his display. He couldn't read it now. Solomon, did you get a copy of the analysis? Yes. Let me guess, you want me to look it over? Right in one. I'm moving deeper into the main building. So far, this place appears abandoned. Don't jinx it. Marcus smiled to himself. Let me know if there's anything interesting. Will do. He opened the door, and before he could take a step heard something skittering in the distance. Local wildlife? Or something else? Nothing was visible in the squares of light cast by the many windows, though the bright light served to make the shadows seem darker. Adjust photoreceptors to even out brightness. The computer obliged, muting some of the glare. Far from perfect, but certainly an improvement. A short, bare hall led to another large open space, this one was filled with equipment and a rail system for moving products from one end to the other. Heavy drop cloths covered the equipment and dust sparkled in the light. Whatever they were making, it took a lot of processes to complete. Marcus, I finished analyzing the list. Looks like they were processing some sort of drug. The computer gave me a number of possibilities, but Margaret says the most likely is a neural stimulant. The dragons have been selling something similar for a while, and it's very popular. Thanks, Solomon. So he'd found a shut-down drug lab, hardly earth-shattering news. There were, no doubt, many thousands of them all over the galaxy. The squeaky, scratching noise came again, and this time Marcus caught a glimpse of something moving at the edge of his vision. He spun, vortex cannons charged and ready, and found nothing to shoot. Someone was messing with him, and when he got a hold of whoever it was, they'd regret the decision. Computer, track the source of that sound. An arrow in his heads-up display pointed toward the rear of the space. Marcus stomped over and found a trap door that led to the basement. Hmm, I'm being led on a merry chase, aren't I? At the very least, the fact that whatever was teasing him had brains enough to use doors and run away meant it wasn't an animal. Marcus lifted the trapdoor, 
and found nothing save pitch darkness. He activated the light in the armor's chest, revealing a ladder that descended into the earth. I've done stupider things than this, he muttered as he activated the suit's anti-gravity generator and drifted into the darkness. His feet clunked on the steel floor. A metal-lined hall ran as far as his light reached. There was no sign of whatever had lured him down here. Comms check. I'm moving to the basement, Solomon. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. No interference so far. He hadn't expected any issues given the relatively shallow depth, but better safe than sorry. Marcus clanked down the hall, intentionally making more noise than necessary. He was hoping not to scare whoever was down here with him. Some explanations would be nice, and there seemed to be no one else around to offer them. The hall ended in what could only be described as a lab. Ten tanks filled with black fluid lined the central path, and at the end, barely visible, was a bank of computers and other equipment. He was trying in vain to figure out what they all did when overhead lights burst to life. His suit instantly adjusted, saving his eyes in the process. Marcus raised his hands, ready for a fight. Instead of a lizard monster, the most pitiful-looking creature he'd ever seen stepped out from behind one of the tanks. It looked like a human in that it had two arms, two legs, and a head. But that's where the similarities ended. His, the person's gender, was impossible to determine, but Marcus was going with his until he knew otherwise. Features were all out of place. It looked like he was made of wax and someone had heated his face and rearranged things. His nose was too low, his eyes didn't line up, and his ears were too far back. At least a rough, filthy coverall hid the rest of his body. Marcus had no desire to see what else had been moved around. Have you come to save us? The melted man asked. Despite what had been done to him, his voice was clear and easy to understand pitiful, desperate tone aside. I didn't even know you were here, Marcus said, but if I can help in some way, I will. You said we? The melted man tapped the glass of the nearest tank. The liquid swirled, and an even more deformed face pressed itself against the glass, just long enough for Marcus to make out an eye and an ear that weren't even close to being in the right place. Then it was gone. What happened to you? Marcus asked. We're failures, useless, unsuitable, discards. The melted man let out a shriek that would haunt Marcus's soul for the rest of his life. His fingers dug into his face and moved the flesh around a little more. Marcus shuddered. It seemed he'd rearranged his own features. Somehow that was so much worse. Who said you were failures? The masked men. We started out as workers, slaves of the dragons. It was bad, but not so bad. The melted man had a faraway look on his face as he remembered. His thoughts seemed a bit clearer as well. We processed the drugs. Machines were too slow and not accurate enough. We were fed and allowed to rest occasionally. Then the masked men came. The machines were shut down and this place built. They brought us here and stuck us in the vats. I'm not sure what happened after that, but when I came back to myself, everyone was gone and I looked like this. All I can remember from that time are voices saying we were failures, useless, unsuitable, discards. How did you escape the vat? Marcus asked. Climbed out. There are no lids. The others tried, but went back right away. The air kills them, but not me. Don't know why. Can you help us? He badly wanted to say yes, but didn't dare make a promise he couldn't keep. I don't know, but I will try. And if I can't, then I know some people that might be able to. I need to take a look at the computer, is that okay? The melted man shrugged as if he couldn't have cared less. 
Marcus walked down the aisle between the vats. Every once in a while, he saw a swirl of movement out of the corner of his eye. Whenever he did, he tried not to look too closely. The things, no, the people in those vats gave him chills. He knew the void were monsters. His encounter with their failed experiments made that clear. But this seemed different, worse, though he couldn't say why. It didn't take long to find the proper Jack and Marcus plugged in. Solomon, do you have access? Yes, downloading all data now. I've been listening through your microphone. Looks like this is a void lab of some sort. Will you be calling Dracor? As soon as you're done, he's my top priority. Figuring this mess out is beyond my capabilities. And thank goodness for that, he didn't add. It took about 15 minutes, but at last Solomon said, I'm done. Do you want me to patch Dracor into your suit? No, I'm coming up. This place gives me the creeps, and the sooner I'm out, the better. Marcus switched his external microphone back on. I'm going back to my ship to call for help. You can come with me if you'd like. The surface is secure. The melted man shook his head. The light burns. Down here is better. Okay. Marcus turned to leave, paused, and turned back. I didn't catch your name. He stared at Marcus as if he'd just been asked to give a dissertation on quantum physics. If I had a name, I can no longer recall it. The dragons called me 477. The masked men called me nothing at all. That was the most pathetic thing Marcus had heard in a long time. Right. I'll be back when help arrives. Do you need anything? The melted man shook his head, and a piece of his left ear fell off. If he noticed, it didn't bother him. We will wait for you to return. Marcus retreated as quickly as politeness would allow. Nothing troubled him on his way back to the star. As soon as he reached the hold, he pulled his helmet off and gasped for air. He'd hated the void before this, soulless fucking monsters that they were. But now he hated them even more. An impressive accomplishment. Returning his armor to charge, Marcus wiped the sweat off his face and headed for the cockpit. He needed to contact the boss, and the sooner, the better. Chapter 12 A full day had passed with no new reports from the science team. Dracor was getting impatient even though he knew it would do no good. His last communication with Holm confirmed that Lysen's condition remained stable. Near the top of the long list of things he didn't want was his beloved cousin to die while wondering why he wasn't with her. In hopes of distracting himself, Drecor reached for the monitor sitting on the desk in his ready room. He didn't expect Pleasure Planet 4 to magically reveal some dazzling secret, but the beautiful planet was a lovely sight, and at this point he'd take anything he could get. Before he could turn it on, his calm beeped. Sir, communication for you. It's Captain Drake. Drekor grinned and immediately shook his head. The human was a bad influence on him, or so Lysen always said. For his part, Drekor considered Marcus a good influence. Vinsar generally tended to take themselves too seriously. How could anyone take themselves too seriously with the irascible human calling him boss and acting like they were drinking buddies? at least when no one was around. Put him through to my ready room. The monitor came to life and Marcus's face filled it. Sweat plastered his hair to his head and his eyes held a shadowed look. Clearly, whatever he had to say wouldn't be good. Marcus, I'm pleased to hear from you. You might not feel that way after I give my report. We tracked down one of the Jade Dragon's drug processing plants, it had been recommissioned by the Void into some kind of biolab. There are a bunch of vats filled with black liquid in the basement. There are people in them, and they've been changed. They can't survive outside the vats, and their flesh has the consistency of wax. Let me correct myself. One of them can survive. I spoke to him. He was a slave of the dragons before the Void showed up and did whatever they did. They're a sad-looking lot, boss, and I can't do a damn thing for them. Drekor's mind raced. The black liquid Marcus mentioned had to be related to whatever his texts found here. 
He simply didn't believe such a large coincidence was possible. Send me your coordinates. I don't know if we can do anything for those poor souls you found, but we'll make every effort. Never doubted it for a second. Solomon's looking through some data we scrounged from the lab's computer, though I don't have high hopes. The Void are too clever to leave something obvious behind. True, but they might be arrogant enough to leave something subtle behind. Look carefully. You know Solomon, he's got his fine-tooth comb out. See you when you get here. Marcus's face vanished and star coordinates took its place. Dracor did a rough calculation in his head. They weren't that far away. His people were already back on board. If they left at once, a standard day should see them at Marcus's location. Dracor couldn't shake the feeling that time wasn't on their side. Since they had some time to kill before Dracor arrived this morning, Marcus sent a drone up to take a look around the area. He didn't expect to find anything, but it would make the time go by faster while saving him from getting crushed by Margaret at cards. She was currently taking a nap in the guest cabin. Apparently she wasn't sleeping well at the moment. Imagine that. Solomon was busy sifting through the data they'd collected. So far, he'd found some images of what Marcus called void scientists, basically humanoids in black robes wearing the shiny masks they were so fond of. There were videos of some of their experiments as well, but he wanted nothing to do with those. Let the boss and his people study them and deal with the nightmares. The drone flew out of the hold and hovered above the factory. There was nothing interesting on the roof, so he guided it out over the jungle. The controls were slaved to the star's steering yoke, making it easy for him to pilot. The jungle's canopy filled the screen. Through the occasional gap, he spotted trails carved through the undergrowth, probably made by the dragons to allow for easier collection of whatever they used to create the drug they'd been producing. A little ways further, he came to a clearing filled with mounds of fairly fresh dirt. Though they weren't marked, it didn't take a genius to recognize a graveyard. Marcus didn't bother counting them. At a glance, he knew it had to be over a hundred. With a little snarl, he moved on. An hour passed, and he saw nothing more interesting than a flock of brightly colored birds that flew by the drone. As he suspected, the search was a waste of time. Got the bastard! Solomon shouted out of nowhere. Marcus left the drone on hover and turned to his friend. Want to elaborate? I found a video from an external camera of a ship that landed here. And who should come out of it but an Asian man dressed in a fine suit and guarded by a quartet of thugs? They met one of the void scientists, then went inside. What do you want to bet that was the clan chief? We can get Margaret to confirm it when she wakes up. Did you get enough detail to ID the ship? I got a high-resolution scan of the front and one side. Should be plenty to identify it. With the Council's resources, I bet we could track him down in a day or two. I'll mention it to Dracor when he gets here. Good work, Solomon. I saw some things on the other videos. Tried to fast-forward through them, but even then it was bad. How can people do things like that? Marcus shook his head. I don't know what to tell you. There are plenty of evil people out there. The universe knows we've met enough of them in this job. The best advice I can offer is to try not to dwell on it. Easier said than done, I know. Why don't you take a break? Thanks, but I'm almost done. Might as well see it through. Solomon handed him a data crystal. That's the scan of the dragon's ship as well as a full copy of the original data. Marcus pocketed it just as the proximity alarm sounded. He switched from the drone feed to the external cameras in time to watch a silver Vensar shuttle touch down beside the star. He issued the automatic recall to the drone and stood. Boss is here. You coming? Solomon shook his head without comment, his gaze focused on his monitor. Marcus swallowed a sigh and left the cockpit. When he reached the hold, he glanced at the armor-stored cylinder before dismissing the impulse. A few minutes of heat wouldn't kill him. At the bottom of the ramp, he turned toward the shuttle. Five Vinsar in white robes emerged, followed by another five in silver combat armor. The boss wasn't taking security lightly. That was good. Not that Marcus expected trouble at this point. 
Dracor separated himself from his companions and headed over to Marcus. There was nothing different about his appearance, but Dracor had a way of moving that Marcus had come to recognize. Same with Lysen, only she was way stiffer. Speaking of which, Marcus hadn't seen her since their get-together on Mars. No doubt the boss had her out running more errands. How in the world did you ever find this place? Dracor asked. It's nearly as remote as Alpha 114. Pure chance. Vlad mentioned a couple places he and the dragons didn't fight over, and I figured it would be worth taking a look. It wasn't like we had any other leads. Marcus held out the crystal. This is everything Solomon could extract from the computer. There's a high-res image of the dragon's ship. Given the council's pool, I thought you might be able to get a line on it. Drekor took the crystal. I'll have my people get right on it. Now let's see the lab and your unfortunate victim. Does he have a name? Not that he remembers. The poor guy's brain is seriously messed up. I've started thinking of him as the melted man, but that's rather unkind. Accurate, but unkind. They set out for the lab with Marcus and one of the security guys in the lead. His second trip through the factory was no more pleasant than his first, and the oppressive heat did nothing to improve the trip. At least the shade made it a fraction cooler, though the humidity made up for it. The lights were still on in the basement when they arrived. The melted man was standing in the middle of the path, just as he was when Marcus first arrived. He took one look at the Vensar, hissed, and bared his teeth. It's all right, Marcus moved in front of the security guy who had begun to charge his weapons. These are my friends. They aren't with the other masked men. These are their enemies. In fact, they've been fighting each other for a long time. They want to try and help, is that okay? I recognize your voice, the melted man relaxed a fraction. They look different, but also the same. Marcus nodded and took another step closer. I know. The ones that did this to you, they dress the way they do to mock my friends. The black masks are an insult. They are evil, the melted man said, his messed up face managing to look solemn. They are, Marcus agreed. Would you like to meet a friend of mine? He's the leader of this group and a good man. You can trust him to do right by you and your fellows. The melted man nodded. Even if you betray us, death will be a kindness. I think we can offer you better kindness than that. Marcus looked back at Dracor and motioned him closer. When the Vensar leader had moved up beside him, Marcus said, This is Dracor. He's one of the best people I know. The melted man looked at Dracor, his head cocked as if he was trying to get his eyes to line up properly. Can you help us? Marcus had never heard such a pitiful-sounding question. I don't know, Drekor said, but we will try. With your permission, I would like to have my people examine you and your fellows, as well as the liquid in the vats. They are the foremost experts in the galaxy. If anyone can figure out what was done to you and how to fix it. They can. The melted man blew out a long, painful sigh. Thank you. Do what you must. The techs hurried forward while the soldiers continued to keep watch over the entire procedure. All Marcus felt was relief that someone that actually knew what they were doing had arrived to take over. He had a knack for helping people, but stuff like this was way over his head. Drekor motioned him over by the computer, out of the technician's way. Despite your report, I hadn't expected something this bad. I really don't know if we'll be able to do anything for these people. I do my best, boss, and so do you. No one can ask you for more than that. Marcus shot a glance back at the melted man. He said death would be a kindness. If you can't help them, I hope you will grant them peace. For my part, I want to find Void Walker, shove a blaster right up his ass, and pull the trigger. Your crude human descriptions certainly get right to the point. While I might have phrased it differently, I fully agree with the sentiment. 
and Drecor looked back at the busy technicians. Something about the way he held himself struck Marcus as off. Everything okay, boss? No, I suppose I should tell you. Lysen has returned to Vensar Prime. Her time is getting close. Marcus took a moment to absorb that. While he wasn't exactly close with the stiff Vinsar officer, he did like her, and you couldn't face what they had on the void ship and not form some kind of bond. I thought she had a couple years at least. All our medical and historical records indicated that she did. But the nanomachine infestation did something to her. It weakened her body enough to allow the disease to accelerate. But it also did something else. Our doctors aren't sure exactly what yet. That is altering the course of the disease in strange and unexpected ways. No one knows what it all means, but something is changing. For the better, we hope. I don't really get it, but I have one question. Is she going to die? We all die, Marcus. You know what I mean. Yes, the disease is going to kill her. Exactly when, we don't know, but far sooner than she naturally would. Son of a bitch. I understand how you feel. Sometimes my own anger overwhelms me as well. But in the end, for all our technology and knowledge, we are not gods. Some things are beyond our ability to fix. This is one of them. Marcus was never much for accepting outcomes he didn't like. Are you practicing what you preach? Drekor sighed, a very non vinsar thing to do. I am trying. With, I admit, mixed results. She is my closest living relative. The thought of losing her pains me a great deal. Our way is to love and mourn all equally. But I can't do it. Losing Lysen affects me more than the death of a stranger would. If I admitted that to one of my fellows, I would face opprobrium. Oddly, I feel I can be honest with you. Of course you can, boss. Marcus clapped him on the shoulder. That's what friends are for. And don't give up on Lysen. That girl's tough. She won't go down without a fight. Drekor actually laughed. Well, a faint chuckle slipped out anyway. I should go home and tell her you called her a girl. That might give her strength enough to crawl out of bed just to yell at you. I have no doubt given how many times she's criticized me. Sir, do you have a moment? One of the Vensar texts said. Marcus followed Drakor over to the nearest vat. The person inside sloshed around, and every once in a while he caught a glimpse of pale skin or a misplaced bit of anatomy. What did you find? Drakor asked. The contents of the vat are a perfect match for the substance we found at the spaceport. We still have no idea what it is, but it is the same. And the victims? Drakor asked. The silver mask turned away. I fear the effects are permanent, or at a minimum beyond our ability to reverse. As best we can tell, only the gentlemen that spoke with us can even survive outside the vats. Are they in pain? Marcus asked. I don't know. His inability to find a solution seemed to be causing the tech physical discomfort. Then we'll ask. Marcus walked over to the melted man and crouched to look him in the eye. My friends don't think they can repair what was done to all of you. If you wish to stay here and live out your days, I can bring supplies. If you want to end it, I can do that too. You won't feel a thing. There is no hope for us? The melted man asked. Hope's funny. There may be none today, but who knows what tomorrow might bring. As long as you're alive, there's a chance. It might not be a good chance, and if you're in pain, it might not be worth waiting for. I can't answer any of those questions for you, but I can promise to respect your decision. The melted man took a few steps forward and placed his hand on the nearest vat. I can't speak for them, but I want to live. I want to hope. 
a strong choice. What do you like to eat? Marcus asked. I haven't eaten anything since I climbed out of my vat. I don't get hungry or thirsty. I don't sleep either. The days are long and tedious, but painless. Is there anything I can get you to make your time more pleasant? Marcus asked. I used to make things. I would like to do so again. Marcus chewed the inside of his lip as he thought how he might grant that wish. There were a few things in the star he might be able to take apart and put back together, but that wasn't really the same as making things. I believe I can help, Trekor said. It would be simple to reactivate the factory. You could make medicine instead of drugs. Yes, the melted man sounded like someone that had been offered the greatest thing in the universe. Please. Marcus gave the man a gentle pat on the shoulder and rejoined Drakor. Can you really trust him to make medicine? I'll leave some texts behind to study this facility. They'll make sure he doesn't get into trouble. You were very gentle with him. He deserves it after what was done here. I can't do much for these poor people, but I can offer a little kindness. At the end of the day, we all need that. Drekor cocked his head. Marcus knew that pose. He was listening to something in his mask. Hopefully it was good news. The universe knew they needed some. The ship you identified has just been located. Then let's go get the son of a bitch and beat Voidwalker's location out of him. Unfortunately, he is in orbit above a planet that isn't a member of the council. We have no authority there. If the clan chief is to be extradited, it will have to be done stealthily. Stealthily is my middle name. Give me the coordinates, and I'll leave at once. Chapter 13 The system where Dracor said the Jade Dragon's clan head was seen didn't even have an official name, just a number on the galactic star chart. The solitary, inhabited planet had the charming name of Sarth. It was a green mud ball and according to the data packet Dracor had provided, was home primarily to poisonous reptiles, bloodthirsty insects, and a particularly nasty, meat-eating fish that made Earth's piranha look like a guppy. The only sentients to call the place home were from off-world. Every manner of criminal lowlife could be found hanging around Sarth's lonesome spaceport. It was built on an artificial island in the middle of a massive inland sea, that offered it natural protection from the planet's many nasty predators. They also had a particular fondness for throwing card cheats into the water to be eaten by the fish. It was the sort of place Marcus might have visited for Vlad back in the day. At the moment, Marcus had the ship in stealth mode and hovering in orbit around Sarth's moon. He hadn't decided exactly how he wanted to approach this. There was no planetary security or defense systems. Air traffic control appeared equally non-existent. As usual in places like this, it was a free-for-all. How did Drakor say he got this information? Solomon asked. He didn't. My guess is the council has an agent on planet keeping an eye on things. You really don't want a cesspool like this to stay anonymous. How else could he get word of the clan head's arrival? Marcus frowned and looked back at Margaret. Does this piece of shit have a name? Yes. Soma Toju. He has some unpleasant habits, but I'll spare you the details. Can't say I'm surprised by that. No offense, but it's probably best if you stay on the ship. Someone might recognize you. But you need me to identify Soma. Indeed I do. Luckily Solomon can rig up a camera. You just have to tell me when you see him. She didn't argue any further, which he appreciated. In fact, Marcus suspected she didn't really even want to argue. No one in their right mind would want to visit this place if they could avoid it. Only his desire to see this piece-of-shit gangster pay for what he helped do to those unfortunate people gave Marcus the motivation to hunt him down. We've done all we can from here, Marcus said. The main thing I was worried about was finding a void ship in orbit. Thank the universe for small favors. They seem to be busy elsewhere. Deactivate the cloak and we'll head in. Just like that, Margaret asked. You're just going to land like you have every right to be there. Yup. In a place like this, boldness and confidence can take you a long ways. Show weakness and you're screwed. 
With the cloaking device switched off, Marcus flew closer to Sarth. It didn't get any prettier up close, and he suspected that as soon as he stepped out of the ship, the smell was going to be even worse. A slight vibration signaled their entry into the atmosphere, and then they were skimming the treetops at just under the speed of sound. They'd arrived about a hundred miles from the spaceport. While he wasn't trying to be sneaky, Marcus also didn't want to dive-bomb the place and get every eye on him. Nice and subtle was the name of the game. Getting the clan head tied up and off-planet, on the other hand, would be another thing, one he'd deal with when he had a better grasp of the situation. There it is, Solomon said. The spaceport wasn't just a spaceport. It was also a fair-sized settlement. Scores of buildings constructed from the remains of starships dotted a mile-long artificial island. Most of the ships were parked at the north end of the island. Marcus counted fifteen, mostly shuttles and light freighters. The star wouldn't look at all out of place among them. No sign of the dragon's ship, Solomon said. Marcus continued his flyover. A few people glanced up at them but quickly looked away. Marcus paid the locals no attention. As long as they didn't get shot at, nothing else interested him. Two-thirds of the way to the southern tip of the island, they flew over a huge compound, built out of sturdy-looking steel and blaster-proof glass and surrounded by a wall with a massive gate built into it. A line of people were waiting to enter. Target confirmed, Solomon said, dragging Marcus's attention back where it belonged. An inset window showed the dragon's ship resting on its landing gear in the compound. Armed guards stood on either side of the lowered boarding ramp. Marcus banked right, out over the lake. He hadn't gone far when a cloud of flying fish came boiling up out of the water in front of him, only to splatter against the shield. Loosing a string of curses, he pulled up, away from the cloud. A hundred feet above the surface, the air was fish-free. What the hell was that about? Solomon asked. Marcus shrugged. Weird as it was, the fish hadn't heard anything but themselves. Who cares? I'm more interested in whatever's going on at that compound. Having to break the clan head out of a fortress is certainly going to up the difficulty level. Staying well away from the water, Marcus brought them straight down into an empty spot in the landing field. He left all systems powered up. Damned if he was going to lower his guard around here. Once he'd completed the landing, Solomon handed him an earbud and a tiny camera. Marcus tucked the camera inside his shirt so only the lens was sticking out beside his collar. He stood so the others could look him over. Anything obvious showing? You look good, Margaret said. Thanks. So is anything obvious showing? His weak attempt at a joke got him a smile, but no laugh. Well, humor was probably a poor idea under the circumstances anyway. Audio and video connections are strong, Solomon said. Good luck. Thanks, I'll take all I can get. Marcus turned and headed for the door. Margaret followed him for some reason. As they walked down the narrow hall, he asked, Something on your mind? No, I just wanted to see you off. I feel like I've been nothing but dead weight since you got me off Pleasure Planet 4. Isn't there something useful I can do? Not at the moment. And forget about that dead weight nonsense. Having you along isn't a bother. You're quiet, don't eat that much, and do wonders to pretty up the place. I've had far worse guests on my ship. You're very kind. I've known many men in my life, women too, for that matter, and none of them have treated me as well as you have while asking for nothing in return. If only you didn't have a girlfriend. She blew out a long sigh. I'll miss traveling with you when the current crisis is over. Eager to change the subject, Marcus said, You know, with your experience running a large organization, I'll bet I could talk Dracor into giving you a job with the council. We could see each other regularly then, and you'd be safe from anyone that might blame you for what happened. But Ayaka, see each other as friends, Marcus hastened to add. I am allowed to have friends, female or otherwise and would be glad to count you among them. Just friends, she muttered. Better than nothing, and I haven't got that many friends as it is. You'll have to introduce me to some of them. Marcus paused to collect his command gauntlet from its storage bin and strapped it on. He'd be adding some heavier-duty weapons before he left, but the gauntlet was always a good starting point. When I say I don't have many friends, 
I mean I don't have any. My family is dead, and my co-workers see me as a boss, the face of the clan heads whose job is to enforce their will and mete out punishments to those that angered them. I was not well loved. That's a shame. The door to the hold slid open as they approached and Marcus went straight to the weapon storage cylinder. But I suspect once you find yourself in a better environment, you'll have a ton of friends. Most of them male, I'm sure. She snorted a laugh as he strapped on his two-blaster rig. There's one thing I'm certain about, and that's that men looking to get me in bed make awful friends. How well we get along is one of the things I'm torn about. He closed the cylinder, turned, and squeezed her shoulder. Don't be torn. I like you, but I love Aieka. It's not a competition, and I value my relationship with both of you for different reasons. Margaret stood on her tiptoes and kissed his cheek. I'm not sure I deserve a friend like you. Don't think that way. You're not the only one that's done some bad stuff. Put it behind you and focus on doing the right thing going forward. That's all any of us can do. I've got to go. As soon as you see Soma, let me know. I will, and thank you. She turned and hurried back toward the cockpit. Smiling to himself, Marcus adjusted his pistols to a more comfortable position. Who'd have thought being a therapist might one day be part of his job? He pressed the button that lowered the cargo ramp, and, just as he expected, the fetid stink of rot immediately rushed inside along with blast furnace heat. If this job took too long, he was liable to melt. At the bottom of the ramp, a pair of locals, humans as far as he could tell, were staring up at the ship. They both carried blaster rifles over their shoulders, but showed no sign of aggression. Instead, they were grinning like idiots. Want to let me in on the joke, fellas? Marcus asked. Turn around and take a look at your ship and you'll get it, said the older of the two, assuming the gray hair was any indication. With a sick feeling in his stomach, Marcus slowly turned to find his ship covered with partially exploded fish parts. The locals burst into laughter. When they got themselves under control, the older man said, For some reason, those damn fish go nuts when you fly too low over the water. Then they have a bad reaction to shield energy and explode. Never seen a critter just like them on any world I ever visited. They're a nasty part of life, just like everything else on Sarth. I'm guessing this is your first visit. You guess correctly. I'll be sure to take more care when I leave. The older man nodded. Been a lot of new folks coming in since those big shots showed up and built the damn fortress in the middle of town. This used to be a nice, quiet place for a man to lie low for a while. We're getting too damn much attention now. If he wanted to talk, Marcus wasn't about to pass up free intel. I noticed that building when I arrived. Popular spot. Yup, and no wonder. They're offering half a pound of gold for any giant lizard you bring in alive. Gotta be big, though. Over five feet long. Marcus had a sick feeling he knew what they were doing with the lizards. Sounds like good money. Maybe I'll give it a shot. I mean, how hard could it be to stun a lizard and toss it in a cage? The older man chuckled. It sounds easy, doesn't it? Thing is, lots of critters out there would be happy to make a meal out of you, and they're tough enough that a blaster doesn't do much to discourage them. Only the hunters that have been on planet for a few years and know their way around have a chance, and even some of them don't come back. An off-worlder like you wouldn't last an hour. No offense. None taken. In fact, I appreciate the warning. If you don't mind my asking, what do you two do? Funny you should ask. We're guides, the older man flashed a smile filled with yellow teeth. Zeke and I were born on Sarth. We know the jungles and swamps better than anyone. You want to try your hand at lizard hunting, our fee is half of whatever you bring in. Marcus nodded. He doubted they knew anything else important, but out of curiosity, he asked, why not just hunt the lizard yourself? We don't have the right equipment for bringing back live lizards, and we can't afford to buy it. It's easier to just show rich off-worlders the way around. Gotcha. If I decide to go hunting, I'll be in touch. Marcus retreated back up the loading ramp. He had an idea that would hopefully save him from getting killed trying to capture the clan head, assuming Solomon had a tracking device sturdy enough to survive getting eaten by a lizard.
He closed the ramp behind him just to make sure no one got the bright idea to follow along and headed for the cockpit. As soon as the door slid open, Solomon looked back at him. That was fast. You heard what those two guides said? When Solomon nodded, he said, What do you want to bet those lizards are destined to be turned into more of the monsters we fought? Sounds like a safe bet. That means the dragon's ship will be headed to wherever Voidwalker is. If we plant a tracker on it, we can follow it home. That'll be way safer than trying to get the clan head out of that fortress. Solomon shook his head. There's no way they'll miss a tracking device placed on their hull. True. That's why I want to feed one to a lizard. Give it a delayed activation timer so it won't put a signal out until they arrive at their destination. That could work. One of my little beacons would slide right down without the lizard even noticing. How are you going to get one of the lizards to eat it? Margaret asked. That's the best part. I'm not. You are. Me? Her eyes nearly popped out of her head. Yup. You walk up to one of those hunters, a fish in your hand, cooing over the cute lizard. What man is going to stop you from feeding it? You're the perfect one for this job. I know I said I wanted to do something to help, but this isn't what I had in mind. What about your worry that someone might recognize me? That was when I thought I was going to have to sneak into the fortress. The line extends a good fifty yards out from it. No way will the guards see you. She frowned, but nodded, looking determined. Okay, I'll do my best. Marcus had full faith that her best would be more than good enough. Chapter 14 Marcus couldn't say exactly what Margaret did in her room while Solomon was preparing the homing beacon, but when she joined him in the hold, she had the sexy turned up to eleven. It must have been all attitude, because the short skirt and halter top were the same ones she'd been wearing since their escape. All signs of the uncertain survivor were gone, and in her place was the confident madam. Wow, you can really turn it on when you want to. Lucky Solomon retreated to the cockpit or he might have fainted. Thanks. I have to admit that it's somewhat depressing how easily the mask slips back into place. It's so natural I wonder if this is who I'm meant to be. No one's meant to be anything in particular. You are who you choose to be. Now, let's go feed a lizard and get off this mud ball. She took his left hand and they marched down the ramp. What are we going to feed it anyway? At the bottom of the ramp, he paused and collected a reasonably intact fish that had fallen off the hull. The homing beacon was about the size of a marble, and he stuffed it easily into the fish's body cavity. Marcus held up the fish for her inspection. Here you go. One lizard snack. She grimaced. This just keeps getting worse. You hang on to it until we get closer. Marcus grinned. Sure. They set out away from the landing zone and deeper into the village, or whatever this settlement was considered. Calling it a scrapyard would be an insult to Willie's place, but it seemed the most accurate term for the modified collection of starship hulls that now served as shops, homes, workshops, and whatever else the locals needed. Where do you suppose they get more building material when they need a new house? Margaret asked. Given the place's reputation, I suspect they kill someone and use their ship while hoping they don't have friends that'll come for payback. Marcus flicked a glance at a group of men eyeing Margaret and gave his pistol a tap. They glared back for a second, then looked away. Making friends? she asked. Hardly. Trying to be sure the locals know causing us trouble will end badly for them. Better for all sides if they believe that. Marcus kept a close eye on everyone as they moved steadily closer to the dragon's fortress. No one paid him the least attention, as every eye was glued to Margaret. She didn't seem phased in the least. No doubt long years of practice made putting up with the hungry looks easier. Given the adorable crinkle of her nose, the smell was bothering her more. He fully sympathized as he did his best to take shallow breaths through his mouth, up ahead, a hiss and crash indicated that they were getting close to the nearest lizard. Thank the universe for that. The sooner they were back on the star, the better. We're getting close. Marcus held out the fish. Make sure to toss it through the bars. Wouldn't want you to lose a finger. She snatched the fish out of his hand. That's not funny. He wished he'd been joking. 
Having seen the size of the lizards, one snap of their jaws might cost you a whole hand rather than just a finger. They turned a corner, and just ahead on an anti-gravity sled was a heavy-duty cage holding a pebbly-skinned lizard. Two heavily armed human males, dressed in body armor that had to be abysmally hot in this climate, stood on either side of it. Isn't it cute? Margaret said as she pulled away and hurried closer. The nearer man shifted to block her. He didn't point his rifle or anything, just put his body between her and the cage. Best keep your distance, miss. That's one ugly brute. You try and pet it, you're apt to end up with a stump where your arm was. She pouted adorably, lower lip stuck out. Oh. When I told her about the lizards, she insisted that she wanted to feed one, Marcus said. I warned her it wasn't a good idea, but you know women. Would it be all right if she just tossed the fish to it? We'd really appreciate it. Margaret leaned forward, giving the hunter a closer look at her considerable cleavage. We really would. His gaze locked on Margaret's chest. The hunter sighed and said, Guess it couldn't hurt nothing. Go ahead, just don't put your hand between the bars. Margaret flashed her elongated eye teeth as she smiled. Thank you so much. I've always liked scaly things, ever since I was a little girl and had a pet snake. As Margaret inched closer, looking every bit the excited lizard fan, the hunter motioned Marcus off to the side a little. If you're planning on going hunting, don't take her along. I lost two men on my last trip. That jungle's no place for a lady. I appreciate the advice. Don't worry. We only stopped to pick up supplies and see the lizards after I told her about them. We'll be gone before sunset. Smart, but this is a hell of a place to stop for supplies. Tell me about it. If we weren't completely out of food, I'd have kept on flying. Margaret let out a squeal and hurried back to him. It swallowed that whole fish in one bite. That's a big lizard and a small fish. Marcus looked at the hunter. I appreciate you indulging her. She might well be the only pretty thing on this whole miserable planet. It was worth it just to look at her. I hear that. Good luck with your hunting. Marcus waved and led Margaret back toward the ship. When they'd turned the corner out of sight, he continued, you played your part perfectly. Playing parts is one of the things I was expected to do. The dim-witted pretty girlfriend was always popular when I regularly entertained clients. Margaret cocked her head and favored him with the most vapid, empty expression he'd ever seen. Why do men like women like that? He laughed and shrugged. Hell if I know. My girlfriend is a biologist with more education than she knows what to do with. When she gets going on technical stuff, I'm lucky to follow a quarter of it. My best guess is that some men don't like feeling dumber than their girlfriends, even if they're only a couple for one night. It doesn't bother you? Nah, it helps that I ache and never rubs it in. Plus, I can always change the subject to starships and leave her stumped. I think she gets more annoyed than I do. Halfway back to the ship, they found their path blocked by four familiar men. It was the thugs Marcus had glared at earlier. It seemed they were still looking for trouble. Stay behind me. Marcus put his hands on the grips of his blasters. Can I help you, fellas? The tallest, broadest shouldered of the bunch took a step forward. He had his arms crossed over his massive chest and well away from his own weapons. Marcus might not be the fastest draw in the galaxy, but that seemed a bit overconfident. Me and the boys got thinking. We decided we didn't much care for your disrespectful attitude earlier. We were just admiring the lady, after all. We decided you needed to apologize, and then she could make it up to us. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Why don't you run along before someone gets hurt? The big man smiled and tapped his chest armor. This is the finest shield-generating armor out there. Those toy pistols of yours have no hope of scratching us. You, on the other hand, appear completely unprotected. That explained his overconfidence. This won't go the way you think. We're leaving Sarth right now. There's no need for us to fight. His smile turned ugly. That's where you're wrong. If we let you get away with insulting us, we'd look weak. And that would bring challenges we don't want. Your death will confirm our strength and we can sell the Ethereum for more than any stinking lizard. No walking away now. Marcus's pistols flashed out of their holsters and he fired four quick blasts. His bolts went right through the thugs' shields like they weren't even there. All four men dropped before they could touch their weapons. 
Marcus led Margaret around the bodies. As he passed, the leader reached out to grab his leg. Looked like Marcus's shot had missed his vitals by a fraction. Ow. Our shields. He breathed out those last two words and went limp. Marcus shook his head at the waist. All around the scene, others had gathered, but none made any move to bother them. Marcus had dealt with people like this for most of his life. They'd seen he was skilled and willing to do what it took to survive. That meant they weren't easy marks, which was what such people preferred. When they'd left the chaos behind, Margaret asked, How did you get through their shield so easily? Shield penetrating blasters, the latest models. I've never heard of such things. I'm not surprised. My employer likes to make sure I have the best equipment. These beauties have saved my life more than once. Still, I hate having to kill people. Even assholes that deserve it. They reached the ship, and Marcus used his gauntlet to lower the boarding ramp. So what happens now? Margaret asked. Now we wait and see where your former boss leads us. With any luck, it'll be to the source of the lizard monsters. Destroying that before they can make an army of the ugly things would be a boon to the galaxy. What if they've already made an army? Then we'll find out just how good my blasters are. Soma hated everything about Sarth. The stinking, humid, miserable swamp of a planet had many vices and few virtues. Unfortunately for him, the virtue it had in abundance was large lizards. Somehow, during his endless experiments, Voidwalker had discovered that reptiles were the best candidates for the transformation process. Soma neither understood how it all worked, nor cared to. All he wanted was to collect as many of the wretched things as the katana could hold and get out of here. He shuddered to think how much time it would take to get the stink out of his beloved ship. Not that Soma would have anything to do with the cleaning. That's what robots and lackeys were for. Standing out of sight, his remaining hand resting on the hull of his ship, Soma watched as Tio oversaw the purchasing of caged lizards. The locals always came out in droves whenever Soma showed up. He appreciated that as it sped the process up considerably. Just thinking about having to secure the beasts themselves gave Soma hives. He strode over to Tio, who had just finished paying off a hunter. How are we doing? Good. The boys say it looks like there are more lizards than there is space in the ship. What do you want to do with the extras? Find space for them. The more we bring back, the longer it will be before we need to come back to this toilet. In fact, if I never have to see it again, that would suit me fine. You could always stay in the city, Tio said. Me and the boys can handle this on our own. Soma shuddered at the thought of being alone in the ancient city with Voidwalker. He was pretty sure the two of them would be the only sentient, living beings in the place, maybe on the whole planet. No. Whenever the katana left, Soma would be on it. The less time spent around Voidwalker, the better as far as he was concerned. What did he say about Valcor? Dio asked. Not nearly enough to satisfy me. When we get back with this load, Voidwalker promised to tell me more about how we'll deal with the old man. I look forward to hearing it, but refuse to get my hopes up. Tio nodded, then motioned the next hunter forward. Before the grubby human could take a step, Blaster fire echoed through the air. Soma crouched and raised his handless arm. A disruptor barrel extended from the stump. What was that? Soma asked. Probably a local squabble. Tio looked completely calm, damn him. You know how they are here. No discipline. Constantly killing each other for no particular reason. Sounded like it was well away from here. Soma forced himself to relax and straightened. With a thought, the barrel slid back into his arm, out of sight. I'm going to work in my cabin. Wrap this up as quickly as you can. Tio offered a polite bow. Of course, sir. Was there a hint of mockery in his voice? No, Soma refused to think that way. Tio was his most trusted lieutenant. The man had proven his loyalty for many years. Voidwalker was the problem. The cult leader was making him second-guess everything. Soma needed to get his head on straight, or the last of the dragon clans would end up as dead as the rest. Chapter 15 Drakor took several deep breaths to calm his racing heart. He couldn't be sure the coordinates Marcus had given him were in the Forbidden Zone. 
Maybe they were just close. That would be bad enough. He input the numbers and ran a search. The answer came back an instant later. It was in the zone. Huge, oversized letters said, Do not enter. He touched his fingers to his mask and blew out a breath. The Forbidden Zone was a well-known bit of Vinsar history. He'd been taught as a child that no one ever went there. The reasons were as vague as they were ominous. Their ancestors had decreed it taboo. It was as if some primitive fear had seized them. That Sarkin had chosen to break that taboo didn't surprise him in the least. In fact, if Dracor had really been thinking, he would have considered the Forbidden Zone a perfect potential hideout for the Void. But no good Vensar ever thought about it. It was as if, once they were taught about the Zone, something was done to block their thoughts from going there. He shook his head. What should he tell Marcus? A story from his childhood would only get a laugh, followed by an incredulous stare. He could hear it now. You really want me to let them go because of a ghost story, boss? I thought the Vinsar were all about science and logic. And he wouldn't be wrong to say that. Drekor racked his brain. He was never this indecisive. He needed advice, and there was one person he felt confident could give it to him. Punching in a private comm number, he connected to an old friend back on Vinsar Prime. Lokar had attended school with him, and after graduation went into the history department. If anyone could tell him about the Forbidden Zone, his old friend could. It took most of five minutes for someone to answer, but at last Lokar appeared on the screen. This is a surprise, my old friend. I thought you'd be too busy with whatever emergency summoned you from home to call me. I have been busy, but the emergency has touched upon a sensitive matter, and I need your input. Can you spare a few minutes? I always have time for a friend, though how a history teacher can be of help I can't imagine. One of my agents has a location for a Children of the Void base. It may even be Sarkin's primary headquarters though that is pure speculation on my part. The problem is the location is in the Forbidden Zone. Lokar's gasp of surprise mirrored Dracor's own when he heard the news. You confirmed the coordinates? Never mind, of course you did. What do you want to know? All the knowledge we have about the zone is millennia old. What I mostly need to know is whether or not going there is actually dangerous or if there is something we need to avoid, or really any details at all that you can share with me. I can't simply refuse to deal with a serious threat because of an old story. I wish I could give you a definitive answer. All the ancient texts say is that a darkness lurks there, a darkness so deep and profound that it could destroy all of reality. On its face, that is a ridiculous thing to claim but our ancestors believed it strongly enough that no Vensar has traveled to that area in three thousand years. Until Sarken. If he is there and he found whatever our ancestors feared, then I have no choice but to make sure, and, if necessary, stop him. That's a huge risk, Dracor. If you're wrong and you break the taboo, there may be consequences. And if I do nothing and Sarken emerges from the Forbidden Zone with a new weapon that makes the disease look like a rash, what will the consequences be then? Better to risk the derision of my people than their lives. Still, I take your warning to heart. I won't move in until my scouts confirm that the Void are present. If they find nothing, then no harm is done." Lokar shook his head, sending reflections dancing across his mask. I do not envy you the choices you must make, my friend. Problems like this are why I'm glad I stayed in school. I've told you all I can. Now all I have to offer is my best wishes, whatever you decide. Your best wishes are much appreciated. Dracor hesitated, then asked, Have you been to see Lysen? This morning... She's stable but unconscious. No change, according to the doctors. They appear genuinely flummoxed by the course of her disease. I'm uncertain if that should reassure me or worry me. Perhaps it should do both. Goodbye, Lokar.
and thank you for your help. The screen went blank and Drakor sighed. Was it right to send Marcus into a place that even the Ventsar feared to go? It didn't feel right, but in the end, there was no one else. A few taps on his keypad connected him to the rogue star. Boss, what I'm about to tell you is a great secret among the Ventsar. Before he could think better of it, Drekor laid it all out. I have no idea what danger you might be flying into, but we need to know what's going on. This isn't a mission I can order you to undertake. You don't need to, boss. We started this job, and we'll see it through. No offense to your traditions, but I'm more worried about void warships than boogeymen. Be careful and keep in touch. Good luck, Marcus. Thanks, boss. Marcus disconnected, leaving Dracor alone in his silent ready room. Had he done the right thing? Only time would tell. Chapter 16 Soma hurried down the ship's ramp and took a deep breath of crisp, slightly salty air. Though they were hundreds of miles from the coast, there was so much water on this planet that you could smell the ocean from anywhere. It was one of the few things he liked about the out-of-the-way world. The jump from Sarth had been among the more miserable experiences of Soma's life. They'd ended up taking on so many lizards that the ship's air filtration system couldn't fully compensate, and the smell even got into his private cabin. The fresh air was a blessed relief. He hurried to put as much distance between himself and the katana as possible. That, unfortunately, put him much closer than he cared to be to Voidwalker's workshop, a huge stone building that looked from the outside like a primitive temple. Though having seen far too much of the labs for his liking, he hated to think what sort of god might call such a temple home. You made excellent time. Soma nearly leapt out of his skin when Voidwalker spoke from right beside him. The man, or Vinsar, or whatever he really was, made no more sound than the wind and had some sort of stealth cloak that rendered him invisible at will. Yes, I was eager to get back with your specimens and hear more about the plan to kill Valkor. You must have been in a considerable rush if you failed to detect the homing beacon someone planted on your ship. Voidwalker's tone remained as even as always, but Soma imagined that it held a hint of anger. That's not possible. We charged the hull, the same as we always do. There's no way a homing device survived that. How did you even know about it? One of the ships detected a microburst transmission from your ship moments after you arrived in orbit. There wasn't much data attached, but enough for navigational coordinates. Your incompetence has given away our location. I am very disappointed, Soma. Soma shook his head and muttered, It's not possible. We did everything right. Shall we find out? Voidwalker asked. Before Soma could reply, Void Walker walked right up the ramp into the katana's hold. Four of Soma's men were getting ready to begin unloading the lizards, but they took one look at the dark figure and promptly found something else to do. Soma always knew he had the smartest crew in the dragons, and they were proving it once again. What are we looking for? Soma asked. When I find it, I'll show you. Void Walker's tone made it clear that he had no desire for further conversation. Soma buttoned his lip and followed along. Voidwalker looked at lizard after lizard until finally stopping in front of one of the last ones they brought aboard. The lizard hissed when Voidwalker crouched for a closer look. Here we are. Voidwalker's hand shot between the bars of the cage and pierced through the lizard's side. The beast roared and thrashed as Voidwalker dug through its guts. A moment later, he pulled his hand back. A tiny round object sat on his open palm. Someone fed the damn lizard a homing beacon. Indeed. Voidwalker closed his fist, crushing the beacon. Energy crackled, burning away the blood and viscera until his glove was as clean as when he arrived. It seems we have at least one clever enemy. Pity that. I hate clever enemies the most. But no matter... The conflict was bound to come eventually. Perhaps it's best to have it over with now. At least they won't take us by surprise. Are you still curious about Valcor? Come along, and I'll show you what I have planned. 
The abrupt change of topic took Soma by surprise, but he wasn't about to complain. I'd like that, sir. Thank you. Voidwalker turned on his heel and led the way toward the temple. Soma glanced back and saw his men peeking out from the door that led to the main area of the ship. He gestured for them to get back to work and hurried to catch up. Your men are surprisingly lacking in courage given their line of work, Voidwalker said. Soma winced. Not generally. You make them nervous. No offense. Nothing you say could possibly offend me. The door to the temple, a modern, heavy-duty steel one, slid up into the ceiling at their approach. Weak lights sprang to life just beyond it, just enough to stop Soma from tripping on his own feet, but not enough to dispel the gloom. Did Voidwalker go out of his way to be creepy? How are you adjusting to the new eye? Soma nearly jumped out of his skin at the unexpected question. It still goes blurry every once in a while. Hmm, perhaps one of the optical connections is slightly out of place. I can check it when we're finished. Soma wanted few things less than Voidwalker anywhere near his brain. No need to trouble yourself. It's more of a nuisance than anything serious. The integrated weapon system works perfectly, though I do find the lack of a second hand a bit of a bother sometimes. The module includes a grasping attachment that's far stronger than a flesh-and-blood hand. That's the problem. I keep crushing things with it. Voidwalker stopped in front of a door that looked exactly like the half-dozen they'd already passed. You just need to practice more. Nothing good comes without effort. Soma swallowed a reply he'd never have the courage to voice. I'll keep that in mind. The door retracted into the ceiling, revealing a room filled with metal drums three feet tall and two feet in diameter. There were no markings or any other indication of what they held. This is the result of all our efforts so far, an especially lethal poison that will also raise anyone killed into a voidling berserker. Voidlings were what he called the lizard monsters. Why would Voidwalker want dead ones? I'm not sure I understand, sir. Wouldn't live ones be better? Live? All the voidlings are made from corpses. The toxin automates the process, killing anyone that encounters it and automatically transforming them. Unfortunately, I have yet to figure out how to control the newly created voidlings. The best I can do is cause them to go berserk, killing and destroying everything around them. I can see how that might be useful, Soma said, careful to keep his distaste from showing. How do you plan to use it to kill Valcor? Simple. You will take the toxin and deploy it in the dome where Valcor lives. It will kill everyone, including him. This will make a good large-scale test and eliminate your enemy. A win-win, wouldn't you say? Soma swallowed hard and nodded, not trusting himself to speak. There were easily a hundred thousand people living in each of the Martian domes. Soma had killed plenty of people over the years, but this was slaughter on a scale he couldn't imagine. And there was nothing he could do to stop it. It ended up taking three jumps from one safe point to the next to finally reach the edge of the target system. Traveling through uncharted space sucked. Marcus didn't know how the surveyors handled the stress. With each jump, he expected to emerge from hyperspace and find an asteroid field or something in his path. Luckily, that hadn't happened and now they were just within scanner range of a beautiful blue planet. The boss called this part of the galaxy the Forbidden Zone. Sounded ominous to Marcus, and from Dracor's tone, he took the danger seriously. Though if he'd believed the Vents are capable of practical jokes, this would have been a good one. Unfortunately, the two void warships in orbit around the planet made it clear this was no joke. How close can we get before those ships spot us? Cloaking device or not? Marcus asked. We snuck right past them on Earth, Solomon said. The problem will come when we try and enter the atmosphere. The aerial disturbance will be spotted at once. I also wouldn't want to try and send any transmissions from close by. That would almost certainly be detected as well. Okay, so we swing by, see what we can see, then bounce back to the edge of the system and contact the boss. Nothing to it. Don't say stuff like that, Marcus. Solomon gave a little shake of his head. Something bad always happens. Don't be such a worry, Wart. Besides, you're the one that said we could sneak right past them. That doesn't mean I'm excited about the prospect. 
Let's at least send Dracor a message before we head in and let him know that we've confirmed the Void's presence. Good idea. Send him all the astro-navigation data we have as well. That way he can jump right to the planet and hopefully take the bastards by surprise. While Solomon prepared the data packet, Marcus turned to look at Margaret. She'd been awfully quiet since they began their journey into uncharted space. You okay? Yeah, no problem. Just feeling a bit out of my depth. Marcus grinned. I feel like that all the time. The less you think about it, the better. You never seem out of your depth. I'm just good at faking confidence. Once you have that down, you're set. I figured you'd be good at it too. I used to be, but I seem to have lost my touch. Maybe if you wanted me to seduce someone rather than scout a heavily fortified military facility. Beautiful as you are, I fear your charms would be lost on void assassins and lizard monsters. They're not really my type either. The packet sent, Solomon said. If you're finished flirting, we could start any time. So now you're in a hurry. Marcus winked at Margaret and turned back to the controls. All systems in the green, cloaking device stable, and scanners at maximum. Okay, let's do this. Marcus shoved the throttle forward to full speed, and they shot out. Even at maximum thrust, it would take a couple hours to reach the target planet from the edge of the system. That was just an unfortunate reality when traveling at sublight speed. At 10,000 miles, he killed the main engines and began making minor corrections to their trajectory using the maneuvering jets. No reaction from the void ships, Solomon said. We're looking good. Another adjustment brought them between the orbiting ships. For the most part, all Marcus could see on the planet was water. A dark spot might have been a small island, but it came and went so fast he couldn't be sure. Hopefully, they weren't operating out of an underwater base. That would be a huge pain in the ass. Coming up on a large landmass, Solomon said. A moment later, it appeared on the monitor as a dark green patch in the middle of the ocean. Marcus tapped a button to zoom in. Of course it was another jungle. This one looked a bit more pleasant than the one on Sarth, and the environmental scanners indicated a generally lower temperature. Still warm, of course, but not painfully so. A just course left three degrees, Solomon said. I'm picking up man-made structures. Finally, this had to be it. Marcus nudged the yoke, and a moment later what looked like an ancient stone city appeared on the screen. There were columns, pyramids with flat tops, multi-story structures, all mostly intact. Plopped down right in front of the largest pyramid was the dragon's ship. It looked completely out of place amidst the ancient structures. Figures in dark suits were moving around near the open loading ramp. Marcus killed their momentum and zoomed in even closer. They were carrying metal cylinders into the ship. Solomon, can you get any details on what's in those cylinders? Solomon did some typing, then shook his head. They're shielded, but I can't imagine there's anything good inside. Me either. At the rate they're loading, there's no way the boss can get here before they're done. Please tell me you're not thinking what I think you're thinking, Solomon said. Whatever those are, we can't let them be taken off planet. The risks to the galaxy are too great. What about the risks to us? Solomon asked, his voice rising a notch. Those are pretty great too, but better to risk three lives than the universe only knows how many. Marcus glanced back at Margaret. I'm sorry, I know this isn't what you signed up for. You know, in my entire life, I don't think I've ever put myself at risk to help someone else. If we can make a difference here, I'm happy to do so now. Solomon groaned drawing a grin from Marcus. That's the spirit. Solomon, prep a message packet for Dracor. I'll attack as soon as you send it. You know they'll detect the message instantly, especially at this range. I know, that's why you're sending it first. Getting the message through is even more important than blasting the ship. Give me a three-second countdown. Solomon got to work, and Marcus took a deep breath to steady himself. He was only going to get one shot at this, and he had to make it count. The key was destroying at least one engine on the enemy ship. They'd never get off planet if he did that, at least not any time soon. As Solomon worked to compile the data, Margaret stood and moved closer. Marcus didn't have a chance to ask what she wanted before she kissed him full on the lips. When she finally pulled away, she said, If we die, I didn't want to have any regrets.
Data compiled and ready to send, Solomon said, sparing him the need to think of a response. Marcus gave a full body shiver. Everyone strap in. Countdown when you're ready. Three clicks sounded and Solomon began. Three, two, one. Solomon pressed the send button and Marcus jammed the throttle forward. Streaks of plasma from the enemy warships lanced through the space he'd just occupied. The star's cannons answered a moment later, stitching a line across the dragon's ship, slagging sections of the hull, and finally blowing the engine nearest them to bits. People were running everywhere as he accelerated away from the ancient city. He had barely cleared the edge of the city when a blast rattled the ship and lit up every alarm on his panel. Direct hit, Solomon said unnecessarily. Left engine is down, shields are down. Okay, Solomon, I get it. Marcus jerked the yoke hard right. A plasma blast grazed the ship, rattling them again. He needed to land before they were shot down. He spotted a thinner patch of jungle and, with no better options, dove toward it. It wasn't his best landing by a fair margin, but they hit the ground and didn't die, so he was content. Not that they had time to lollygag. Move! Marcus unclipped his belt, slapped the open button on his console, and leapt out of his chair. Go, go, go! He had Margaret on her feet in moments, and Solomon was right behind him. Marcus ran out of the cockpit, snatching his gauntlet out of the storage bin as he passed. They sprinted through the hold and toward the ramp. Gruesome, follow. They ran out the open ramp just as a blast shook the ground. He grabbed Margaret's hand to make sure she didn't fall behind and kept running. They managed 50 feet before a blast from above bullseyed the star and blew it to kingdom come. The heat from the explosion singed his back but did no real harm. Marcus had no time to mourn his ship. They needed to put as much distance between themselves and the wreckage as possible. More shots rained down. They hit a safe distance away, but with enough force to shake the ground. Marcus didn't slow, and he didn't look back. He just ran until Solomon's wheezing became too loud to ignore. Let's take a break. Solomon immediately slumped to the ground, panting and doubled over. Somehow he'd managed to hang on to one of their spare data slates. Marcus didn't know how useful it would be, but given their lack of equipment, anything was welcome. Marcus typed a command into his gauntlet. Hopefully Gruesome survived the explosion. If the warbot was intact, it should join them as soon as possible. I'm sorry about your ship, Margaret said. Marcus nodded. Thanks. The star had been a good ship, and she'd seen them through a bunch of rough scrapes. From the sounds of that explosion, there would be no salvaging her this time, assuming that they lived through this mess. What's the plan? Solomon asked. He had sat up, and though his face was still red, he seemed to have his breathing under control. I wish I had one, pal. It's just the three of us with no weapons. I figure if we can survive until Dracord gets here with reinforcements, we'll be doing pretty good. Think there's anything edible on this planet? Margaret asked. We're going to get awfully hungry if there isn't. I'm more worried about water, Solomon said. We have no purification equipment. I appreciate you guys' optimism, Marcus said. I figured we were going to get blasted or torn apart by lizard monsters before dehydration became an issue. They both stared at him. What? You don't think Voidwalker's just going to let us hang around out here, do you? Now I don't. Solomon forced himself to his feet. Maybe we should put some more distance between us and the wreckage. Let's wait a few more minutes. I activated Gruesome's call function. I'd like to see if it's still functional. We're not that lucky, Solomon said. Marcus figured they were pretty lucky to still be alive, but feared his friend was right about the robot. And without Gruesome or some other way to defend themselves, he feared what luck they had wouldn't last long. Chapter 17 Drekor paced in his ready room. It wouldn't do for the crew to see him this agitated, Ever since he'd sent Marcus into the Forbidden Zone, he'd been unable to focus on anything besides his worries. Had he done the right thing? Would his friend be okay? What would the governors on Vinsar Prime say when they found out he'd broken the taboo, even if only by proxy? Not to mention the final and most important question, what would he do should their worst fears be proven true? These questions chased each other around in his head, 
leaving him dizzy and unable to sleep or think. He wished news would arrive, any news, even if it was bad. He had already ordered the ship to travel in the general direction of the Forbidden Zone. Navigation may have guessed his ultimate destination, but he hadn't confirmed anything yet, and no one had worked up the nerve to ask him. Data packet for you, sir, Com said. It has the Rogue Star's signature. Finally, transfer it to my station here. Dracor slid into his chair and tapped the screen to open the file. The first image that popped up was a blue planet with two void warships in orbit overhead. That was enough to confirm his worst fears. A flick of his finger brought up the next image, this one of an ancient stone city dotted with pyramids and other reasonably intact structures. The ship Marcus had been chasing rested in front of the largest pyramid, and people were loading something into it. Next came exact coordinates and a short note. It said, We can't let them take whatever they're loading off-planet. We'll be making our attack run as soon as this data packet is sent. Whatever happens to us, I hope you can end it. And that was it. Given the time delay, Marcus and the others could be, and most likely were, dead. A very un like desire to smash something washed over him. He crushed it with iron will. He couldn't and wouldn't underestimate Marcus. If anyone could survive, he could. It was Dracor's job to handle the rescue. No more delays. He had to speak to the crew. After all their years together, he felt in his heart that they would be with him. But he didn't know. Going into the Forbidden Zone to take on two void warships was a big ask. But they weren't the finest crew on the finest ship in the Vinsar Navy for nothing. Stealing himself, Dracor stepped out of his ready room and onto the bridge. Every masked face turned to look at him. He wished he could see the faces of his people just this once. I'm going to make a ship-wide announcement. Ready when you are, sir, Com said. He took a deep breath. My friends, through the heroic efforts of our allies, I believe the primary base of the Children of the Void has been found. The bridge crew didn't make a sound. Did they tense a bit? Maybe. He couldn't say for sure. The target is in the Forbidden Zone. Detailed coordinates have been provided, but you should know that two enemy warships are on station. This will be a hard fight, even for us. I can't order you to do this. If anyone wishes to voice their objections, speak now. The silence was deafening. When a full minute had passed, Dracor said, I had no doubts. Prepare for hyperspace jump to the following coordinates. He rattled off the numbers Marcus had provided. Course laid in, sir, navigation said. Then make the jump with all speed. Our friends are in trouble. Let us hope we are not too late to save them. A faint vibration ran through the ship as they entered hyperspace. The Vensar weren't a religious people, but Dracor offered a silent prayer to any watching power that they arrive not too late. Marcus led the others through the jungle away from the crash site. After fifteen minutes, it became clear that Gruesome hadn't survived the explosion. Given the power of the Void's weapons, that didn't surprise him, but he would have been happy to be proven wrong. His mind raced as they slipped through the trees. If they were going to survive, he needed to come up with a plan. The problem was he knew nothing about this world or the ruined city, He'd read some history books about ancient Earth cities, but had no idea if the information would be of any use in an alien setting. Where are we going, Marcus? Solomon asked. He had no particular destination in mind other than away from the last place they'd been seen. Nowhere in particular. My hope is that if we keep moving, it'll be harder for whoever they send to find us. Maybe they won't send anyone, Margaret said. I mean... What possible threat could the three of us pose now? I suspect they'll send someone or something on principle. Marcus stopped and leaned against a tree trunk. We've dealt with the void far more frequently than I like to think about, and they seem to have a bit of a vindictive streak. At least the thick canopy and generally high heat should make it harder for the ships in orbit to spot and blast us. 
What makes you think that? Margaret asked. Mostly the fact that we're still alive. Running around out here with no plan and no supplies isn't going to be successful long term. If either of you has any ideas, I'm happy to listen. There must be food and supplies in the ruin, right? Solomon asked. Sneaking in there would be the last thing they'd expect. A slow smile spread across Marcus's face. That wasn't a terrible idea. He'd been thinking along a similar line. If the city had a sewer system, they might be able to sneak in that way. It wouldn't hurt to look anyway. Are you both crazy? Margaret asked. That's like walking into a lion's den with a stake tied around your neck. We'd be better off hiding out in the jungle and hoping they don't find us. Marcus nodded. You're not wrong, and if we had food and water, I'd be inclined to agree. But in this heat, with nothing to drink, we won't last a day. Soon enough, we'll be too dehydrated to run if we had to. If we're going to do something, we need to do it while we still have our strength. Margaret looked like she wanted to argue some more, but at last, she just nodded. That suited Marcus very well, since even if they argued until the sun set, the situation wouldn't change. Now they needed to figure out if the city even had a sewer for them to sneak through. If you were a city planner on an alien water world, where would you put the exit to your sewer? Marcus asked. At the lowest point, Solomon said. Water flows downhill regardless of the world. Right, okay. We need to circle the city until we find that point. As long as the exit hasn't collapsed, we should be okay. Unless it's guarded, Margaret said. We'll worry about that when we have to. With a plan, even a vague one now in mind, Marcus set out for the city. As always, when he'd settled on a path forward, Marcus felt better, more focused. Time would tell if it worked out or not, but at least he didn't need to think about it. As they made their way steadily toward the city, Marcus checked the clock built into his gauntlet. An hour had passed since they crashed and still no sign of pursuit. That seemed impossible, yet he couldn't deny the truth. Marcus was so tied up in his thoughts that he almost missed the rustling from the branches above them. He looked up in time to see a huge snake lowering itself toward Margaret. He leapt, pushing her out of the way, and fired a stunned pulse into the snake. It went limp and fell out of the trees. All sixty-plus feet of it. Margaret clung to him, her whole body trembling. He stroked her hair until she calmed down. Maybe the void figured the jungle would kill us all on its own, Solomon said as he stared at the unconscious snake. Not an unreasonable theory if there are many more of those out here. Marcus let go of Margaret and drew his knife. At least we have an emergency meat supply now. As he bled the snake out, Margaret said, You don't even know if it's safe to eat. I don't know if I can eat snake. It's just for a last resort. It's not like I'm planning on dragging a hundred pounds of snake meat along with me. But if we need to retreat, we can come here and no food is waiting. Snake is generally safe to eat and very tasty. As long as we cook it extra well done, we'll be fine. When the blood stopped, he stood and put his knife away. Leaving the carcass behind, they set out again. Margaret looked more troubled by the idea of eating the snake than she was by almost getting eaten by it. If that was the worst thing that happened before they found a way into the city, Marcus wouldn't complain. It took most of an hour, but they finally reached a gap in the jungle that revealed the edge of the city. It had to be incredibly ancient, yet even after however many centuries, there was still a band of open space separating the jungle from the city. Marcus looked closer. It wasn't just trees that were missing. There wasn't even any grass growing, just bare dirt. Can you scan that area? Marcus asked. It seems like something was done to it. The lack of life is unnatural. Nothing about this planet is natural, Solomon muttered as he took out the data slate. There was a small probe on the side of the slate, and Solomon stuck it in the ground before tapping a few commands. Well, this is strange. Not only is the plant life missing, but there are no microbes in the soil. The dirt is completely devoid of life. That said, as far as I can tell, there's nothing toxic in it either. I have no idea what any of it means, but I am confident that there's no danger if we walk across the open area. That's where you're wrong. Marcus motioned everyone back deeper into the jungle. 
We walk across here and anything or anyone watching will see us. If they have a blaster rifle, we'll really be in trouble. Let's keep looking. There's got to be a better way in than this. They kept a fair distance away from the edge of the jungle, but every once in a while Marcus caught a glimpse of the dead zone. Not that he ever saw anything beyond dirt. There should have been patrols or drones or something. It was so weird. Marcus knew he had to be missing something, but what it might be escaped him. Dusk was rapidly approaching, and he was just about to suggest returning to the snake when he spotted a glint of metal beyond the jungle. He held up a hand to stop everyone, then touched his finger to his lips before they could ask a question. Using hand signals, he indicated that they should stay put while he went for a closer look. He doubted he got his meaning fully across, but neither Margaret nor Solomon followed him when he snuck closer to the jungle's edge. The metal he spotted turned out to be a void assassin's arm blade. The black-masked killer stood at silent attention beside a square shaft sunk into the earth. This might be the access point Marcus had been looking for. Given the fact that it had a guardian, it was at least the most interesting thing he'd seen so far. The trick would be getting past the assassin. He inched back to the others and motioned for them to follow him. When he'd put about a hundred yards between them and the assassin, he explained what he found. When he finished, Solomon said, Even if it's a way in, there's no way we can beat a void assassin with the equipment we have now. I've got enough juice in the gauntlet to stun it. I just need to lure it in close enough to strike. It's dangerous, and we'll take all three of us working together. If we can't get through here, I don't know where we'll find a better option. What do you want me to do? Margaret asked. You're going to be the bait. Solomon, you're the lookout. I'll be the attacker. I'll get the assassin's attention, and when it turns this way, Margaret, you run. I'll hit it as it passes by. Try to weave between the trees so it can't get a clear shot at you. Solomon, keep your distance and make sure nothing sneaks up on us. I can do that, but Margaret's job seems the sketchiest. You're not wrong, but she's the fastest and the smallest target. Don't worry, Margaret said. I'm tougher than I look. I'll be fine. Marcus grinned. It was good to see her showing some spirit. He got Solomon into position behind a large tree a safe distance away, then collected a fist-sized rock. You're going to throw a rock at it? Margaret said. Isn't that kind of primitive? Void assassins have personal energy shields. Physical attacks are much more effective than a standard blaster would be. Besides, the rock is just to get its attention. Once it looks this way, it'll see you and hopefully give chase. Marcus patted a fair-sized tree. I'll be right here, and when it passes, bang, I take it out. I hope it goes that smoothly. Marcus hoped so, too. Get ready. When she indicated that she was, Marcus moved to the edge of the jungle and threw the rock as hard as he could. It bounced right off the assassin's masked face. Marcus ducked out of sight as soon as it impacted. It's looking this way, Margaret said. Should I run? Not yet. Wait until it makes a move towards you. Seconds ticked by and nothing happened. It's just standing there, staring at me. Crouch and pick up a rock. Maybe that will trigger it to attack. She bent over, never taking her eyes off the assassin, and grabbed a stone. Halfway back to vertical, she broke and ran. A moment later, green disruptor energy splashed over the spot she'd occupied a second before. Looked like she got its attention. Marcus popped the studs on his gauntlet and locked them in place. The assassin's footsteps were getting louder. He was only going to get one chance at this, and he had to make it count. The extended weapons module went past his hiding place, and a moment later Marcus stepped out and swung. His fist connected with the assassin's shoulder and a massive shock sent it crashing to the ground. No time to waste given how quickly they recovered. He pulled his knife and drove it into the assassin's throat right below its mask. A hard yank to the side cut it down to the spine. Not content with that, he sawed back and forth until the assassin's head rolled free. Marcus looked up to find Margaret staring at him, slightly aghast. I know it isn't pretty, but with these things, you need to be sure they're really dead. Are you okay? She gave a full body shudder. Yeah, fine. That green blast surprised me a little, but it missed by plenty. Good. Solomon, we clear? As far as I can tell. Solomon hurried their way, took one look at the dead assassin, and grimaced. 
This is why I always stay on the ship. I hear you, pal. Let's get out of here before someone comes looking for the dead assassin. Marcus led them over to the opening the assassin had been guarding. The square shaft descended into the dark. A ladder had been hammered into the side of the shaft to allow for entry. He couldn't even see the bottom. We're sure the assassin was here to keep people out and not something in, right? Solomon asked as he eyed the opening. Marcus wasn't sure of anything at this point beyond the fact that it would be harder for the void to find them underground. Only one way to find out. Chapter 18 At the bottom of the shaft, Marcus splashed into two feet of water. He grimaced and shone the light on his gauntlet around. He'd reserved about 15% of his power, which should let him use the light for an hour or so. Not exactly ideal, but better than nothing. He took a deep breath and frowned. The air smelled clean. Looked like they hadn't found the sewer exit after all. Of course, given how long the city had likely been here, the lack of stink didn't really prove that much. Still, he had a feeling this was a cistern rather than a sewer. Well, as long as it led where he wanted to go, that was fine. How is it? Solomon asked from above. There's some water, but the tunnel looks secure. Come on down. I want you to scan the water and see if it's drinkable. I thought this was the sewer, Margaret said, her disgust clear. That was my original theory, but now I'm thinking cistern. Come on. Solomon went first. As he climbed down, he said, That actually makes a lot of sense. Whatever they're working on probably requires a large quantity of water. I bet the assassin's job was to keep the local wildlife from polluting it. Solomon splashed into the water beside him and pulled out his data slate. Margaret joined them a moment later and asked, Does it really matter? No, but when I find a mystery, I can't help trying to solve it. It's just my nature, Marcus said. The water's clean. Like, really clean. No bacteria, no minerals, no nothing. It can't be natural. Scan for power sources, Marcus said. Maybe there's some equipment down here. Solomon tapped on the slate and nodded. Good call. I'm picking up a strong energy signal about a hundred yards down the tunnel. Let's take a look. Marcus set out in the lead. Right now, his gauntlet was of little more use as a weapon than his bare fists, but he'd take what he could get. Maybe they'd get lucky and everything would be automated. Soon a faint hum reached them. Further down the tunnel, something flashed. He frowned and switched off his light. Sure enough, there was a blue-tinted light up ahead. Can you tell anything more about what we're approaching? Marcus asked. Beyond a powerful energy source and a total lack of life forms, I can't tell anything. Do those masked things even register as alive? Margaret asked. They're mostly biological, so yes. What the scanner? Save the lesson for later, Marcus said. Let's take a look. Solomon muttered something Marcus didn't catch, probably complaining about losing a chance to show off his technical knowledge. The source of the blue light turned out to be a metal cylinder stuck in the middle of the water flow. Off to one side, someone had carved a large niche, then filled it with computer equipment. Solomon climbed out of the water and hurried over to the sole chair. Smiling to himself, Marcus followed his friend a step into the niche, then reached back to help Margaret. She took his hand and said, he really likes computers. He certainly does. Strolling over to Solomon, Marcus asked, Find anything interesting? It's all interesting. The cylinder is a water purification system. It draws water in, removes impurities, then sends it on to the void lab. The water in the tunnel appears to be overspill, which is why it's so pure. Is anyone thirsty? Solomon typed in a command, and a rectangular section of the station slid out. A flask filled with water was inside. This is for checking samples. You won't find purer water. Marcus took the flask out and swallowed a cool mouthful of water. It tasted wonderful after tromping around in the jungle, but it also tasted like something was missing. He shrugged and handed it to Margaret, who drank eagerly. While Solomon took his turn, she said, It tastes artificial somehow. Solomon blew out a sigh and returned the flask to its slot. It's the lack of minerals. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe despite the taste. Take a look at this. He typed in a command and a dozen squares on the large monitor came to life. 
It showed a variety of interior rooms as well as courtyards outside. Marcus pointed at one of the more active ones. Can you make that one bigger? Solomon obliged, and the full screen was suddenly filled with a burning ship and people trying to put the fire out. Huh, looks like we did a better job on their ship than I'd hoped. No way will they be getting whatever was in those cylinders off planet any time soon. What else are they up to? They cycled through various cameras, looking in on labs filled with cylinders that looked a great deal like the ones on Kulinov, probably where they made the lizard monsters. Other rooms held supplies of various sorts, computers and equipment. What they lacked was a cafeteria. Where did everyone eat? Not that Marcus thought they could just walk in and place an order, but still. It was yet another reminder of just how weird these people, and he used the word loosely, were. Stop. Margaret pointed at the screen. That's Soma. Solomon froze the screen and zoomed in. The man Margaret pointed out had one eye replaced by an electronic prosthetic, as well as a missing hand. He wore a typical black suit, though that was the only typical thing about him. I'm guessing the eye is a new thing, Marcus said. Yes, he never looked like that before. Where's he going? Marcus asked. I don't know, Solomon said. After he left the corridor, he went into an area with no camera coverage. Gone to see the boss man, I'll wager. Marcus clapped his friend on the back. Good work. See if you can locate a map of the city. This place seems secure, but I'd like to know if there's another way in. I'll see what I can find. Solomon got to work, tapping happily away as if they weren't in the middle of enemy territory, unarmed, with no way off the planet. Marcus slumped to the floor and Margaret sat beside him. What happens now? she asked. Now we wait and see if Dracor gets here before the Void decides to come wipe us out. I don't believe for a moment they're unaware that we're here. I figure they don't consider us a threat. When the time comes, I plan to make them regret their arrogance. Soma strode into Voidwalker's private lab with the same confidence he showed everywhere else. He hoped that if he acted brave, he would eventually feel brave when he approached his new superior his new master, if he wanted to be honest about it. The image from his artificial eye went blurry as it fought with his natural one. Voidwalker had offered to adjust it, but Soma had no desire to let the mad scientist fiddle with him any more than he already had. It had only been a year since he betrayed his brothers and joined the Children of the Void. Though he had gained a great deal of personal power, Soma had yet to decide if the exchange was worth it. Not that there was any going back at this point. He shuddered as he looked around the lab. A vat held black liquid and Soma figured some nasty new monster was hidden within its inky depths. There were all manner of technological devices that Soma couldn't begin to identify. Even stranger, Voidwalker had drawn an odd, rune-filled circle on the floor. It looked like what a madman might use to try and summon a demon, if such things actually existed. A dark spot moved and Voidwalker turned to face him. Dressed in all black, including a flat black mask that seemed to suck in the light, the master of the cult, or whatever they thought of themselves as, gave away nothing as he looked Soma over. Your ship? Voidwalker asked at last. Badly damaged. Even if we had the parts on planet, which we don't, it would take weeks to repair. I fear we won't be making the delivery to Mars any time soon. Unfortunate. I was eager to see how that particular experiment would turn out. But no matter. Soon I expect Dracor and the Bensar to arrive. Once they're dealt with, we will have all the time in the world to continue our work. Speaking of our enemies, Soma said, why do we not hunt the spies down now? They're insects. When you try to step on them, they skitter around to avoid the boot. Given what I've observed, when the time for battle comes, they will be unable to resist joining in. Snuffing them out will be a simple matter. For now, I'm content to let them rot in whatever hole they've chosen. Do you disapprove of my decision? That last question held an edge that sent a shiver down Soma's spine. Of course not, sir. It's just that loose ends make me nervous. Would it be acceptable for me to send a squad of my own men to deal with them, just to make sure? 
This wouldn't have anything to do with your desire to kill the adopted son of your rival, would it? Such mundane concerns are unbecoming of one of our members. Of course not, sir. I think only of the mission. Void Walker's dry laugh held no hint of amusement. You're a good liar anyway. Do as you please. I couldn't possibly care less either way. Thank you for your indulgence, sir. Soma bowed, and when he straightened, Void Walker had vanished, merging with the lab's shadows so perfectly that even Soma's new eye couldn't pick him out. Soma shuddered and hurried out of the lab. He dealt with many odd, some might even say twisted, individuals during his time as clan head, but no one had ever unnerved him the way Void Walker did. There was something truly uncanny about him. His genius and power couldn't be denied. His sanity, on the other hand, Soma had serious doubts about. Doubts he intended to keep buried in the deepest, most hidden recesses of his heart. He shuddered a second time when he considered what Void Walker might do if he learned of Soma's secret thoughts. Chapter 19 Marcus took a long pull from the water flask and sighed. He was used to the odd taste now. What he badly wanted was a nice steak. Or anything to eat, really. They'd been hunkered down for two days, and Marcus's stomach had taken to swearing at him about the lack of food on a regular basis. Annoying as it might be, a couple days without food was no big deal. Hopefully Dracor would get here before it became a big deal. Going scrounging in a void-controlled ruin didn't appeal to Marcus at all. The biggest surprise was Solomon's lack of complaints. His friend was fully engrossed in the Purification Center's computer, working 20 hours without a break at times. Marcus couldn't help being impressed. When he'd asked what he was working on, Solomon just said, digging. It was probably hacker slang for seeing what he could find. His gaze shifted to Margaret, who was watching the camera feeds from the hall that led to this room. They'd been taking turns keeping an eye on things, and so far their enemies seemed content to leave them in peace. Marcus, she said, I think we've got a problem. He knew it was too good to last. Two strides brought him to her side. Margaret pointed at one of the monitors, and sure enough, a squad of four heavily armed men, no void assassins, he noted with relief, were sneaking down the tunnel toward their position. The way they moved, two by two, always covering each other, never taking a risk, made him think they were pros. Some of your former co-workers? Margaret nodded. Looks like a standard four-man assault team. We had two at the club for emergencies. Any advice for dealing with them? She shook her head. They're the best fighters the clan has to offer. Avoiding them would be ideal. That sounds like an excellent plan. Solomon, is there any way to seal this room off? Solomon looked up from his monitor, his eyes bloodshot and bleary. No, proper water flow plus ease of maintenance requires this space to be open. Can you deal with them? I'm really close to gaining access to the central computer. The firewalls are insane, but I finally figured out the architecture they're using. A few more hours and I'll have full access. Marcus checked the monitor and shook his head. Four heavily armed and armored soldiers versus him and his now fully recharged gauntlet. In the jungle, with room to maneuver, he might have a chance, but not here. Sorry, pal, but we need to go, right now. Solomon's face twisted as he looked from his station to Marcus. This isn't a debate. We run or we die. Which do you prefer? When you put it that way, let's go. Solomon got to his feet with a groan, and Marcus led the way back to the exit. If the dragon soldiers were dumb enough to follow them, he'd have no trouble stunning them as they emerged. A shaft of light in the distance made it easy to spot the exit. Marcus waved Solomon and Margaret ahead of him. A quick glance over his shoulder confirmed that the soldiers hadn't caught up yet, though from the way Solomon was grunting and the speed at which he was climbing, Marcus worried they might. A vague sound reached him. Was that a splash? As soon as Margaret started climbing, he followed right on her heels, far closer than was polite, but they were out of time. At the top, hot, humid air assaulted him. Marcus ignored it and crouched, gauntlet leveled at the exit tunnel. Solomon and Margaret scampered behind some nearby boulders. Listen though he might, Marcus heard nothing at the bottom of the shaft. Maybe they'd given up. He wouldn't be sad about that. 
The scream of engines drew his attention up. A silver Vensar combat shuttle flew past him toward the city. No doubt their arrival had more to do with the soldiers giving up than fear of what Marcus might do. He backed over to the boulders, never taking his eyes off the shaft just in case. Looks like the boss finally made it. The scream of blasters was followed by explosions, as if to put an exclamation point on his statement. So what now? Solomon asked. Do we just wait it out here? No. Any stray void monsters might head this way, and we're in no shape to fight them. We'll sneak into the city and meet up with the Vensar. With any luck, they'll have some extra blasters for me. You can wait in their shuttle while I see how many I can take down. I'm coming with you, Solomon said, to Marcus's total shock. Run that by me again? I'm coming with you. If I can get to a computer terminal, I can finish hacking their system. All the Void's research and secrets are there for the taking. Yeah, but taking it might get you killed. It might, but we might also find out how to cure the disease. If this is their main base, and I'm pretty sure it is, the secret has to be here. Marcus thought about Lysen dying on Vinsar Prime and nodded. I'll get you to a terminal. Margaret, can I convince you to remain behind? You certainly can. Besides, you don't need to be worrying about me and Solomon. Thank the universe. Someone reasonable. Great, let's get a move on. Marcus had no doubt the boss was going to need all the help he could get. Drekor stood on the bridge of his ship, hands clasped behind his back, silent as a statue. He had already changed out of his robes and into combat armor. The landing party was waiting in the hangar, and he'd join them as soon as they secured the area enough to launch a shuttle. According to Marcus's report, there were two void warships in orbit around the planet. Not a particularly good matchup for them, but he took comfort in the fact that his ship had received a number of upgrades while he was home. One minute, sir, Navigation said. Drekor offered a nod of acknowledgement, but nothing more. At ten seconds, a countdown appeared in the screen in his mask. He sent a silent prayer to any power that might be listening that they could end the void right here. Sarkin needed to pay for the suffering he'd caused, and not just to Drakor's people. A faint vibration ran through the hull, and a moment later the planet appeared ahead of them. The void warships were in orbit, and they opened fire. Weapons control didn't need an order from him, and soon streams of plasma and missiles were streaking back and forth. The ship rattled when an especially powerful blast hit the shield. Shields holding steady, Tactical said. Enemy warships remain undamaged. Drekor grimaced. They didn't have time for this. Focus all firepower on the nearest enemy vessel and deploy fighters. The streams of light in the viewscreen shifted, and seconds later, silver streaks shot out of the hangar. Explosions burst from the enemy ship, and it started to break apart. Target destroyed, weapons confirmed. They had no time to celebrate as the most powerful blast yet shook their ship. Target two is closing, shields down 50%, Tactical said. Call in the fighter screen. Prepare the assault shuttle for launch. Tactical, you have command. With those final orders, Drekor headed for the hangar. He had a clear shot to the planet, and he meant to take it. When he reached the hangar, the assault team was waiting outside the shuttle. They were dressed in combat armor similar to Drakor's. While the design was identical, Drakor had added a few extra surprises to his. He'd been preparing for this final confrontation with Sarkin ever since Marcus first encountered the Children of the Void. Somehow, this moment felt inevitable, and he meant to survive it. He would return to Vinsar Prime and tell Lysen that it was done. That way, when her time finally came, she could die in peace. The team knew their business and needed no orders from him. He marched past them and into the shuttle before taking his place in the co-pilot's seat. While more than capable of flying the ship himself, the pilot had more combat flying experience than Drekor. Depending on what they ran into, that might be the difference between life and death. The pilot settled in beside him and got to work. In less than a minute, the shuttle flew through the hangar door at maximum acceleration. Energy blasts filled the space around the ship. They dove quickly, putting distance between them and the ongoing battle. A pair of fighters fell in beside them, and they accelerated toward the planet. How do you want to handle our approach, sir? The pilot asked. 
Let's take a look and see what we can find. I'll handle the scanners, but keep a close eye out for anti-aircraft defenses. I have no idea what sort of nasty surprises Sarkin has in store for us, but you can be sure there will be something. The shuttle passed through the atmosphere and Dracor focused on his panel. According to Marcus's report, there was only one landmass of any size on the entire planet. They were currently over the ocean and flying toward the target at high speed. He registered nothing beyond salt water and ocean life on his scanners. Soon enough, land appeared ahead of them. They hadn't gone far when he spotted smoldering wreckage below. A cursory scan confirmed his worst fear. It was the remains of the rogue star. My dear friends, I hope you're all right. He barely breathed the words for fear that saying them louder might... How did Marcus put it? Jinx them. Trying to the best of his ability to put his concerns out of his mind, Dracor focused on the ruined city filling his screen. Everything was made of stone save for the badly damaged ship sitting beside the largest building. That had to be the one Marcus attacked. Doesn't this seem a bit primitive given who we're dealing with, sir? The pilot asked. Dracor had been thinking that exact same thing. This wasn't at all Sarkin's style. It does, but don't get complacent. Despite its appearance, I'm sure this city is a death trap. Land us on the opposite side of the courtyard from the damaged ship. While the pilot landed, Dracor turned the full power of the shuttle's scanners on the central building and found nothing. Some force blocked every instrument at his disposal. Given the resources the shuttle could bring to bear, it was enough to confirm they were in the right place. The shuttle settled on its landing gear. That was Dracor's signal. He stood. Stay with the ship. Keep it powered up in case we need to make a quick escape. Good luck, sir. Dracor nodded and left the cockpit. The assault team had already deployed in a circle formation outside the ship. It was dead quiet outside. No assassins, no warbots, no nothing. Had he been less confident in Marcus, Dracor might have thought this was a decoy location. Order, sir, the team leader asked. Before Dracor could answer, the door in the front of the target building slid open. His enhanced audio receptors picked up snarls and growls just before a pack of lizards the size of cows came rushing out at them. The soldiers opened fire, their enhanced blasters punching holes in the creatures with no resistance. Or effect, for that matter. As soon as one went down, black goose would fill in the hole and it rose once more. It was exactly the same as what Marcus described in his report. The only difference was, these monsters weren't humanoid. Luckily, they'd planned for this possibility. Switch to plasma flame units. Half the team kept firing while the others holstered their weapons and raised their right hands. Crimson flames roared from their emitters, melting flesh and reducing the creatures to ash. Even through his heavy armor, Dracor could feel the heat. It didn't take long until only dark smudges remained. While the team went to refill their plasma tanks, Dracor examined the black spots. Now that he knew what to look for, it wasn't hard to spot the unknown residue. They really needed to figure out what that substance was. The working hypothesis was a mutagen, but that was more of a guess than he liked. He looked up from the black stains and found the door to the stone structure remained open. It was like an invitation, like Sarkin was daring them to enter. If he thought there were any Vensar that feared to take the fight to him, then he was badly mistaken. As soon as the rearmed soldiers returned, the group marched straight toward the open door. Dracor would have taken the lead, but his men made sure to form a box around him and keep him in the middle. They meant well, but Dracor didn't consider his life any more precious than theirs. The instant the last man passed through the door, it slammed shut, sealing them in absolute darkness. Even with the enhanced vision of his mask, Dracor could only make out vague details of the door-lined hall. The only sounds were their footfalls on the stone floor. Try as he might, his mask's scanner couldn't penetrate the walls. They were basically moving forward blind. They stopped outside the first door. There was an invisible control panel beside it. The lead soldier hesitated and asked, Do we clear it or keep moving? 
Clear it, Dracor said at once. We don't want something coming up behind us. A group of four stacked up, and a fifth got ready to push the button. Execute, Dracor said. The door slid into the ceiling, and all four soldiers rushed in. What rushed out was an incredibly foul odor. Even with his mask's filter, Dracor winced at the rancid stink. All clear, sir. Looks like a holding pen for animals of some sort, the unit commander said. Let's clear the rest of the rooms quickly and move on, Dracor said. And that's exactly what they did. It turned out all the rooms were storage, some for beasts and others for something else. Two were totally empty, and he had no idea what they might have held. And at the moment, he wasn't overly interested. There had to be more enemies here. It was only a matter of time before Sarkin unleashed them or the group ran into them at random. At the end of the door-lined hall, they reached an intersection. Drekor studied left and right, but there was nothing to distinguish one from the other. No way was he planning to separate his team. With no better options, he said, let's try right. The lead four soldiers started down the hall. Before Dracor's middle group could follow, a heavy steel door fell out of the ceiling, blocking them off. He looked around, but saw no hidden control panels. How long to cut through? Dracor asked. A soldier pointed, and a bright red laser lanced out of his gauntlet. He held it on the door for five seconds without so much as scorching the metal. Sorry, sir. It's reinforced and treated with some sort of heat-dispersing substance. We need different equipment to break it down. Should we return to the ship? There's no time, Drekor said. Squad leader, can you hear me? No response. Something was blocking his signal. He snarled a curse that would have done Marcus proud. His people knew what to do. He'd just have to trust them to find their own way out. Hopefully we have better luck to the left. Before Dracor could take a step, two members of the rear guard hastened to get in front of him. He gave a little shake of his head, but offered no complaint. After all, they wanted to protect him, and Dracor had to appreciate that. It came as a considerable relief when nothing slammed down behind them as they began their search. The total lack of anything interesting took some of the good feelings away. Yard after yard of blank wall and empty corridor began to wear on him, Sarkin had to be here somewhere. Dracor would have called him out if he thought it would do any good. Soon enough, they reached another intersection, again with nothing even hinting at which way would be best. According to the virtual map his mask had been making as they walked, left would lead them back toward the exit. Right, he hoped, might give them a chance of meeting back up with their comrades. Isn't it a bit empty in here, sir? One of the soldiers asked. The pressure must really be getting to him if he spoke out of turn like that. Dracor didn't have the heart to chastise the poor fellow. It certainly is strange. I had assumed we'd need to fight for every foot. Other than those creatures, the place appears empty. Perhaps Captain Drake erred in his theory that this was the Void's main stronghold. He is only human, after all. Dracor seriously doubted that. Human or not, Marcus had proven himself one of the Council's most adept agents. The warships and monsters also made it clear that something serious was happening here. Something ahead, sir, the point man said. Can you elaborate? Drekor asked. There's a stone door with writing on it. It's Vensar's script. Drekor had given up on being surprised, but this was certainly unexpected. Let me see. The stone door had an elaborate carving of an altar chamber complete with figures dressed in long robes worshipping what looked like a hole in the earth. It matched nothing in the historical records, at least nothing he was aware of. Lokar might have known more, but there was no time to consult with his old friend. Shifting to the writing, he frowned as he read, This place is home to the vilest of darkness. All are forbidden to enter. Only death and madness lie beyond this door. Seemed a bit extreme and lacking in detail for a Vensar warning. Of course, he had to accept that his ancestors might have had a less evolved way of thinking. What should we do, sir? The point man asked. His voice held a faint, nervous tremble. 
We're not going to find anything useful out here. Open it. But the warning. Whatever we find, it can't be worse than what Sarkin already has planned. Open it. The soldiers got together and pushed. The door split in half and swung silently inward. Beyond it waited a huge room with a domed ceiling. A strange ambient light filled the space. Try as he might, Dracor couldn't determine the source. There was nothing of any interest to be seen. The smooth stone floor gave away nothing. The walls were bare and, search as he might, he saw no hidden doors or control pads. Spread out and check everything. There has to be more here. The soldiers obeyed while Dracor walked to the center of the room. He looked up at the ceiling as if there might be something hidden there. Of course he found nothing. The faintest of vibrations was the only warning he got before he fell into the darkness. Chapter 20 The first thing Marcus noticed as they approached the center of the ancient city was the lack of explosions and the scream of blasters. Clearly no one was fighting. Why no one was fighting was something he couldn't begin to guess. In fact, the eerie silence put his nerves on edge. Marcus couldn't stop darting looks at every shadow. The fact that nothing ever emerged from them did nothing to reassure him. Despite his concerns, the trio reached the city center without issue. There, they found a silver Vinsar shuttle sitting a little ways away from the ship Marcus crippled. Up close, it looked like he'd done even more damage than he first thought. Good to know the star got in one last good hit before she bought it. Um, Margaret made a hesitant sound. I think that ship's cannons are tracking us. Marcus froze, and beside him Solomon went as stiff as a board. He turned slowly, and sure enough the Vensar shuttle's cannons were locked onto them. He waved and smiled as if that would reassure the targeting computer. Boss? You in there? No reply, but at least no one blasted them. Finally, the rear of the shuttle opened and a masked Vensar emerged. Captain Drake, I'm pleased to see you and your companions survived the crash. First Counselor Dracor was most concerned. He spoke in a tone that suggested that while the boss might have been concerned about Marcus's fate, he, most assuredly, was not. When he first dealt with Vensar, that tone bothered him. Now he understood that it was just their way. Yeah, I'm pretty pleased myself. Can you give an update? Certainly. Please come inside. It'll be more secure with the shuttle sealed. They followed him up the ramp, which shut behind them. I appreciate your cooperation. I've dealt with the void enough to know that having a sealed shuttle between me and them is a very good thing. Speaking of which, why aren't you fighting for your life right now? I haven't the least idea. A force of lizard creatures rushed out of the main building. They were as difficult to kill as you indicated, but we had plasma emitters prepared for such an eventuality, and they were dealt with quickly and with no loss to our side. A team has already entered the main building in hopes of coming to grips with Sarkin. I remained behind to secure the shuttle. He sounded a bit annoyed with that last bit, probably upset that he wouldn't get to take a shot at Voidwalker. Having seen how powerful a knockoff version of the man was, Marcus figured he wasn't missing much. Any word from Dracor? Solomon asked. No, a jamming field is preventing all communication. I've also heard no sounds of combat from inside. Another strange thing, I must admit. You are, of course, welcome to take shelter here until the conflict is resolved. Much obliged, Marcus said. Margaret will be staying, but if you can spare a couple blaster pistols, Solomon and I are going in. We have a fully stocked arsenal, but getting into the building might be a problem as the door shut as soon as the team entered. Marcus shrugged. We'll take a look. Turning to Solomon, he asked, You're still determined to go, right? Yes, and if there's a control panel, I might be able to open the door from the outside. Then let's do it. It didn't take long for Marcus to collect a pair of blaster pistols that were a perfect match for his old set and belt them on. 
Solomon had no interest in weapons, and having seen him shoot once, Marcus didn't insist he take one. Geared up and ready to go, Marcus threw a wave to Margaret and led the way outside. On the short walk over to the sealed entrance, nothing shot at them. So far, the quiet was holding. No doubt the boss was keeping whatever nasties remained behind occupied. There was no visible control panel, but Solomon groped around until he found something and plugged his data slate into it. How did you know that was there? Marcus asked. I figured it was like the giant ship, and the control panels were only visible to someone wearing a mask. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. Finding an input jack by feel isn't that hard. I need to concentrate now. Marcus swallowed the smart-ass remark he was about to make about finding the input jack by feel and turned to keep watch. Not that there was anything to see. Glaring around at the empty clearing felt strange, so Marcus tried to relax. Fortunately, Solomon did his thing in typically speedy Solomon fashion, and the door slid up. That didn't take long. Marcus looked down the pitch-black tunnel and grimaced. He hadn't seen any night vision goggles in the armory. Vinsar no doubt had such things built into their masks. Solomon unplugged the slate. It was easy. I did spend the last two days studying the system's architecture, after all. Unfortunately, the control panel has a very limited connection to the main system, so I can't access everything from outside. Yeah, we wouldn't want anything to be too easy. Marcus switched on the light built into his gauntlet. The beam seemed far too meager given the deep darkness. Come on. They set out down a corridor lined with open doors. The stink wafting out of some of them made Sarth seem like a bed of roses. Unfortunately, there were no computer terminals to be found in any of them. At the end of the passage, they reached an intersection. The left side was open, but a steel barrier blocked the right. Feel around, Solomon said. There might be a control panel to raise the barrier. Marcus ran his left hand over the smooth stone wall while keeping his right hand pointed up to light the area. Halfway down, his nail caught on something. He adjusted the light for a better look. Hey! Solomon shouted from the other side of the hall. Sorry, I found something. What he found turned out to be a thin gap. When he lifted, a cover slid up revealing a hidden control panel. Here you go. Solomon came over and plugged in. Why would they put a physical cover in place when they can just make them invisible? Why do these lunatics do anything? My guess, since Vinsar masks can see them, is they didn't want the boss finding this one. That makes sense. I guess low-tech is sometimes useful. I've almost got it. Marcus drew one of his pistols and pointed it at the door. Go. Solomon pressed a button and the barrier slid up into the ceiling. When it did, Marcus found himself staring down the barrels of four Vinsar blasters. He quickly holstered his pistol. Whoa, guys, I'm on your side. The Vinsar soldiers lowered their weapons, and the squad leader, at least Marcus assumed that was his job, took a step forward. Captain Drake, it's good to see you alive. Where's the first counselor? Haven't seen him. Marcus jerked a thumb over his shoulder. I figure he went that way. If he isn't here, how did you get the door open? Solomon hacked it. Looks like the void hid the control panel somewhere you guys wouldn't see it. Sarkin is a clever one. We need to catch up with the main group. Thank you for your help, Captain. The four Vensar soldiers hurried away down the opposite hall. Hopefully they'd find Dracor and the rest of their team safe and sound. Should we go with them? Solomon asked. No, let's take a look in here first. I doubt soldiers would be interested in a computer terminal. Maybe we'll get lucky and find one. Marcus flashed the light around the room. Not much to see. Blank walls, stone floor and ceiling. Nothing to indicate that there was another way out. Maybe it was hidden the old school way. Let's check the walls. Keep an eye out for anything that looks like a niche for your finger to open a panel. Marcus got to work and Solomon joined in not far away. Given the limits of the light, there was no way for them to separate by more than a few feet and still see what they were doing. The first wall turned out to be a dud, but halfway around the second, his fingernail caught again. A flick of his wrist sent the panel up and out of the way. Behind was a simple switch. They weren't even trying very hard here. Stay behind me. Marcus drew his pistol, 
then pressed the button. A section of wall slid up into the ceiling. Beyond it waited a mad scientist's wet dream. There were tanks like the ones on Kolonov, tables covered with the universe knew what equipment. What looked like a demon-summoning circle covered a section of the floor, and most importantly, a computer terminal waited at the rear of the room. Solomon took a step toward it, but Marcus cut him off. This has been going way too smoothly. Let's not stumble into something now. Taking the lead, Marcus eased his way inside, pistols leveled at the tanks. Hopefully whatever lived in them wouldn't be able to leave, just like the other ones they found. They crossed the room without issue. Solomon paused to look at the magic circle. What do you make of that? Looks like something out of a fantasy novel. Unfortunately, Void Walker doesn't strike me as the type to buy into that sort of thing. I suggest we keep our distance and hope it's just a decoration. That's weird, even for these nuts. Solomon settled in front of the computer and fired it up. With nothing better to do at the moment, Marcus turned to focus on the door. If anything or anyone showed up looking for trouble, he'd be happy to give it to them. Chapter 21 Drekor fell for about 30 feet before the automatic safety system built into his armor kicked in and activated his anti-gravity generator. His fall instantly slowed, and a few seconds later he landed on a rough stone floor. A quick look around made it clear that he'd ended up in a natural cavern. Stalactites hung from the ceiling and boulders the size of his shuttle littered the ground. A dim, purplish light from deeper in the cavern was the only thing of interest. With no better options, he headed for it. Squad leader, come in. No response, just as he expected. The calm jamming was probably even more intense down here. Looked like he was on his own. Drekor picked his way through the rubble. With each step, the light grew brighter, though never truly bright. Stepping around a final boulder, he reached what he assumed was the source of the light, a black disc in the middle of the floor, a figure dressed in black robes and wearing a matching mask floated three feet above the disc. Sarkin, I've been looking for you for a long time. The crimes you've committed against the Vensar people have earned you a sentence of death. That pronouncement drew a soft, mocking laugh. Drekor bristled at that, but immediately forced himself to relax. He refused to be baited into making a fatal mistake. And who is going to carry out this sentence? Sarkin asked. You? You're little more than a child compared to me. The idea that you could even challenge me is the most arrogant thing I've ever heard. I only allowed you to come this far so you can understand my dream before you die. Drekor snarled and hurled lightning at Sarkin. The attack splashed against an invisible barrier and fizzled. Fire and blaster bolts fared no better. For the moment, it seemed his enemy lay beyond his reach. Have you finished your pointless display? Not waiting for a reply, Sarkin continued. Good. Now listen and try to understand. Some of the concepts I'm about to explain may well be beyond your limited intelligence. Crude insults? Really? And you say I have limited intelligence? It wasn't an insult, simply a statement of fact. I've lived centuries longer than you, learned secrets your pathetic conscience wouldn't even allow you to contemplate. Remember, I didn't say you were stupid, only limited. The saddest thing of all is that you placed the limits on yourself. But that's neither here nor there. You are exactly as your upbringing dictates you should be. In our long history, I am the only one to truly break free of the restrictions our society puts on us. Following me here, in defiance of our taboos, shows that you at least have some potential. Drakor shook his head. If you're so brilliant, why did you use your intellect to create a disease that would destroy your own people? I didn't make the disease to destroy the Vensar, you fool. I made it to force our society to change, with all our technology. 
It should have been easy to find a cure. I mean, a human nearly did it. If our leaders had the will to slaughter a few tens of thousands of primitives during the research phase, or even to create mindless clones to infect an experiment on, millions of Vinsar could have been saved. But no, they chose their principles over their survival. Frankly, I have never been more disgusted. For a moment, Dracor couldn't speak. He'd assumed, as had every one he'd ever known, that Sarkin hated the Vensar and that was why he created the disease. And that wasn't wrong. He clearly hated what he saw as their society's flaws. But he also wanted to change them into a corrupt version of themselves. That seemed somehow even more evil. Just say what you have to say so we can get on with the inevitable fight. I assume you know the theory of dark energy. Drekor started at the sudden change of subject. Yes, but in thousands of years it's never been proven. Only the most French scientists even consider it plausible at this point. Oh, it's plausible. The problem is our technology is still inadequate to detect it. And the correct name for that invisible energy is the ether. In other galaxies, people have evolved the ability to not only see it, but to manipulate it directly, to create effects our science-based worldview would consider impossible. You're raving, Sarkin. You can't possibly know any of that. No one has ever gone to another galaxy. And if we can't detect this energy field you describe, there's no proof that it exists much less that people can manipulate it. What you're describing is magic, not science. Precisely correct on all points. Magic is exactly what it is. As for the rest, all the knowledge was shared with me. The black disk below me is a portal, a hole in our reality that connects to a cosmic entity called the Void. It exists everywhere, and knows everything. Drekor shook his head. This is just sad. Clearly you've lost your mind. Before Sarkin could speak further, overhead lights sprang to life, revealing the cavern in more detail. It didn't look much more interesting, but the illumination did remove some of the creepy atmosphere. How remarkable, Sarkin said. A human has managed to override and assume control over some of the base computer's functions. I wouldn't have thought the near savages capable of such a feat. Dracor's heart leapt. There was only one human he knew that could do that, and if Solomon was alive, Marcus certainly was. Amusing as this conversation has been, it seems I need to fumigate my headquarters. I believe I'll start with you. The overhead lights burst to life, and a moment later Solomon said, I'm in. Marcus grinned. When it came to computers, he'd never even considered doubting Solomon. Great. Can you access the internal camera system? I'd like to find out where the boss is. Shutting down the signal jamming would be a good idea as well. I can only do one thing at a time. Solomon typed like a madman. Windows opened and closed on the screen so fast Marcus didn't know how he had time to read them. Okay, bad news is, no sign of Dracor on the internal cameras that I can find, and I have full access to the system. The jamming? Taken down. I also have a full map of the building. Marcus studied one of the open windows while Solomon kept working in a different one. The layout was simple enough. The problem was none of the rooms were labeled. At least finding the concealed control panels would be easier if they knew where the intersections were. Access to the second and third floors were down the opposite corridor. This lab appeared to be the end of this particular passage. That was good, since it meant no one could sneak up on them. Marcus switched the comm unit built into his gauntlet over to a general Vensar frequency. Can anyone hear me? Captain Drake? That sounded like the squad commander he'd spoken to earlier. I take it we have you and your friend to thank for the lights. All credit to Solomon for that. I've also got a map of the complex here. Where do you need to get to? 
The basement. Dracor fell through a trap door. We've tried all our weapons and can't get through. Well, that's a problem since the map doesn't even show a basement. I know there are tunnels, but it doesn't show them either. Your map isn't terribly helpful, Captain. From anyone else, Marcus would have taken that as dry humor. From a Vinsar, it was just a statement of fact. It's all I've got. Do you want a copy or not? I suppose it's better than nothing. Can you send it through the comm link? Marcus glanced at Solomon, who did something, then shot him a thumbs up. Did you get it? We did. Perhaps the way down is up. We'll search the upper floors for now. Good luck. Marcus disconnected. He wanted to help Dracor, but if the Vinsar couldn't find a way to get to him, there was no way Marcus could. He glanced at Solomon, but found his friend fully engrossed in whatever he was working on. Since he didn't have anyone or anything to shoot, Marcus wasn't sure what to do with himself. Oops, Solomon said. Oops? What do you mean, oops? I was trying to find a central data storage area, but I went down the wrong branch. I think I may have activated something. A sick feeling twisted Marcus's stomach. What sort of something? Before Solomon could answer, the black liquid started to drain out of the four tanks. Inch by inch, a horribly melted and mutated head was revealed. Next came broad shoulders with a massive hump between them, a misshapen chest, and two long, totally out-of-proportion legs. Each tank held one of the horrors. All were similar, yet different in horrid ways. Two were based on lizards and the others something else. Maybe human, but he couldn't say for sure. Marcus swallowed hard when the nearest one opened its eyes. The others opened theirs as well, and all four turned to stare at him. Marcus had his pistols in his hands quick as a blink, but he didn't fire. First, he'd see if the ugly things could get out of those vats on their own. Just looking at them, it was a wonder they could even stand, much less move. While he waited, Marcus activated his calm again. I think I may have found a way into the basement. We're in a lab beyond that room where your men were trapped. There's a bit of a situation here, so if you could come quickly, it would be much appreciated. On our way, Captain. Marcus blew out a breath. There was nothing more reassuring than knowing a dozen Vinsar warriors were on their way. His relief, unfortunately, was short-lived. The nearest creature loosed a wail that would haunt his dreams for the rest of his life, assuming, of course, that he lived long enough to go to sleep tonight. The other three took up the cry, and all of them began scrabbling against the glass of their vats. They didn't seem able to damage it. That was good. Unfortunately, one of them looked at the rim of the vat and leapt, grabbing the lip and hoisting itself up. As soon as its head cleared the edge, Marcus fired, burning a hole right through the middle of its melted face. The creature fell back into the vat, lay still for a moment, then stood and glared at him. Where the hole had been was now a small black circle. Like he feared, these things were made the same way as the lizard things they'd fought earlier. All four tried climbing out at the same time. Marcus aimed and fired as quickly as he could, sending one after the other back down with a splat. It was tremendously frustrating to get a kill shot only to watch the thing you killed stand back up like nothing happened. At least he was keeping them in their tanks. If all four, hell, if one of them got out, he was so screwed. The process of them climbing and him shooting repeated twice more before one of the monsters roared its frustration and slammed itself against the glass. The vat wobbled. That seemed to encourage all of them, and soon they were howling and thrashing like mad. All four threw themselves with all their might against the vats. The den threatened to deafen him, and the vats were on the verge of falling over. I can't concentrate with all this noise, Solomon shouted over the clamor. That he was trying to work at all, with death so close at hand, impressed Marcus. Unfortunately, Marcus couldn't do anything about the clamoring. A few seconds later, the first vat fell over. It didn't shatter, but the creature inside crawled out and surged toward Marcus. He fired both blasters in quick succession, perforating its head and chest. As usual, the creature dropped only to quickly rise again, sporting new black dots on its body. Marcus kept shooting as another vat fell to the floor, followed by a third. Just when he thought things couldn't get any worse, 
the low-charge warning light on his right-hand blaster turned on. Two shots later, the left one joined it. The howling monster crouched, ready to leap. Was this really how he was going to die, torn apart by lab-grown freaks? After everything he'd survived, it seemed wrong. His final shot went through two of them, dropping them to the floor. Behind the still-standing monster, he spotted a flash of silver. An instant later, a stream of boiling red flames roared through the monsters and stopped a few yards short of Marcus. He scrambled back to get away from the heat, face stinging and covered in sweat. The torrent of flames didn't stop until the creatures had been reduced to black stains. Marcus wasn't sure if the things were smart enough to be afraid, but the one in the still-standing vat froze and fell silent as it stared at its dead fellows. It slowly turned its misshapen head and glared at the approaching Vensar. None of them paid the still-trapped creature any mind as they picked their way around the fallen vats toward Marcus. Excellent timing. My thanks for the save. Of course, Captain. You mentioned a potential way into the basement. Right, always business with the Vensar. Those vats were filled with liquid which drained into the floor. That implies that there are pipes running into the lower levels. Maybe not big enough as is, but if you could expand them... The monster chose that moment to howl again. The Vensar leader pointed at it and one of his men, who tossed a grenade into the cylinder. Marcus covered his ears in expectation of an explosion. Instead, there was a whoosh of blue-white flames that reduced the monster to nothing. Finally... Some quiet. Solomon turned his full focus back on the terminal. Marcus could only roll his eyes at his friend. The Vensar soldiers were gathered around the base of the nearest vat, giving it a serious look. There was probably a conversation he couldn't hear going on as well, and that was fine. He was content to keep his distance and let them do what they had to do. Marcus considered himself a fair hand at rescuing people, but Vensar soldiers were on another level. If anyone could figure out a way to reach Dracor, they could. Chapter 22 Sarkin drifted down to settle on the floor directly in front of Dracor, who tensed and readied the many offensive and defensive systems in his armor. No more words would be wasted. It was time to end this once and for all. Electricity arced from Drakor's fingers only to spark and fizzle against Sarkin's personal shield. While he hadn't expected an instant kill, the total failure of the attack caused Drakor's stomach to clench. Voidtech couldn't be that much more advanced than what the Vintsar used, could it? Pitiful. Sarkin threw out a hand and Drakor found himself flying across the cavern before coming to a sudden stop when his back slammed into a boulder. The heavy blow knocked the breath out of him, but at least his armor kept the damage to a minimum. What sort of technology could create an effect like that? Nothing Dracor was familiar with. Gravity manipulation was all he could think of. He forced himself to his feet as Sarkin's dark figure approached. An impressive effect, isn't it? I call it ethereal fist, and it's one of the few techniques I've managed to master. Drakor shook his head. Sarkin had truly gone around the bend, as the humans said. So that was... what? Magic? That's as good of a description as any, I suppose. Manipulating the ether without being able to see it and without specific techniques is remarkably difficult. It's taken me centuries to manage the few tricks I have. Would you like to see another one? Blaster fire lanced out from the weapons built into Dracor's armor, only to splash against Sarkin's shield with no effect. I can certainly give you high points for determination. Sarkin pointed, and an invisible force wrapped around Dracor's neck, squeezing his throat and lifting him off the ground. This one is called Ethereal Tentacle. It can do more than strangle people, but I quite enjoy this particular application. Drekor clawed at his throat, but there was nothing there. You can't interact with the ether physically. Sarkin spoke like a professor giving a lecture. Someone unable to manipulate the energy is helpless before someone that is. In our galaxy, 
It's the ultimate trump card. Dots swam before Drakor's eyes and his lungs burned with the desperate need for air. Of all the ways he'd imagined the battle going, even when he considered the possibility of losing, he'd never thought of anything like this. An explosion rocked the cavern and the pressure on his throat lessened. A deep breath helped clear the spots, but he had only a second to enjoy it before another invisible blow sent him flying across the cavern. Hitting the wall brought him to an abrupt stop and he slid to the floor, every inch of his body aching. The shrill scream of blasters drew his attention to the hole in the ceiling. Silver-armored figures were dropping through and firing at Sarkin, though their weapons were having just as meager of an effect as Dracor's own had. At least the multiple attacks were keeping him off balance. As Drakor struggled to his feet, he tried to think of some way to hurt the seemingly invincible Sarkin. Their weapons, even shield-penetrating blasters, weren't having any particular effect. A crimson lance shot out from Sarkin's extended finger and burned away one of the soldiers' heads. It seemed relying on their own personal shields wouldn't be wise either. Are you well, sir? The squad leader asked through his mask calm. Well enough, considering... Do you have a plan? Not beyond getting to you. That was what Drekor was afraid of. One of the things, anyway. My weapons have proven ineffective. Another of the lethal crimson rays shot out, this time taking a soldier through the chest. His heavy armor hadn't even slowed the blast. I fear you may have arrived just in time for us to die together. The explosives the Vensar used to expand the drain they found under the vat shook Marcus's whole body when they exploded. The dust had barely cleared before the soldiers jumped down. No one could fault their guts, no question about that. Part of Marcus wanted to follow them now that his pistols were recharged, but he didn't have an anti-gravity generator to slow his fall. Not to mention, in a battle between Vensar, he'd just be in the way. He moved to the edge of the hole and peered down into what looked like a natural cavern. It was surprisingly deep, and he could make out few details beyond streaks of blaster fire and the movement of silver figures. Voidwalker had to be down there, but the man in black blended in too well for Marcus to pick him out. A quick tap of his calm increased the volume so he could listen in on the running commentary. Didn't sound too good. All of the Vinsar's primary weapons were useless, and Voidwalker was taking out a guy with every shot. Marcus racked his brain trying to think of a way to help. His pistols certainly wouldn't be any more use than the soldiers' weapons. He glanced at the heavy vat resting right at the edge of the hole. If Voidwalker was using an energy-dissipating shield, maybe a physical attack would have more luck. Boss? Not a good time to chat, Marcus. I've been listening, boss, and I've got an idea. We could certainly use one. The whine of a near miss came through the calm. Can you force Voidwalker back so he's under the hole? I was thinking I could drop something heavy on him. There was a moment of silence, and Marcus tried to imagine the look on the boss's face. That might work. Getting him in place will be the tricky part. We can't even scratch him through his shield. I'll signal you when we're ready. Good luck. Marcus walked to the rear of the vat and pushed it. It barely budged. This plan wouldn't work if he couldn't get the damn thing in place. Bracing his feet more firmly, he pushed with all his might. The vat moved about two inches. I've got it, Marcus, Solomon said from his place at the computer. Great. He had no idea what his friend had and less time to worry about it. From the increasing volume of blaster fire, the fight was getting closer. Help me move this into position. You don't understand. Explain later. If we fuck this up, everyone dies. Fine. Solomon heaved his bulk up out of the chair and joined Marcus. Together, they dragged the vat over to the edge of the opening. When a third of it was over the hole, Marcus stopped and panted for breath. That had been far harder than he expected. You wouldn't think something made of smooth glass would be so hard to slide. At the very least, it should be heavy enough to do some real damage. This feels like something out of a cartoon, Solomon said between gasps. If we had a piano or a safe instead of the vat, it would be perfect. Marcus smiled at the image and shook his head. 
This was hardly a laughing matter, but he couldn't help it. Now, Marcus, Drekor's voice came loud and clear through his calm. He and Solomon heaved and the vat went over the edge. Marcus immediately went to the next closest vat. Let's get this in place just in case. Solomon groaned, but joined him. Hopefully they wouldn't need it, but better safe than sorry. Getting Sarkin into position ended up being less a matter of driving him where they wanted him to go, and more a matter of luring him by offering themselves as targets. It was a horribly risky strategy, and had already cost the lives of two more soldiers. But he was finally in place directly under the hole in the ceiling. Now, Marcus! A moment later, a heavy glass and steel cylinder came crashing down on Sarkin's head, driving him into the floor. It spoke volumes to the cylinder's durability that it didn't even crack after falling that far. The figure in black lay perfectly still, pinned under the vat. Dracor could hardly believe that was enough to end it, but it certainly looked like Sarkin was dead. Dracor took a step toward him, but the squad commander hurried to move in front of him. It might be a ruse, sir. Best let me go first. Enough of his men had died on this mission that he wanted to argue, but Dracor knew it would be a waste of breath. Instead, he nodded and let his men do what they did. Four men approached, one from each direction, weapons leveled. No reaction from Sarkin. When all four of them stood over the body, the squad leader said, He's still alive, sir, but appears unconscious. Should we finish him? It wasn't a sentiment worthy of events, sir, but Dracor knew better than to waste this chance. Yes. All four soldiers fired their weapons at the same time, only to have the beams deflect off Sarkin's still active shield. A moment later, the men, along with the vat, went flying in every direction. I'm impressed, Sarkin said. That hurt. And then you ordered your men to kill a hopeless opponent. I find I'm more and more optimistic about you. I... Whatever he was about to say was cut off when a second vat came crashing down on his head. Dracor didn't hesitate. With a mental command, a blade popped out of a wrist sheath on his right gauntlet. He leapt and drove it right through Sarkin's chest, cutting his heart in half. Somehow he still had strength enough to say, Very impressive indeed. Before the life drained out of him. Dracor looked up and found Marcus looking back at him. The irrepressible human offered a smile and wave. What now, boss? Marcus asked through the calm. Now I very much want to return to my ship and go home. A report will be made and the Vensar governing body will decide what to do about this place. I'm happy to let it be someone else's problem. Not the Galactic Council? This seems like the sort of thing they'd want to know about. That's a complication we may not want to deal with. Your discretion would be appreciated until a decision is made. Sure, boss. I always figured I worked more for you than the council as a whole. If you want me to keep my mouth shut, then that's what I'll do. Solomon and I are going to head for the shuttle. Margaret's probably getting worried. We'll be along shortly. And Marcus, thank you for the help. Your timing was excellent. I didn't even know you had a second vat ready to drop. When things calm down, remind me to tell you the story Vlad used to tell me about the double tap. It's surprisingly funny given that it's about a murder. I look forward to hearing it. Drekor was somewhat surprised to find that he meant it. He switched his calm to the squad frequency. All soldiers sound off. They did as ordered, and he was relieved that none of the men Sarkin hurled away had died. Four of his men killed to take down Sarkin, a high price, but one worth paying to remove that menace from the galaxy. Are we leaving, sir? The squad leader asked. Momentarily. Prepare Sarkin's body for transport. The governors will want to see it for themselves. Be sure to check his gear thoroughly for traps. I'm going to take a look at the black circle he was so obsessed with. Dracor left his men to do their work and strode over to the circle. It didn't look like much. The surface was a flat, dull black that reflected no light. He couldn't decide if liquid filled it or not. 
Either way, he wasn't foolish enough to touch it before performing a proper analysis first. As he stared into the darkness, he started getting dizzy. He closed his eyes, and when he opened them, he found himself standing in a place of endless nothingness. You think you've won, a cold, sibilant voice said. But you haven't. Killing my servant will only delay the inevitable. There are always others who will answer my call. Drakor touched his head, trying to decide if he was injured or suffering some sort of psychotic break. As far as he could tell, he wasn't injured and he had no tendency toward mental instability that he was aware of. That led him to believe that whatever was happening was real. Who or what are you? he asked. I am the void. I will be the end of your reality. Only by serving me will you receive the gift of peace, dreaming in eternal darkness. Take Void Walker's place, and I will share all the secrets of the universe with you. I will even tell you how to cure the disease that plagues your people. Dracor shook his head. He might have felt a moment of temptation, but only a moment's. My people would not thank me for making such a deal, and becoming a menace like Sarkin is too high a price. Whatever you are, the universe is too big to be destroyed. Whatever you're planning, it's doomed to failure. I am the Void! The voice boomed with such power it nearly drove Dracor to his knees. I am everywhere! I was here before the universe, and I will be here when it's gone. You miserable specks are nothing. You strive and squabble over pointless, meaningless irrelevancies, only to die in the end anyway. Destroying it all would be a mercy killing. You will not convince me. What happens now? You can't keep me here forever? No. What makes you so sure? Dracor's heart skipped a beat. What would you gain by holding me against my will? Your despair as you slowly go insane might be amusing. Was this thing serious? Everything that had happened since he approached the Black Circle had been uncanny. Perhaps Sarkin hadn't been as insane as Dracor first thought. I can assure you that everything he told you was the truth, the Void said. The ether is real. Magic is not only real, but common in most of the other galaxies. Why the Creator chose not to have anyone in this galaxy be born with the ability to see it is beyond even my understanding. The more I see of reality the more I think he created it the way he did on a whim. I was trapped in the midst of this cacophony and chaos on a whim. You sound like the one in despair. I passed despair eons ago. I don't even know where I am now. Go, return to your dying people and your rotten universe. Another will come to serve me eventually. For all your knowledge and technology, you lack the skills necessary to seal this gate. We could destroy the planet. Please do. Nothing would make me happier. But that will have no effect on the gate. It's a hole in reality, not the ground. Dracor stumbled when he found himself back in his body. He looked down at the gate and shook his head. How would he ever explain the void to the governors? They'd think him mad, just as he thought Sarkin was. A wave of amusement rolled over him, and he knew the void found his plight funny. Perhaps it thought that a worse punishment than leaving him in the dark for all eternity. Sir, the body is prepared for transport. We also removed his mask and did a DNA test to confirm Sarkin's identity. It's him. 
Very well, squad leader. Let's get out of here and go home. Chapter 23 Stepping out of the dark stone building came as a tremendous relief to Marcus. He took a deep breath of warm, salt-tinged air and sighed. They'd completed the mission and got out alive once more. All in all, a good day. At least as long as he didn't think too hard about the pile of charred scrap metal that was his ship. Much as he'd missed the star, the only truly irreplaceable thing on board had been his mother's collection of leather-bound books. He doubted he'd ever find another set like that. Marcus, I've been looking through the data, Solomon said, and it's all there. That's great. What exactly is all there? A complete breakdown of the disease. With this, Dracor and his people should have no trouble synthesizing an antidote. Marcus grinned. That really was good news. Stop, a voice from his left said. Marcus froze, then turned slowly to find Soma pointing an integrated void disruptor at his chest. Six heavily, if conventionally, armed soldiers were arrayed on either side of him. Your boss is dead. You know that, right? Marcus asked. I didn't, but I'm not surprised. He wasn't entirely in his right mind. Joining his group was not one of my better ideas. My ship has been destroyed, and without Voidwalker's help we have no way to repair it. You will provide us with a shuttle. Should you fail to comply, you're dead. I don't have a shuttle to provide you with, Marcus said. You'll have to take it up with the Vensar. I'm dependent on them for a ride as well. You're their ally. If they don't want you reduced to subatomic particles, they'll give us what we want. Okay, okay, just relax. I'm very slowly going to activate my comm so I can relay your demand. Now don't shoot me. Make sure you move real slow. Marcus eased his hand over to his gauntlet. He needed to draw this out long enough for the boss to get here. Dracor and the Vensar soldiers would make short work of these clowns. He touched the button. Attention. The Jade Dragons require a shuttle, and should they not get one, Solomon and I have a very short life expectancy. Turn the volume up, Soma said. Marcus obliged, and a moment later an unfamiliar, though unmistakably Vensar voice said, Understood, Captain. A ship has been dispatched from the cruiser in orbit. It will be here in one minute. That was a surprise. But Marcus wasn't about to complain. There you go. Your ride will be here in one minute. Soma scrunched up his face. Why are they being so accommodating? Hostage negotiations never go this way. I don't know what to tell you. I've never been a hostage before. This is a good thing, right? A scream of an approaching ship drowned out whatever he was going to say. They all looked up just in time to watch a Vinsar fighter streak in and lay down a perfect strafing run that reduced the dragons to crimson stains and lumps of flesh. I think I'm going to throw up, Solomon said. Marcus couldn't deny that it wasn't a pretty sight. Still, he said, please don't. Let's get into the shuttle before anyone else tries to kill us. I love that plan. At the rear of the shuttle, they found the ramp lowered and waiting, Marcus barely reached the top before Margaret practically tackled him. He staggered a step, then caught his balance, so they didn't end up on the deck. Are you okay? she asked. When the Jade Dragons ambushed you, I was so worried. Me too, but thanks to some Vinsar fancy shooting, we're fine. Marcus gently disengaged from her. Being pressed against her curves, pleasant as it was, did nothing good for his blood pressure. What I can't figure out is how they snuck up on us. There must be more tunnels and access hatches that we missed. Where's the first counselor? The pilot stood at the rear of the passenger area. Drekor and his men are on their way. We got Voidwalker, but there were some casualties on your side, I'm sorry to say. We were all prepared to die if it meant eliminating that menace. The galaxy is a better place without Sarkin in it. Marcus couldn't argue with that. What happens now? Margaret asked. For me, finding and outfitting a new ship. After that, we'll see. What about you? The dragons no longer exist in any organized way, though I'm sure someone will eventually swoop in and pick up the pieces. I really don't know. 
I have no living family, no job, no home, and no real friends. I'm adrift in the galaxy. I don't know about the other stuff, but you do have friends. A couple of them, anyway. Whatever you decide, we'll help you make it happen. Tears ran down Margaret's face, but she was smiling. Thank you. You have no idea how much it means to me to know that. The crunch of approaching footsteps made a welcome distraction. Dracor and his team rounded the back of the ship. They had a number of bodies with them on floating stretchers. One of them was dressed in all black. Curious, Marcus went over for a closer look. They'd removed Void Walker's mask. He had a long, narrow face with a sharp chin, six eyes arrayed in two columns of three and a slit instead of a nose. Not very human, but also not the most out there looks Marcus had ever seen. So that's what you guys look like under your masks. It's what we used to look like, Drekor said. You will find modern Vinsar a good deal less attractive. The boss sounded exhausted, even more than the battle should have caused. You okay? Marcus asked. This is a win for us. You should be thrilled. We need to talk but not here. Once we get back to the cruiser, I need to see you two in private. He sounded serious, even for a Vensar. Sure, no problem. We've got a couple things we need to discuss with you too. Like a new ship? Drekor asked. Have no fear. The council will cover the full cost of a replacement. Never doubted it, First Counselor, but that's a very small part of what we need to discuss. If everyone will strap in, the pilot said, we can take off any time. As soon as we land, we'll go to my private chamber to talk. A cabin will be found for your lady friend. Dracor settled in his seat and clicked his restraint into place. Marcus had never heard the boss so serious. In fact, serious didn't even seem like the right word. It was more like serious and depressed had a kid, but he didn't know what to name it. They settled in, and soon the shuttle was on its way into orbit. Marcus found he was both anxious to hear what had the boss so worked up, and afraid to find out. Drekor's cabin on his warship was every bit as nice as Marcus expected. Everything was done in silver and white. The furniture was clean, modern, and comfortable. Three chairs sat in a circle around a low table, as soon as they arrived, Dracor dropped into the nearest chair and sighed. Marcus had never seen the boss act like a middle manager coming off a double shift, and he couldn't say he liked it. Marcus sat before being invited, and Solomon joined him after a brief hesitation. A quick look around confirmed the lack of anything to drink. That was a shame, as Marcus badly wanted a shot of whiskey. Okay, boss, I'm guessing you've got bad news to share. Why don't you get it off your chest, then we can give you some good news to cheer you up. Drekor offered a low chuckle. I could stand some cheering up. What I'm about to tell you can go no further. In fact, I probably shouldn't even tell the two of you. But if I don't share this with someone, I fear I might go crazy. I'm honored by your trust, boss. Let's hear it. Dracor took a deep breath and started talking, first about what Void Walker said, then the thing that called itself the Void. It sounded like something out of a fantasy story, or maybe a horror story. Either way, certainly not like something that actually happened. When he finished, Marcus said, Holy shit, no wonder you're worn out. What are you going to do about whatever that thing is? I don't know that there's anything to be done. I fear that if I even mention it to the governors or the council that I'll be locked up as a madman. Then keep quiet, Marcus shrugged. No sense sticking your neck out if it's not going to accomplish anything. Tell them about the base and poison, but leave out everything to do with the supernatural. Problem solved. My problem, perhaps. But this might be the greatest threat to all of existence. Is it really my place to make such a decision? Yes, if anyone wants to investigate, they'll see for themselves. If they don't care enough to look, screw them. You did your bit. Take a victory lap and move on. 
If there's one thing I'm sure of, it's that there are some problems that are too big to worry about. I envy your confidence, my friend. Now, you had something to share with me? Right. Go ahead, Solomon. Solomon's face flushed at suddenly being the center of attention, but he said, I found the disease's complete genetic makeup as well as the process by which it was made. I downloaded a copy. With it, your scientists should be able to reverse engineer a cure. Dracor held out a trembling hand and Solomon passed him the data slate. He flipped it on and started reading. The room was dead silent save for their breathing. No one wanted to be the first one to speak. At last, Dracor looked up. This is all we need. My team can have a cure ready to synthesize by the time we reach Vensar Prime. You've saved my people. All credit for that goes to Solomon, Marcus said. All I did was drop a couple vats on Voidwalker's head. No, you'll receive the reward as a team. I'll see to it. Anything you want within the Vensar's power to grant is yours. Just name it. I want to study your tech, Solomon said without hesitation. Nothing else interests me. That won't be a problem. I'll have you both named honorary citizens of Vensar Prime. You'll be able to come and go as you please. The Academy Technica will be open to you to take classes as you wish. Solomon flashed the biggest smile Marcus had ever seen. An honorary Vensar. Wow, thank you. You are perfectly welcome. Dracor turned his mask toward Marcus. And you... No need to mention your ship. That will be taken care of by the council. A nice retirement nest egg would be good, but mostly I just want to get set up with new gear and get back to work. After a couple weeks sitting around, I'd be bored to death. If you could find a place for Margaret where she'd be safe and happy, that would be great. Of course, I don't know if she knows where or what that would look like. I do have one special request. As I said if it's within my power. I'd like Lysen to get the first dose of the cure, and I'd like to be there when she wakes up. Dracor cocked his head. Why? Marcus grinned. I want to see her reaction when she finds out I saved her again. Dracor was silent for a moment, then he started laughing. He laughed so hard his shoulders shook and he doubled over in his chair. When he got himself under control, he said, you're a bad man, my friend. So be it. Normally only family would be allowed at her bedside, but for you we'll make an exception. Marcus could hardly wait. Chapter 24 Vinsar Prime was everything Marcus expected it to be. The buildings were all sleek, silver towers that looked more like pieces of art than places where people lived. There was no trash to be seen or bums begging for credits on the street corners. The lone park they passed was perfectly manicured. All in all, it looked like a brochure for the wonders of science. On the jump here, Marcus had called Aika. She'd been so excited to tell him about everything she'd learned about the new tribe that he couldn't help smiling when he remembered. She'd been a good deal less excited when she heard what he'd been doing over the past few weeks. In fact, horrified didn't begin to cover it. He'd made a point of not mentioning any of the magic stuff. That was the boss's secret to share or not. Ayaka had been ambivalent when Marcus explained that Margaret would be joining his crew, at least until she decided where she wanted to settle permanently. Her one condition was that once Marcus got his new ship, he had to bring her to Alpha 114 so they could meet face to face. He wasn't looking forward to that, but it was what it was. He sighed and shoved the memories aside. The boss was busy making the necessary arrangements for Marcus to visit Lysen for her treatment. He'd left Marcus in possibly the nicest waiting room he'd ever seen. Like everything else, the room was spotless and decorated in white and silver. The hospital didn't even have that horrid antiseptic smell he associated with them. Solomon had begged off joining, despite having done more to secure the cure than Marcus had. Instead, he'd gone straight to the technical school for a tour. Marcus had serious doubts that he'd be seeing his friend for a while, and that was fine, as long as Solomon was enjoying himself. 
The waiting room door slid open and Dracor entered. Marcus hopped to his feet. What do they think? Everyone is very confident. Assuming Lysen responds as they hope, every Vensar will begin treatment within the week. Unfortunately, it won't repair the damage already done, but with the disease gone, our doctors will be able to undo most of it. When we're finished here, I've arranged for you to examine a number of ships that might be to your liking. Sounds good. One question. Are they Vensar-style ships? That might make sneaking around difficult. They're built with our technology, but from the outside look like ships common to the greater galaxy. Have no fear on that account. They set out down a long white corridor. What he assumed were Vensar nurses in crisp white robes gave him a few passing looks, but given who his guide was, no one said anything. They passed a station filled with computers and flashing lights, but no people. Not far past the station, Drekor stopped in front of a closed door. Everything okay, boss? I've left her here for weeks. What we were doing was important, but I can't help feeling guilty. Then don't make her wait any longer. You're right, of course. He touched a button, and the door slid open. Lysand was lying on a simple bed, her body covered with a white blanket. Someone had put her mask on, which surprised Marcus. Surely here, at least, she could do without it. Computer screens beside the bed monitored her status. I'm surprised she has her mask on, Marcus said. I had it put on to preserve her modesty. Our appearance isn't something we're proud of. You know it wouldn't matter to me, right? Marcus asked. I know, but as I said, it's for her, not you. Marcus couldn't argue with that. He hated seeing her lying there like that. She was always so much fun to tease, but he still thought of her as a friend. The door slid open again, and a masked Vensar and a white robe like the nurses entered. He carried a data slate in one hand and a syringe in the other. The doctor glanced Marcus's way. You're the one that found the cure? I helped. My friend did the actual data retrieval. I'm glad it was useful. Useful. The information you found will save an entire generation of Vensar. If we built statues, you and your friend would certainly be in line for one. Marcus grinned. I'm not much for statues, and Solomon would probably faint if you suggested it to him. If you can fix up Lysen, we'll call it good. You're an odd human, the doctor said. Have you met many? No, but I've read much of the literature on your species. It's not flattering. I imagine not. Still, I recommend not judging individuals by the generalities of their species. Or vice versa, for that matter. I met Voidwalker, after all. The doctor flinched as if Marcus had slapped him. Fair point. Excuse me. He walked over by Lysen and checked the readouts. As he worked, Dracor moved to stand beside Marcus. Not very diplomatic. He started it. Is bedside manner not a thing here? You're not sick, Dracor said. Marcus shrugged. You got me there. Both men turned to watch as the doctor leaned over and stuck the needle in Lysen's arm. The clear liquid slowly entered her body until the needle was empty. How long will it take her to wake up? Dracor asked, all signs of his Vensar reserve gone. Not long, the doctor said, assuming the antivirus works as planned and I'm confident that it will, she will be disease-free in minutes. That said, it will take time for her to make a full recovery. Between the virus and the damage done to her body by the nanomachines, she may never get back to full strength. Marcus snorted at that. A hundred credits says she's ready for duty in three months. No bet, Dracor said. Lysen let out a little groan. Marcus and Dracor hurried over beside her bed. Her masked face turned first toward Dracor. Cousin, she said, I hadn't thought to see you again, or anyone else for that matter. Her head turned a fraction, 
and she started. Hey, Marcus said. How are you feeling? Captain Drake? She sounded incredulous, just as he'd hoped. Why are you on Vinsar Prime? Don't tell me. He nodded. Solomon and I found the necessary information to make a cure. My reward was to be here when you woke up, among other things. Once you're back on your feet and I have my new ship, we'll have to make a trip to Mars for another celebration at Omara's pub. She put a trembling hand on her mask and sighed. I'm not certain I could survive another celebration with the Omaras. My head pounded for three days after the last time. Wow, that's bad, even if it was your first hangover. I'll have to introduce you to Dodger and his miracle hangover cure. It might be something of interest to your scientists. She should rest, the doctor said. You can visit again another time. Sure, Marcus said. As hospitals go, this one isn't bad. See you tomorrow. He took a step toward the door, but Lysen caught his arm. Thank you, Captain. And Solomon as well. I thought I was soon to pass through death's door. I am most grateful to be wrong. What are friends for? Marcus asked. Get some sleep. I'll see you later. Drekor gave her hand a final squeeze, and he and Marcus left the room. Out in the hall, the doctor said, I'll have a shot ready for you tomorrow, first counselor. Until then, gentlemen. I feel like I've just woken up from a nightmare, Drekor said. All my people will feel that way soon. It will be a new era for the Vensar, a better one. Is it over then? Drekor cocked his head and Marcus quickly elaborated. I mean, the children of the Void. Without Void Walker as a driving force, whoever's left shouldn't be nearly as big an issue, right? I sincerely hope not. But if there's one thing I've learned from history, it's that evil never stops. That presence, or whatever it really is, the Void is still out there. Who knows what mad lunatic might make contact with it next, not to mention all the other mundane evil in the galaxy. I fear the work of good men will never be done. That's great, boss. Thanks for the cheery thoughts. Now, for the most important thing, is there a bar around here? I need a drink. Drekor's laugh was quickly stifled, and the two men left the hospital. Marcus would deal with the future when he had to. For now, everyone he cared about was safe and sound. And that was the best reward he could hope for. I hope you enjoyed Children of the End. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of my uploads. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.